the Duchess's Earring. Written by Fanny Finch and published by Starfall Publications. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy! Chapter 1 Nigel, London, 1820. Churchyard of St. Maria. The yellow headstones looked grey today, for it was overcast and the rain lashed the stones persistently. Not once did the rain let up, nor did the clouds part to greet the day with an ounce of sunshine. How apt, Nigel Beale muttered to himself as he stood beneath the yew tree, watching on from afar. The angels in heaven are crying. He couldn't be one of the mourners. He was not permitted, for he had no official association with the person laid out in that awful coffin. Yet he had to come. There was no chance that Nigel could stay at home and mourn alone, let his tears continue in the shadows. No, he had to come. Standing beneath the boughs of a yew tree, the tree of new life and death, he stared at the churchyard, awaiting the arrival of the coffin. The rain made the ground sodden, the grass disappearing in vast puddles, as the rain dripped down the headstones like tears. In some parts of the cemetery, there were grander effigies and statues to commemorate the dead. One angle with white wings and a mournful face cast her eyes downward to the body beneath her, rather than the sky. It was a dark place, one that made Nigel feel even worse than before. He screwed up the handkerchief in his hand and turned to face the open grave once more. It was a short distance up the hill from his position so far that no one would notice where he stood hiding by the yew tree. Adjusting his black frock coat and top hat that warded off the rain, Nigel stared at the cemetery gates open. She's here. The coffin was carried by four pallbearers, each one with their heads turned downward. Behind them, the vicar led the way, along with the mourners behind him. There was not a dry eye amongst them, for they were all distraught. If things had been right, Nigel could have been with them, one of the mourners. Yet nothing official had ever been said or discussed. His place was not with them, but in the shadows, doomed to watch and mourn from afar. Pressing himself closer to the trunk of the tree of death to stay hidden, he watched the coffin being taken up the hill. It paused by the open grave as the vicar said a prayer. When it was time for the coffin to be lowered into the ground, the cries of the dead woman's mother grew louder. She wailed, inconsolable and the sight of her made Nigel ache all the more. He looked down at the ground, his vision blurring with tears he fought hard not to let drop. The wet blades of glass before him were no longer in focus, and the sods of earth around his face grew distant. I should have saved her. It was my task, was it not? The reason I am here is to save people. Yet Nigel had been unable to save her. Slowly the coffin was lowered into the ground, and the mother cried so much that her sister swept her up in her arms. The two clung on to one another, bawling their eyes out as children, for they hardly cared who saw them now. Nigel wiped his own cheeks, drying the few tears that had escaped after all. Taking off his top hat, he bowed his head, sending a prayer to God. You have seen fit to take her. I beg of you. Take care of her now in heaven, as she was never quite taken care of here. Amen. He felt the drips of water soaking his light brown hair, making it curl in its damp state more than usual. He didn't care how wet he became, he didn't return his hat to his head out of a mark of respect. Even when the rain mixed with the small moustache on his top lip, he refused to return the hat. Slowly, the mourners left. One by one they threw sods of earth onto the casket, though it was damp and dropped onto the wood in heavy thuds. The mother struggled the most and ended up flinging the soil down, her hand trembling so much. When the mother turned away, Nigel did too. He planted his back to the tree trunk of the yew, desperate not to be seen. He closed his eyes and thought of the last time he had seen the woman in that casket, when she had breathed her last. To his last moments on this earth he was certain he would be haunted by that image. I failed her, but I will not fail another. With this sudden determination in mind he opened his eyes. 
He left hurriedly parting through the gravestones and choosing to head straight for the fence rather than the gate, so he would not bump into any of the other mourners and be seen. Clambering over the fence, he dropped down the other side, his boots falling ankle-deep into a puddle. He looked down and cursed, but hardly cared enough to slow his pace as he marched on. Now Nigel knew what to do. He might have failed that poor woman, but he would not disappoint another. There was much he had to do. He would improve his knowledge, seeking out new methods and ways as much as he could, sticking to the latest research in order to discover ways to help people with their health and well-being. There was something more he had to do too, another resolution that would keep him safe, so he would never have to feel this way again. I shall not look at a woman in that manner. From now on, my heart will be closed off for good. When he was a distance away from the graveyard, he placed the top hat on his head and sniffed. He wouldn't let the tears fall any more. Chapter 2 Catherine Dorset, 1824 Catherine slipped the earrings on, staring at herself in the vanity mirror. Pretty, she murmured, admiring the earrings that had been lent to her. They belonged to her aunt, and were a thank-you gift from Sebastian, her cousin, who had expressed great gratitude for her help in uniting him with his love, Elizabeth. Catherine ran her fingers over the earrings, admiring the pearl and the delicate twist of the gold drop. They were truly beautiful. Ever since she was a child she had admired them and longed to wear them, but now she had them. That luster had somewhat diminished though it had little to do with the earrings. That was my doing, she whispered and sighed as her eyes darted to her face. Her dark brown brows mirrored her hair perfectly that was swept back into a simple chignon at the nape of her neck. Her dark eyes were rather close together, her thin face and slanting nose almost elfin in places. She'd often been told she had a keen stare, but it was one that was easily shifted by the mischievous smile that was often on her lips. That smile seemed a distance away now. Ever since she had nearly brought scandal upon the family, she had struggled with such smiles, just as she struggled to wear the earrings now. Feeling unworthy of them, she took them off and replaced them in the jewellery box in front of her on the table. Her aunt, Arabella, the Duchess of Gordon, was once a healer when she was young. Given the name Bonadea, she wrote to ladies offering advice and healing herbs when needed, though that was many years ago. When she was accused of being a witch, she had retreated from such an occupation. That was until Catherine brought the legend of Bonadea back to life the year before. Arabella's son, Sebastian, had longed for a way to grow closer to his love, Elizabeth. It had been Catherine's foolish idea to suggest to the confused Elizabeth to write to Bonadea to ask for advice, though Sebastian replied in the place of his mother. What had seemed like such a simple idea at first had become complicated, and at one time there had been awful rumour spreading once again that Arabella was a witch. Catherine had felt the shame of their deception ever since. Though all had worked out well for Sebastian, who had won Elizabeth's heart, Catherine felt the weight of what they had done considerably. It was her suggestion that had drawn Arabella into such gossip and scandal again. It was my doing. She pushed the jewellery box away, feeling so unworthy of wearing the earrings that she couldn't bring herself to put them on again. She stood and brushed out the creases of her silken peach gown, trying to appear like the fine young lady she knew her mother wanted her to be. Clara now the Baroness of Aldington, and sister to the Duke of Gordon, had always been an elegant lady. In contrast, Catherine felt like a bumbling fool compared to her mother. She was mischievous and had often gotten into trouble as a child. She was also a clumsy soul, and where Clara could walk into a room and captivate others with her elegant movements, Catherine would fall in behind her, drawing eyes as she fell into a bundle on the floor. Leaving the room, Catherine crossed the landing and walked to the stairs, trying her best not to dwell on the earrings. When she heard Arabella's voice in the distant regions of the house, echoing as she talked to Clara, Catherine hurried her pace. 
Descending the stairs, she reached the lower floor and moved to the sitting room, where she opened the door wide. She took two steps in before she managed to trip on the corner of a rug. In danger of falling, she gripped the back of the chair where her mother sat. Clara laid a hand to her heart in surprise at the sound and flicked her head around, her brown eyes that were so like Catherine's own narrowing a little. God's wounds, Catherine. My heart cannot take such scares, she said with a heavy sigh. My apologies. Catherine forced a smile, hoping she could cover up the fact she had tripped again. Sat in a chair opposite her mother was Arabella, smiling sweetly as she lifted her teacup to her lips and laughed. Often could Catherine trace some of Sebastian's features in Arabella's face, though he looked more like his father. Still tripping up? Arabella asked. Thank you for that, aunt. I was trying to hide the matter from my mother. You think I do not know when you trip? Clara laughed as she raised her own teacup to her lips. Sweetheart, you have barely walked straight since you first started tottering around as a child. The two women laughed together. Catherine forced a smile, knowing it was all in jest, though she felt strangely uncomfortable at the words today. The sense of discomfort hung over her from staring at those earnings, and her eyes settled on Arabella. Aunt, may I speak with you? She rounded Clara and took care to find her seat without tripping up again. You can always speak to me, dear. Arabella reached for the teapot and poured out another cupful, handing it to Catherine. What's on your mind? I wish... Catherine paused and looked at her mother. Clara was eyeing her carefully, with that same watchful gaze that had been in her expression ever since she found out that Catherine was behind the scandal that had befallen them the year before. I wish to apologise. What for? Arabella said softly. I wonder, Clara said with full wryness, her light tone drawing Catherine's gaze. She loved her mother dearly, but her recent disappointment made her ache too. For what happened last year, Catherine returned her full focus to her aunt. Again? Arabella spluttered, lowering her own teacup to her lap. Catherine, you have apologised countless times already. You do not need to do so again. I feel I need to. Catherine didn't bother raising her teacup to her lips, but sat with it woodenly in her hands, feeling strangely out of place in her own sitting room. What Sebastian did was at my suggestion. I feel entirely responsible for what happened next, the articles in the scandal sheets, all of it. Catherine, please, listen to me. Arabella put her teacup down on the tray beside them and reached for Catherine's hand, taking it in her own. What you did was revive a name that was trusted, and as I have understood from many ladies since, did some good. It's a great surprise indeed to myself that my son could give such good advice to ladies, but he could, though I question how much medical advice he gave. She winced at the thought. What you did was an innocent act, perhaps a little... misguided. I was going to say a little inconsiderate, Clara said, taking a clam sip from her tea once again. Catherine looked at her mother, her spine crumpling under the weight of her mother's disappointment. I considered Sebastian, Catherine tried to explain herself. I apologise, for I fear it is only he who I thought of in this matter. Then your heart was in the right place. Arabella patted her hand in comfort before returning to her teacup. Besides, perhaps it was time for the name of Bonadea to be revived again. Ladies still send letters. Sebastian and Elizabeth sometimes answer with advice and whenever anything medical arises, they come to me for my assistance. We are able to help people again. The good of that cannot be underestimated. Can it, Clara? She appealed straight to her sister-in-law, clearly encouraging her to say something good. Yes, yes, I know all that, Clara murmured with a heavy sigh. Arabella, you do good work, as you always have done, but none of us were overawed by how you came to being accused of witchcraft, did we? Silence fell in the room as they all sipped their tears. Catherine forced the bitter taste down, for she had forgotten to add any milk. Catherine, you need not apologise to me any more. 
Arabella said after a minute or so of this awkward silence. Your apology is accepted, and I for one do not see that you did anything so wrong. She looked pointedly at Clara. Oh, do not look at me like that. Clara tipped her head back, as if avoiding her sister-in-law's gaze. I know much good has come from it, but you must be in agreement with me that Catherine's plotting, her mischievousness, can be a little... She paused, struggling for the right word. Endearing, Arabella offered with a humoured smile. Catherine looked at her aunt, sharing in that smile. Can you stay all the time? Catherine asked, making her aunt laugh. I think a better word is concerning. Clara's words made them both stop laughing. Catherine, you are a young lady now. I am sorry to say it, but it is high time you acted like one. And of course you were never so mischievous, were you? Arabella asked, staring straight at Clara. For your daughter must have got the attribute from somewhere. Clara smiled for the first time, looking straight at Catherine. It was an expression that perplexed Catherine greatly. She could have almost mistaken her mother for being a little proud of her. I love you dearly, Catherine. It cannot be denied you are like me at times. But as your mother, I have to protect you. Even if that means protecting you from your own artful ways. That you may have gotten from me. Is that a compliment? I can no longer tell, Catherine said, sitting forward in bafflement. When Clara didn't answer, she returned her focus to her aunt. I would like to say something more on this matter, as we're dredging up the past. Aunt, I must confess myself fascinated by your story. It captivates me. Completely. How do you mean? Arabella said with a small, surprised laugh. How you managed to help people. How you cultivated an occupation for yourself, when so few women are permitted such an occupation themselves. It fascinates me more than I can declare. Catherine spoke with vigour, sitting so far forward that she was in danger of falling out of the chair. Catherine. Clara stood from her seat. Here, let me rescue that teacup before you drop it when you clamber out of that chair. She took the teacup away before Catherine could indeed drop it. I admire your learning so much, aunt, she continued on, determined to speak so openly now she had begun. I'd be fascinated to learn more about it. You would? Arabella seemed equally enthused, sitting forward. Of course. Well, if you are interested, I can lend you my notes on plants and botany. There is much in there one can learn. Before Arabella had even finished her offer, Catherine was already nodding, eager to accept. I am sure your mother would not object, would you, Clara? No, I would not. Clara smiled softly. After all you have done for dear Daniel, I know your knowledge is vast indeed. She spoke of her brother, Arabella's husband, with pain evidently tinging her voice. Catherine had heard much of this tale, how Arabella and Daniel had met when Clara called Arabella to the house. Daniel was suffering from a lung condition, and it was Arabella who helped him to manage it. To this day, he would occasionally have problems and coughing attacks, but Catherine had been informed many times that he was infinitely better than he had been before he met Arabella. Yes, by all means, share your knowledge, Clara encouraged. I'd love that. Thank you. Catherine stood from the chair and clasped her hands together, excitedly. Well, on that good note, I must go home. Sebastian and Elizabeth are to come for dinner tonight and judging by how Elizabeth complained at the scent of coffee last time she came, I suspect she has some news for us. Arabella stood with a smile. What news is that? Catherine frowned with her brows pinned together. One of the things that I shall teach you, Arabella said softly. Those carrying a child often reject the strong sense of coffee and other such drinks. Now I must take my leave. I shall see you both tomorrow. As Arabella left, Catherine stood dumbstruck, staring after her aunt. As the door closed, Clara sat down in her chair once more, sighing with her spine softening. How can she tell if Elizabeth is pregnant? She knows everything. Clara waved a hand and laughed. She always has done. Yes, but... Pregnant, 
Imagine Sebastian as a father. Catherine giggled at the notion. He'll make a good father. Playful indeed. Yes. Clara's eyes turned to Catherine. She knew that look. Clara had something to say. Catherine fidgeted where she stood, trying to straighten her peach gown. What is it, mother? How do you know I wish to say something? Because you are looking at me the way father eyes his business investments, as if you have a plan. At Catherine's words, Clara sat forward, perching on the edge of her seat. That is because your father and I have a proposition for you, one we believe will help you. She paused, chewing her lip for a minute before she went on. We wish to send you away for a time. Send me away, Catherine spluttered. She walked forward in her effort to reach her mother and ended up kicking the table where the tea was placed. All the china danced on the surface as she hopped, managing to stamp down on her other foot. Ow! Don't get yourself in a spin. Clara stood hurriedly, reaching for her. I know I made an error last year, but please do not send me away because of that. Mother, please. Catherine, you misunderstand. Clara laid her hands on her shoulders, softening her tone. I'm not sending you away for good. My suggestion is to send you to my mother's cousin, Lady Georgiana Bingley, Dowager Countess of Gloucester, for the summer. She is a fine lady and lives in London. She has excellent skills and a great sense of propriety. Propriety? Catherine wrinkled her nose. Do not pull that face as if I have offered up a rotting flower in front of you. Forgive me, give me a minute to straighten it again. Catherine jested and adjusted her expression, pulling an amused smile from her mother that she clearly tried to fight. You need a good tutor to be a fine lady, Catherine. Perhaps exposure to London would assist you. I think Lady Georgiana could be of great help to you, and your father is convinced that travelling to London will do you good too. Once he gets an idea in his head, it is hard to argue with him after all. She rolled her eyes. Now, what do you say? It is not for so long, but could help you very much. Catherine wasn't sure what to feel. Her mother's disappointment had been palpable for so long that she wished to be better for Clara's sake. But she was also saddened by the idea of parting from the home she loved so much. Yet it would make my mother happy. And it is not for so long. If you wish it, mother, yes, I shall go. Chapter 3 Nigel Dr. Bailey, at last I have been waiting on your visit. Lady Georgiana Bingley's high-pitched tones rang around the house. Nigel walked in through the corridor, nodding at the butler in thanks for showing him in. He passed through the corridor and followed the high voice into the vast garden room at the back of the house. The great windows looking out onto the garden revealed bright sunlight and a formal lawn that had been made beautiful, with great swathes of cottage flowers, with purple and pink lupins, and white roses. Nigel's eyes darted over those flowers as he searched the room looking for his patient. Lady Georgiana Bingley sat in a vast wicker chair in one corner of the room. In her hand was her usual ladies' magazine that Nigel knew was published by her daughter-in-law, the Countess of Bingley. He'd spent many a visit checking on Lady Georgiana to be inundated with information about the Countess of Bingley and her impressive magazine, though in truth Nigel paid little attention. He had other concerns to concern himself with. Lady Georgiana! He bowed in greeting to her and moved to her side. Now, how do you far today since our last visit? I am perfectly well, she insisted, though she fiddled with the pearls at her neck in her way that let him know not everything was as well as she suggested. Tall and slim in nature, he'd often worried she carried too little weight in her older age. Her hair was turning white these days and was pulled sharply back across her sloping forehead ridiculously neatly. That white colour contrasted the sharp green eyes all the more. He'd heard some people call her eyes cold, though he had judged them to be warm enough, just like her countenance, once he had gotten to know Lady Georgiana. She was a formal and proper lady who on first meeting could seem rather intimidating. Shall we do a full check just to be sure? he asked, placing down his leather medical bag on the table beside her. Well, if you insist it of me. I do declare I don't know what all this fuss is about now. 
I'm in peak physical form. She held her arms open wide. Yet my son insists on your visits. The Earl worries for you, my lady, Nigel said nonchalantly as he pulled out a wicker stool to sit in front of her. He is eager I come to see you regularly. Yes, hardly surprising with your record. She cocked her head to the side and examined him. You have not lost a patient in years, Dr. Bale. That is indeed a record in this part of London when you consider what strife and diseases are on the rise. Goodness, I have been reading about it just now. She thrust a finger down at the magazine she had dropped into her lap. The ladies are most panicked. There is nothing to fear. I can keep you well, my lady. He winked at her, encouragingly, and she laughed. Besides, all of us running wild in panic like headless chickens in London will help, will it not? He said wryly. Lady Georgiana tipped forward her chin and laughed, covering her mouth. You are sarcastic indeed, Doctor. Not everyone will like you for it, you know. At least you put up with me. He smiled and took her wrist, tapping out her heartbeat on his knee as he calculated the rhythm. She was cold to the touch, but she always was, and it was hardly unusual in women of her advanced age. Her circulation was not that of a much younger woman. Any aches or pains to declare? None. Well, Lady Georgiana paused before she went on. Nigel hurried to gather a notebook and pencil, ready to write down her complaints. It was always the way with Lady Georgiana. She would insist she was in perfect health, then with a little pushing would reveal what actually was wrong. He supposed it was down to her sense of propriety and being used to her station. She hated to be thought of as weak. She is strong indeed. I have seen it many times. He'd been with her once after a fall where she had broken her wrist. She had recovered faster than any other woman her age with such brittle bones. I keep getting this fluttering in my chest. She made a wave at her hand and avoided looking him in the eye, clearly not wishing to speak of it so much. And do you get dizzy with this feeling? Sometimes, other times not. It can calm down very quickly as if it is a butterfly's wings beating in my chest. Other times it can last for many minutes. He noted down her symptoms. He'd recognised many times when taking her heartbeat that there was the occasional bump that did not fit with the rest of the rhythm. Sadly, there was little he could do for such things other than keep her calm. Let me see what I can do. He perused his notes, coming up with a tonic of laudanum and chamomile, which should help to keep her calm if such events came on again. Any other complaints? None, she declared happily once again, but turned her eyes out to the garden. There was a distance in her eyes that Nigel had recognised the last few times he had been here. As a doctor, he was trained to look after a person's body. But it had not escaped his notice that there was something bothering Lady Georgiana's mind as of late. Whenever he visited these days, he usually found her alone, staring into the garden or at one of her magazines. Her son and his wife were very busy and had lives of their own with their children. Though she saw them regularly, it still left plenty of time for isolation. How often do you leave the house? Nigel asked slowly, taking hold of her wrist and turning her hand back and forth as he checked over her old injury. Occasionally, she shrugged as if it was no great matter. I like my home and my garden very much. She nodded out at the beautiful flowers. If I venture far, then I fear... She trailed off and swallowed, refusing to look at him now. He knew that look. She is so conscious of propriety that she is worried about confessing anything to me. We all fear things, my lady, he said, softening his tone as he released her wrist for it was healing perfectly fine. What is it you fear? I fear. She cleared her throat before finding the courage to continue on. I fear falling when I am out and about. I could not stand the thought of injuring myself again in public. She waved her hand pointedly in emphasis. Imagine what people would say. You should not think of what people say. Nigel deepened his voice. You enjoy the outdoors, my lady. It is good for your health, and I wish you would make the most of it. 
Is this another of your recommendations, Doctor? She asked with an amused smile. Walk beyond my garden's walls? Well, it helps if you do as a doctor asks. What are we here for otherwise? His wryness brought another smile to her lips. I do not know. She shook her head, returning to her focus of the flowers beyond the windows. I would feel nervous of going out alone. Her eyes shifted to the empty chairs around him. Nigel looked at each wicker seat in turn, a thought occurring to him. By Lady Georgiana fearing going out, she was forcing herself into isolation. With so few people coming to see her, loneliness was only growing worse. Sometimes a doctor's advice shouldn't just be about the body, but the mind too. Have you ever thought about taking on a companion? A companion? What a notion. She laughed comically at the idea, resting her chin in her bony hand as the skin around her green eyes wrinkled. Ladies who hire companions cannot make friends without paying for them. The words came from your lips, not mine, my lady. He continued in the jest with her. I know what you mean, he said, his tone turning serious. But it is not always the case. Sometimes one just needs companionship. Her brows raised across her cracked forehead. Do you take your own advice, Doctor? I am sorry? You are a successful doctor indeed, one of a position too, she gestured to him, and Nigel sat back. The matter of his birth wasn't something he discussed very openly, for it did not concern him. He preferred to be known as Dr. Bale and nothing more. You are old enough to be married, are you not? Yet you have not taken a wife. No, I have not. Nigel's stomach knotted tightly as he turned away and fussed with his medicine bag, intent on suddenly looking busy with his work. You stare at your medicine bag the way I do my flowers, Doctor. As perceptive as you always are, my lady. Nigel returned his focus to her with a sigh. Yet my personal affairs are not what we are here to discuss. I am here to help you. And who helps you? she asked, that amused smile still in place. I am not in need of help, he assured her. Now, let me listen to your heart one more time. Let me see if I can hear this fluttering. He took her wrist and found her pulse, counting it out on his lap as he calculated the beats per minute. She stayed silent the whole time, staring out at her flowers, with her smile quickly slipping from its place. More than once did Nigel lose count and have to start again as he was so distracted by his patient's expression. More than anything did he wish to help her, to see Lady Georgiana full of life and happiness again. There must be something more I can do. The door opened before any more discussion could take place between them. My lady, the butler, Mr Trevor Hart, walked in, carrying a letter on a small silver card tray. A letter has just arrived for you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. She took the letter and retrieved her wrist from Nigel, breaking the red wax seal as Nigel turned his focus down to his notes. It seemed Lady Georgiana's heartbeat was regular enough, and the number of beats was similar to his last visits. But he made some extra notes to keep an eye on her condition and check the latest research on the matter of the heart. It was still a somewhat confusing thing and the last time he had read up on the heart, there was little more to be learned. Oh, goodness, Lady Georgiana sat back, fiddling with her pearls once again as she read the letter. Is all well? Nigel paused with his notes. It is from the daughter of one of my cousins, Lady Clara Aldington. She smiled softly. I have not heard from her in many years. She turned the letter over, her eyes widening. I suppose this is what some would call serendipitous. How do you mean? Nigel asked, lowering his pencil down to the notebook. She has asked if her daughter can come and stay here for a while. She fears the girl has a lot to learn to become a young lady, and hopes that introduction to my society and that of London can teach her much. Lady Georgiana smiled. I have not seen the child for a few years, though I suppose she will no longer be a child but a young woman. You would have company, my lady, and perhaps it would satisfy your need not to pay for a more formal companion. 
His humoured smile made her laugh softly. Yes, I do not wish to be seen to pay for friends. She chuckled and waved the letter in the air before folding it up neatly in her lap. I could consider it, I suppose. I would infinitely prefer to make some use of my time. There is only so long one can sit here and stare at the flowers after all. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. She trailed off, doing exactly as she said, and turning to look at the blooms. In the silence that descended, Nigel wondered if she lost track of time a little, or even realised if he was still there, as she was so engrossed in looking at those flowers. Yes, this girl could be the way forward. She could keep Lady Georgiana company and draw her away from this room a little, give her something to occupy her thoughts. Well, I think it an excellent idea, Nigel declared as he stood from his seat. Lady Georgiana turned to look at him, slightly wide-eyed as if shaken from her thoughts. If you do intend to follow a doctor's recommendations, then I heartily suggest you accept your cousin's offer. Bold indeed, Doctor, she smiled, though I suppose I must do as you say. It's nice to know I'm listened to a little by my patients, he added with a wry tone and bowed to her. Until next time, Lady Georgiana. Thank you, Doctor. As always. She smiled in parting and moved to stand, but he waved a hand, urging her not to exert herself so, though they both knew that in his position many other men would expect her to bow. As he took his leave of the house, Nigel paused on the driveway by his chestnut horse, who snorted in greeting. He glanced back at the house that was tucked away from the main roads of London. Some might have styled it a cottage, with rose trellises up the walls and surrounded by flowers and fresh lawns, but it was far too large to be a cottage to Nigel's mind. The Dowager Countess had a fine home she had retired to, and as Nigel gazed at it, it struck him there was just one problem with this place. It is too quiet. Perhaps this companion will do some good for Lady Georgiana after all. He turned to his horse and climbed up into the saddle before riding away. Chapter 4 Nigel I'll bring it over now, Doctor. Thank you. Nigel smiled and retreated to the corner of the inn, where he so often took his meals. The sun had dropped in the night sky so far that it cast the thinnest of yellow lights through the small windows of the inn. Tallow candles filled the space, with one rush light in the middle of the table where Nigel sat himself. Shaking off his tailcoat, for the summer's eve was a hot one, he sat heavily down into a settle bench and waited for his food. Tonight, the inn was busy, and his friend, the innkeeper Bernard, was rushed off his feet. It took many minutes for him to deliver the pigeon pie to Nigel with the ale, and apologised profusely for the wait. You don't need to worry, Bernard. I can see you're busy. How's the back, by the way? He asked, taking the ale and gesturing with the cup to the large man beside him. Bernard was a man who always ate the scraps off his diner's plates to save money elsewhere. The result was a large belly, and with his active job taking care of the inn, the extra weight and the labour had led to a bad back indeed. Oh, poor, poor indeed. He shook his head, making his jowls tremble. Have you tried the tonic I gave you? Nigel asked, sitting forward and resting his elbows on the edge of the table. Bernard glanced over his shoulder in the direction of his wife, Sarah, who stood at the bar serving other customers. She says I'm not to drink too much. We can't afford much more of it. Bernard, please, just take it, Nigel pleaded with him. He'd seen for himself when examining Bernard that he was in excessive pain. I can always look at lowering the price of the tonic if it's needed. You would do that? Bernard's eyes widened. Yes, of course. But remember our deal. Nigel gestured to his rounded stomach. Lose a little of that weight as well. It may keep you warm, but it's what is making your back so bad. I remember, Doctor, thank you. Thank you so much. He hurried back off to the bar with a fresh spring in his step. Nigel smiled as he watched him walk away. 
His customers were both poor and wealthy. He didn't discriminate or choose between them. And as he never did this occupation for the money, he did not mind what he was paid for his services. As long as I help people, that is what matters most. Nigel turned his attention to his food and pulled out a book he'd managed to purchase after leaving Lady Georgiana's house, discussing problems of the heart and its rhythms. As he ate, he finished the ale quickly and saw out of the corner of his eye a slender hand that took the empty cup. Would you like another, sir? A woman's gentle voice asked. Nigel looked up, so shocked at the fair face before him that he was tongue-tied for a minute or two. She had great blue eyes and rich brown hair. Her cheap gown showed she was a girl who worked at the bar, and when she caught him looking, she smiled all the more. Um, yes, thank you. He nodded at her, offering up a few more coins. She hurried away and returned a few minutes later with a fresh ale that she placed down in front of him. When she didn't go away at once, Nigel was distracted, staring at her once again. Well, I can't deny everything, can I? I'm still a man. As much as he divided himself from women these days, a beautiful face was still captivating. Would you like some company, sir? She gestured to the empty settle bench opposite him and offered another one of those sweet smiles. For a second, Nigel didn't say anything. A brief imagination flashed in his mind of accepting her offer and sitting down with her, talking for a short while. It would be an indulgence indeed to allow himself to smile and talk with a young woman as fair as her. I must remember my resolution. Not tonight. Thank you. He looked away from her down at his book, pretending to be keenly interested in what he was reading. Very well. Night, sir. She retreated from the table and moved back toward the bar. When he was certain she had turned away, Nigel lifted his head enough for his eyes to follow her. He admired her another time, taking in the hair, the curve of her neck and the way she walked. It did something to him, stirred something deep within his gut, an intense longing. Yet she was gone so fast behind the bar that it dampened the feeling fast. Returning his focus to his food and his book, he tried his best not to think about her again. He thought of the heart and the way it pumped blood around the body, how many ventricles there were, and the latest theories on what stimulated the heart to pump at all. He read of some evasive ideas, of one man who, though it was a person's spirit itself that kept the heart beating. There was another who proposed it was some sort of signal, like the connection of nerves. Lastly, there was some mad theory of it being heat in the body. All rubbish, I am certain. Distracted at the end of the evening when the beautiful woman came to collect his empty cup and plate once more, he could not sit still any more. He left the inn, much sooner than he normally would have done, waving to Bernard in parting as he stepped outside. It is for the best. As darkness swept in, Nigel climbed the last of the stairs up to his attic rooms. The corridor was small and pokey. He even bumped his shoulders repeatedly against the walls as he struggled in the darkness, fumbling in his pockets to search for a key. It didn't seem to matter how cramped the conditions were. Nigel had no intention of purchasing anything larger. This will do for a doctor like me. Why would I need anything vaster than this? He eventually managed to put the key in the lock and turn the door, stepping inside. Dropping his medicine bag and his book to the nearest table, he reached for the mantelpiece and hunted for a tinderbox, lighting a small rushlight. The feeble flame cast a small amount of light across the room, so he raised it higher, allowing it to fall on as many things as possible. The buttery light revealed the stacks of books, some falling off shelves for there were so many. The table that should have been a dining table was set up more like a desk, with so many doctor's notes and books that the oak surface was barely discernible at all. Pushing some of the books to the side, Nigel retrieved the notebook where he had made notes for Lady Georgiana that day and laid it flat with the others. Amongst the papers on the table were the periodicals that Lady Georgiana had given him, written by her daughter-in-law and some of the other successful society ladies the Dowager Countess liked to talk so much about. Nigel dropped one of his books on top of the periodicals. He'd accepted them when Lady Georgiana offered one day, 
but he'd taken no further interest in them as he spent too much of his time reading and researching his own business affairs. There were new books on anatomy that he had yet to add to his collection, and he knew that Lady Georgiana had recently acquired a set of books on the studies of an Italian doctor that he was most keen to read. Finding his eyes sore after reading so long that day, he rubbed them, trying to soothe some of that feeling, and stepped back from the table, turning to look at the rest of the room. On the far side was a small armchair beside a fire, and another stack of shelves bearing books beside it. Discreetly hidden by the shelves was a door that led to his bedchamber and garderobe. He stepped through this door, taking the rushlight with him, intent on finding some peace. After undressing, he laid down on the bed in nothing but a loose pair of breeches. It was too hot to think of wearing a nightshirt or pulling the covers over his body. He laid on the bed, staring at the ceiling with the rushlight beside him. Frequently, he considered blowing the flame out and casting the room into darkness. But every time he closed his eyes, he found sleep was a great distance away. His mind was too active. Every time he closed his eyes, he saw the beautiful face of the woman from the inn and wondered what could have happened if he had invited her to sit down with him. They were a distance apart in positions, but that was far from what was on his mind. He imagined other things instead, indulgences of her being in the same bed, of stolen touches, things that would excite and make his body shudder. No. He spoke aloud as his eyes opened. He'd promised long ago that such things were no longer for him. He'd closed down his life to the idea of a partnership with anyone. As he sat up in the bed, with Lady Georgiana's words from their meeting that day coming back to him. Do you take your own advice, Doctor? You are old enough to be married, are you not? Yet you have not taken a wife. Nigel pushed the words away angrily and stepped off the bed, abandoning the idea of sleep altogether. He told himself it was the heat that made it too difficult. How could he possibly sleep when the air was too hot? Standing, he took the rushlight and moved back to the main room of his apartments. He thrust open the window, trying to let in a little of the cool night's breeze. Then he sat down in the chair by the window and reached for one of his many books. Turning the pages to his bookmark, he absorbed himself in the world of his teachings, trying to focus on them as much as possible. He was there for so long that the rushlight burnt out completely, just as his eyes slipped shut. He drifted into a restless sleep where he saw many things. He saw Lady Georgiana staring at the flowers as she held a hand to her chest. She was in pain or frightened, he could not tell, but when he spoke to her, she would not say what scared her so much. She merely continued to stare at the flowers. He followed her gaze, looking out to the garden where he saw someone wandering between those flowers. He couldn't see the figure clearly, but he could tell it was a woman from the silhouette that revealed a gown. She wandered through the garden with ease, trailing her fingers across the blooms. Then abruptly, the image in his mind changed. Nigel was no longer in the sunny garden room of Lady Georgiana's house. He stood in the cold doorway of another room, where the air felt like ice and there was dew on the tip of his nose. He stepped into the room, bending down beneath the low timber beams, his eyes set on the bed. Nigel woke up. He dropped the book off his lap as his head turned around, frantically in the darkness. He breathed heavily as the heat struck him, and he remembered he was not in the cold room anymore. It was a dream, a memory. Chapter 5 Catherine Good Lord, Catherine murmured as she stared beyond the window of the carriage. The great streets of London were much busier than she had expected. Heavily reminded of the way ants hurried through cracks in the street, she watched the people bustling to and fro. Maids carried boxes for their mistresses, as fine ladies laughed and linked arms with their friends. Gentlemen wandered on horses, some taking up great strides in the street, as others raced past with messages in their hands, eager to be delivered. There was not a corner of the street where a person sat still. Everyone was active. The sheer energy had Catherine resting a hand on the window of the carriage, peering out to see as much as she could. 
Eager to see even more, she pressed her head beyond the window, leaning dangerously out. Miss Fitzroy, the footman called from the back of the carriage, shouting to be heard over the catcalls from those in the street that called to their friends to be heard. Please, go back inside. What if a horse was to bolt past now? Then I shall have to move fast, she declared with a laugh, having no intention of pulling herself back in yet. When a rider did dart past, with a horse wildly out of control, she dropped herself back onto the coach bench as laughter tumbled from her lips. Gazing in awe at the street, she tried to commit everything to memory so she could put it in a letter later to tell Sebastian. Maybe London has something to offer I did not consider before. The carriage turned sharply off the main street, urging Catherine to press her face through the space of the window, keen for one last view of all the busyness. She saw two young ladies walking beside one another with something in their hands, a type of magazine that they pointed at and talked of keenly. I wonder what it is they are reading. The carriage passed through a tall gate, heading toward a house that was set back from the road. Forced to retreat into the coach one more time, she sat back on the bench and looked down at what she was wearing, remembering her mother's last words to her. Wear these, they are appropriate, Clara had said as she pulled thin lace gloves onto Catherine's hands. Straighten your gown of creases when you arrive and make sure this sits right. She had reached for Catherine's bonnet next and adjusted the bow under her chin. I'll miss you too, mother. Clara had embraced her tightly then, saying she would indeed miss Catherine. The embrace was followed by another from her father, Horatio, who held on tight for many minutes. Look after yourself, he whispered, for her ears only. And you can come home at any time. Write to me, and I shall send the carriage. Catherine's heart ached for missing her parents now, but she did as her mother asked, straightening the creases in her peach gown and adjusting the bonnet on her head. As the coach came to a stop, she lifted her head, feeling her chin drop as she took in the view of the house. It was old indeed, yet grand, and strangely styled the Manor Cottage, on a small sign beside the front door. There was nothing that seemed like a cottage about the building to Catherine's eyes. It was large, made of red and grey stone, standing tall and proud, set back from the road with large and impressive gates. God's blood, she muttered quietly, feeling as out of place here as she did at her cousin's house, the Duke of Gordon's estate. As the carriage halted and the footman moved to the door to open it for her, the front door of the house opened and a grand lady stepped out. Something stirred in Catherine's mind, and she realised she recognised the woman. This was Lady Georgiana Bingley, who she had last seen three or four years ago when she had come to call on Clara in Dorset. She stood tall, with a thin and wiry frame. She walked out of the house with a stick in one of her hands that she didn't lean too heavily upon. Shielding her eyes against the sunlight, her thin lips spread into a smile as her eyes found Catherine's. Catherine, child, it has been too long indeed she declared warmly, striding out of the house as the butler and a young maid followed. Catherine stood and hurried down from the carriage, but in her eagerness to see the kind lady again, her foot got trapped in the hem of her gown. Oh! Catherine cried out as she fell through the air. The footman ended up knocked to the ground as she dropped to the floor. The two of them fell into a bundle, with their legs entangled as Catherine planted her palms on the gravel driveway. Realising what a display she had made, she stayed there for a second, breathing deeply and taking stock of her position. Slowly she lifted her head. Finding Lady Georgiana had halted in front of her, with the stick thrust deep down into the ground. A lady does not fall getting out of a carriage, Catherine. Despite the words, she smiled. I'm so sorry. Catherine hurried to stand and managed to accidentally kick the footman. Oomph! He was winded, scrambling to his knees. She went to help him, taking his arm and dragging him up until she caught Lady Georgiana's expression. She still held on to that amusing smile but now raised an eyebrow. At that movement Catherine dropped the footman's arm and he as good as fell down again. Well, this is a good start, 
Catherine murmured with a wry tone. My mother will be pleased. She hurried to stand in front of Laddie Georgiana and Bob a deep curtsy. A good start, indeed. A sudden laugh escaped Lady Georgiana's lips, one so strong that Catherine's chin jolted upward. You seem shocked, dear. I have made a spectacle of myself, have I not? She gestured behind her where the footman was now being helped up by the driver. I am sorry. There is no need. How to step out of a carriage is something that can be taught easily. Besides, she stepped forward and lowered her voice, so only Catherine could hear her. It was certainly more entertaining to see the way you do it. Catherine smiled, deciding that she rather liked Lady Georgiana even more than she remembered doing so. Now come, come, there are some ladies inside I'd like you to meet. What fortunate timing it is for you to arrive as they are visiting. Lady Georgiana led the way inside with Catherine trailing behind. She offered one last apologetic glance to the footman who waved her off, clearly pretending it was nothing, though she felt even more guilty when he limped away. Stepping into the house, Catherine admired every corner. The fine ornaments on the sideboards and the paintings on the walls were all exquisite. Lady Georgiana took no note of her own ornaments, though, and pushed on toward the back of the house. Come on, come on. No dawdling, not when there are people to meet. Catherine hurried to catch up with her, stepping into a room at the back of the house that was flooded with sunlight, thanks to the windows that stretched nearly from the floor to the ceiling and arched at the very top. Wicker chairs were darted about, standing between potted orange trees. In two of those seats sat women who were looking over the same magazine that Catherine had spied the women in the street reading. Behind them stood a third woman, striking in presence with unusually large eyes and such fine clothes that she had to be wealthy indeed. Ah, is this your cousin, Lady Georgiana? The lady asked, rounding the other two who were seated to come to a Catherine. One of them, Lady Georgiana explained. This is Miss Catherine Fitzroy, daughter to Baron Aldington. Catherine Child, may I present to you the Duchess of Lestonmere? The Duchess bobbed a curtsy as Catherine was left speechless. She hurried to curtsy but was rather afraid she would fall over again. Th the author, Catherine managed to stammer aloud. Yes, that is me. The Duchess laughed off the words. I have read your books, Your Grace. Catherine had been gifted the first one by the Duchess a few years before from her mother. Since then, she was often found to be reading the Duchess of Lestonmere's works. I adore them. You are too kind. Careful not to compliment her too much, a jesting voice called from the chairs. She has enough her own way as it is. Ah, Chloe, the Duchess laughed heartily. Forgive my sister-in-law, she always knows how to get to me. She gestured for the woman who had spoken to stand and walk forward. Catherine met her in the middle of the room, curtsying to her and admiring the deep black hair and green eyes. My sister-in-law, the Countess of Nightburn, and gown designer. The Duchess gestured to her. Catherine stalled again, certain she could find no words this time. The Countess of Nightburn's designs had been talked of much over the last two seasons in Dorset. Only the ladies of the Tun who had relatives in London had managed to obtain some of her designs. Have I made you speechless? The Countess asked, rubbing her hands together. At last, I've been hoping my presence would stun someone one of these days. Between you and I, Miss Fitzroy, she pretended to whisper conspiratorially, I am hardly the woman my reputation perceives me to be. I am no great lady. Treat me as you would any other. Yes, and close your jaw, child, Lady Georgiana said at Catherine's side. A lady should not gawk so. My apologies. Catherine felt daunted in a room of such successful women. The Duchess of Lestonmere and the Countess of Nightburn were so at ease with one another jesting that Catherine felt as if she was intruding in a private audience. And lastly, my daughter-in-law, Lady Georgiana declared, gesturing to the auburn-haired woman who lowered the magazine to a table behind her and smiled as she approached. She was a beauty, with small, sweet features. Instead of curtsying to Catherine, she took her hand. 
Forgive my informality, she said in a rush. My poor mother-in-law sometimes despairs of me, but I was once a seamstress, so she forgives me my ways these days. Mostly, Lady Georgiana added, though she had a smile on her face as she approached the grandest of the wicker chairs and sat down. My daughter-in-law is now the owner of that periodical you see over there. She gestured with her stick to the magazine on the wicker table. And very happy owner indeed. It is a magazine for women, have you ever heard of it, Miss Fitzroy? Lady Bingley returned to the table and picked up the magazine, proffering it to Catherine to read. I have not, Catherine whispered in amazement as her eyes danced over the cover and her hands flicked through the pages. The opening page boasted of pieces written by the gentlewoman writer, as well as articles by the Duchess of Lestonmere. The magazine, entitled A Woman's Periodical, brought a laugh to Catherine's lips. Is there an intended double meaning to the title? Completely, Lady Bingley added with a finger to her lips. Though do not hint to any man, it is the case for they seem to miss the jest entirely. Yes, I had rather wondered at that myself, Lady Georgiana said with narrowed eyes at her daughter-in-law. Yet, it has been going for so long now and it is so successful, one could hardly think of changing the title. Exactly. Catherine held on to the magazine tightly, so struck by the ladies in the room and what different lives they led that she was frozen to the spot. They are like Arabella. Her aunt shot into her mind how Arabella had carved a path of her own in life before she had married, a life where she worked for herself and did much for the good of others. It is fascinating to meet you, Catherine said with eagerness to Lady Bingley. I would dearly love to talk to you more about your work. Then we shall indeed find the opportunity to talk more, though I regret we cannot stay for too long now. Lady Bingley looked at her mother-in-law. Perhaps we could come back for a dinner this week to talk with your cousin. Of course. Lady Georgiana offered a small smile and used her cane to suddenly walk toward one of the wicker chairs, sitting down heavily. Catherine followed her, noting there was a sudden tightness around the way that she smiled. Lady Georgiana, is all well? I... Lady Georgiana took a deep breath and raised a hand, placing it to her chest for a moment. That I do not know. I feel suddenly all... A quiver. A quiver? How so? Lady Bingley dropped down on her other side, kneeling and reaching for the lady's hand with concern. I am certain I am quite well. Despite Lady Georgiana's insistence, there was a paleness in her pallor, and something distinctly wrong in her expression. Catherine laid a hand to the lady's other wrist, offering comfort, though she discreetly reached for the woman's pulse, just as Arabella's notes had taught her to do. She felt the noticeable tremble of the pulse. It wasn't quite regular. Her widened eyes were clearly seen by Lady Bingley. Perhaps we should send for your doctor, just in case. Lady Bingley took control, standing straight and turning to nod at Lady Nightburn, who was already hurrying out of the room in search of some messenger. That is not necessary. I simply need to rest for a moment. Lady Georgiana breathed deeply yet she gripped the walking stick beside her harder too, seemingly barely aware that Catherine had her wrist at all. On second thoughts, yes, maybe Dr. Beale is a good idea. She breathed suddenly deeper, and Catherine softened her hold on the woman. As the other three ladies began to talk of ways to get the doctor there sooner, Catherine thought of Arabella's notes. She'd read much about herbs that could keep the body and the heart calm. She wondered at once about the effects of chamomile, and whether it could be of use to Lady Georgiana now. If only I knew more, then I might be able to be of use to her at this moment. As they waited for the doctor's arrival, despite Lady Georgiana insisting she was perfectly well, subtly, she released the walking stick and took Catherine's hand. It was a silent touch, but one that spoke volumes to Catherine. Lady Georgiana did not want to reveal that she was indeed a little afraid. Chapter 6 Nigel Nigel burst through the door, not waiting for the butler to give him entry or for the door to be opened for him. 
If something was wrong with Lady Georgiana, as the crumpled note suggested that had been hastily delivered to him in his apartments, then he had to be here at once to see her. Lady Georgiana, he called down the corridor, already heading toward the garden room at the back of the property, as he had a good guess where she would be. She's here, a voice called. Nigel entered the garden room, seeing three ladies that were all fluttering around Lady Georgiana like butterflies on a flower that would not settle. This excitement will do you no good. Nigel walked between all three ladies and dragged forward a stool, sitting down abruptly in front of his patient as he took stock of her condition. The note said little. What concerns you? It is... She dropped her voice to a whisper clearly not happy to reveal how she felt in front of so many others. My heart. Nigel took in the paleness of her complexion and the quiver of her hand on the arm of the wicker chair. She is frightened. Well, the heart can get excited, can it not? Nigel asked as he took her wrist, ready to count out her pulse. I imagine this busy meeting is hardly helping matters. I beg your pardon? a voice said from behind him, but he didn't turn to pay attention to that voice. His concentration was completely consumed by Lady Georgiana. Once he finished counting out her pulse, he noticed at once what was wrong. Her heart kept fluttering, as if the signals were slightly out of sync. It was excited and struggling to calm itself down. Feeling jittery, he asked her in a whisper. Yes, she nodded her eyes never settling for one moment. I do not know whether to sit here very still or stand and pace. Pray, stay sitting, Nigel urged her as he reached into his medicine bag. If I may, my lady, I'd like to ask a few more questions than I did the other day about this fluttering you describe. She nodded wordlessly. It was rare for Lady Georgiana to stay so silent and was testament to the fact something was wrong. When you have these flutterings, how long can they last? A few seconds? Minutes? Has it ever lasted beyond an hour? All of the above, she murmured. Yet this, it feels stronger than before, more persistent than intermittent. If I may, I'd like to feel your pulse stronger now. It's a more private touch, but I wish you to trust me, he pleaded with her. You know I trust you, Dr. Bale. She smiled rather sadly before her face fell flat. Nigel leaned forward and reached for the old lady's neck. It was a much easier place to find the pulse and always a stronger perception of what the rhythm truly was. Her skin was rather cold to the touch, but he judged that to be due to her age. He paused for a few seconds, feeling the rhythm as it raised itself out of its normal tempo. I know exactly what this is. Lady Georgiana, here, try this. A rather husky voice approached, and a woman offered Lady Georgiana a cup of tea that she placed on the table by Lady Georgiana's elbow. Tea will not help, Nigel said dismissively. Please, take it away. He reached into his bag and sought out some vials of other things. What? the voice asked distractedly. Tea will not help, Nigel repeated his voice firmer this time. Tea has caffeine, which is known to excite the heart. We need to keep it calm, not excite it now. Then it is good this is not a normal tea, is it not? The woman's tart voice captured his attention. It is chamomile. Nigel looked up, his chin jerking in the direction of the young woman. Who on earth are you? He had not noticed she was in the room at all before, for he'd only seen the three finely dressed women, this young lady was entirely different. She wore a peach gown that was a little scuffed from dirt, and her dark hair pinned back in a chignon was escaping its updo wildly. The intensity of those dark eyes made Nigel do a double take, staring at her twice in surprise. She is either a well dressed maid or a companion. She stood out as not belonging with the other so grandly dressed ladies. Chamomile, he said in surprise. Standing hurriedly, he took the cup from her hand and inhaled the scent of the liquid needing to be certain. Yes, the lady added, her glare levelling at him. 
Such things are good to make one calm, are they not? Nigel didn't answer as he returned the cup to the table. How did she know that? Well? She pushed him on the matter, arching one of those deep brown brows. Something jerked in Nigel's stomach, a brief twinge of attraction that he thrust away. It will not hurt you, Lady Georgiana, yet we must do something more. He returned the tea to the table and returned to his searching in the medical bag, probing for what he knew he needed. I believe what you have is an excitement of the heart's rhythm, something called atrial fibrillation. I am told it is a common condition, though I believe many do not notice it when they experience it. Others are not so fortunate, Lady Georgiana finished for him. A hand was now on her chest. And what is the prognosis? Before Nigel could answer, the ladies gathered around her again. Lady Bingley reached for her mother-in-law's shoulder, clinging tight, and the mysterious young woman held her hand, urging her to take the tea. Nigel couldn't help looking at that young woman another time before he returned his focus to Lady Georgiana. The prognosis is a good one, he said, his voice deep as he rested his weight on the arm of the chair. He looked Lady Georgiana in the eye, needing her to hear every word. It is a condition people live with. It is not something that is fatal. A collective sigh of relief escaped the ladies in the room, everyone except the young woman holding the tea. She stared down at the cup and thrust it into Lady Georgiana's hand once more. It was then Nigel noticed the way Lady Georgiana's fingers quivered in the young woman's grasp. She's trying to calm Lady Georgiana's mind as well as her heart. Nigel reached for the digitalis leaves he kept in a small vial and held them up for Lady Georgiana to see. This is the treatment, yet it must be managed. Do I wish to know what it is? Lady Georgiana curled her lip. Perhaps not. Nigel accepted it was the case. The words digitalis and foxgloves put fear into many, as when taken in too high a concentration, it could be fatal. He placed the vial down on the table beside him and reached for another vial where he had already mixed ground down leaves with water in order to create the right concentration. As he turned back to pick up the other vial, he found it gone. He jerked his head around trying to search for it. The young woman with the intense eyes was holding the vial in her hand, examining the leaves. Did she? Yes, thank you. Nigel snatched it back from her. He didn't need her revealing what it was to Lady Georgiana and putting fear into her. Wait, how did she know what the leaves are? He returned it to the bag and offered up the watered version of the leaves. Take this, he urged Lady Georgiana. This should help to bring your heart down. It's not unusual to feel a little lightheaded afterward, but there should be no greater side effects and I urge rest. Very well. Lady Georgiana took the vial and sipped it as per his instructions. When she was done, she grimaced at the taste and snatched up the chamomile cup from the young woman beside her, downing that as well. How often must I take it? For now, we shall stick with you taking it when you feel this fluttering. If the fluttering continues, then we can look at you taking a smaller dose every day, but I do not think we need to concern ourselves with that just yet. He smiled softly and returned the empty vial to his bag. He pulled out another and placed it on the table beside him. You can keep this one, my lady. If you need to, you can take it. But I'd always ask you to send for me if you feel this fluttering. As Lady Georgiana sat back, her spine softening as she was clearly comforted by his words, Nigel smiled. This is what I live for. Healing and bringing comfort to people. It was his purpose in life. Nothing more could make him this happy. He was certain of it. I would also urge less excitement when you feel such fluttering. He pointedly looked at the gathered ladies who had fallen into panicked conversation. He raised his voice a little, ensuring they heard every word he said, though he still addressed Lady Georgiana. I am glad you have company, my lady, but unnecessary excitement and chatter could lead to such things. Unnecessary. 
the young woman beside Lady Georgiana stepped forward an inch, moving closer to Nigel. His eyes darted toward her again as he marvelled at the richness of those eyes and her strong cheekbones. She was an inconvenient beauty, one that he didn't want to be staring at for too long. I would ask what the point of such meetings are, he asked, standing and meeting the woman's gaze. If they are to excite my patient, then I will advise against them. They seek to come and visit their friend, the lady said pointedly, gesturing to Lady Georgiana. Whether you find their conversation stimulating or not is rather beside the point, is it not? They have not come to see you but Lady Georgiana. Lady Georgiana laughed softly, though her hand still tapped out a rhythm on her chest. She speaks her mind, does she not? She addressed her comments to her daughter-in-law who still stood behind her. I think I like her more and more, Lady Bingley's voice was a whisper. What is it you object to in their conversation, I wonder? The lady continued on, staring straight at Nigel now. He was irked at her challenge of him. Just because she had thought to bring a chamomile tea did not mean she knew more about this situation than he did. The excitement and overexertion, he said, his voice harsh. Her heart at times like this must be kept calm. These ladies chatter about... He paused, glancing their way noting who the ladies were, for he had met them all before in Lady Georgiana's company. They only ever came to talk of business and the periodical that was discarded on a table nearby. About business, and this magazine hardly helps, nor does it matter, does it? Lady Bingley, sit down before you fall down at the insult, Lady Nightburn said in the room, standing behind her. You think it is the first time I have heard a man disparage the periodical so? It is not. Lady Bingley was perfectly calm as she shook her head, apparently not offended. Yet the young woman beside Nigel was offended. She'd moved her hands to her hips and glared at him with such intensity that he was beginning to wonder what bothered him more about her appearance. Was it the fact that he thought it outlandish she would be so forthright with him at all? Or was it those intense eyes that bothered him more? You are wrong to judge them so, Doctor. I would hazard a guess that if you were in a room full of men talking of business, you would not object then, would you? She asked with a knowing smirk growing on her lip. There was a collective whisper from the other ladies as they stared at the two of them. Nigel stared openly at the young woman, shocked she had called him out on disparaging them because they were women. That is not what I meant, he said, his voice deep and husky. Is it not? No. I respect any woman who endeavours for an occupation. He deepened his tone. You shock me, the lady said tartly, especially considering your disregard for them just now. I half expected you to shoo us all from the room as if we were flies. I am here for my patient, not to tiptoe around the hurt feelings of any lady. Nigel's strong voice made the other women step back. They fell into their own conversation, apparently deciding that they did not need to concern themselves with such disregard. Lady Georgiana, on the other hand, was completely attentive to their conversation. Dr. Bale has an unusual sense of humour, child, Lady Georgiana said with ease, at last releasing the hold she had on her chest. He speaks his mind, that is all. Yes, I noticed. The lady stepped away from him and moved to Lady Georgiana's side. There was something about no longer having those intense eyes on him that irked him once again. Wait, why am I longing to look at them? I came for you, Lady Georgiana, Nigel addressed his patient. I do not have to stand here and put up with the censure of what is, I presume, a maid or a companion. He gestured toward the young woman, expecting someone to explain who exactly she was. She turned sharply to stare at him her expression so different that he stalled. Her eyes had widened and her lips flattened together. It was as if he had wounded her. He shifted his weight between his feet, wondering exactly what he had done wrong. Ahem, Lady Nightburn cleared her throat across the room. Perhaps this is the moment where the good doctor, she emphasised the word with a little irony, should be introduced to your cousin, Lady Georgiana. Yes, just so. 
Lady Georgiana smiled, clearly humoured by the moment. Dr. Bale, this is no maid or companion. This is my cousin, Miss Catherine Fitzroy, daughter of Baron Aldington. Ah. Nigel hurried to bow his head in realisation. He hadn't realised, hadn't even expected her to be high-born. What of the dirt on her dress? What of her challenge of his ways? How can the daughter of a baron know what digitalis is? She refused to look at him now, but returned to her seat beside Lady Georgiana. I see I have made the air awkward, he whispered. Well, I am entertained by the conversation, Lady Georgiana chuckled softly. And I am pleased to say that my heart is calming itself. Good, good, I am glad to hear it. Nigel offered a little more advice on staying calm and keeping the vial close in case she needed to take some more. Then he took his leave. Good day to you all. It upset him when he bowed, and Miss Fitzroy didn't look at him again. Her eyes were only on Lady Georgiana. As he left the house and hurried to his horse, he glanced back repeatedly to the house, thinking of Miss Fitzroy and the heat of their conversation. That should not have happened. Chapter 7 Catherine What will Mama say? Catherine whispered as she prodded at the toast on her plate in front of her. It was easy to see that her first day at Lady Georgiana's house had been a disaster, and she was certain her blush of embarrassment wasn't yet gone. As well as falling catastrophically from the carriage, she had argued with Lady Georgiana's doctor, and he had mistaken her for a maid. A maid? Catherine looked down at the gown she wore today, in an effort not to be thought of as a maid again. It was a pale sage green with a small pattern of white lilies along the bodice, just above the empire line hem. A little finer than the gown she had chosen the day before, she supposed the biggest difference was that this one had no dirt upon it, as the one the day before had done from when she had fallen off the carriage. Oh God, she whispered looking around the room and awaiting Lady Georgiana's presence. She thought she heard sounds from beyond the window of the dining room and moving to her feet. She peered through the lead-lined glass, looking out to the drive. Yet the view was masked by flowers, and she could see nothing more beyond a horse and a man who stepped down. He disappeared inside, and when she discovered no more, Catherine huffed and returned to her chair. She sat down heavily and rested her elbows on the table placing her face in her hands. Mama would despair if she heard I'd been mistaken for a maid. She closed her eyes, thinking of the way Dr. Beale had stared at her with what could amount to disdain the day before. He was a handsome man, something that had shaken Catherine when he'd stepped into the room. She thought like a lot of doctors, Lady Georgiana's would be an old and wizened man, but Dr. Bale was far from that a young man quite tall with a level brow and light brown hair that curled at his temple. He was striking. Those light blue eyes were shocking too when he looked at her. The moustache on his upper lip was trimmed well, and he clearly took care of himself. The mere sight of him had done something to her stomach. She was reminded of something Sebastian had once said after seeing Elizabeth again. The stomach feels all a quiver, as if moths danced within it. Elbows off the table, child, Lady Georgiana said with ease. Catherine snatched her head out of her hands and leaned back as Lady Georgiana walked into the room. How are you feeling today? Catherine poured out the chamomile tea she had asked for the maids to prepare and placed a gup down for Lady Georgiana. Better, though perhaps a little tired. She put herself down at the head of the table, sighing as she smiled and reached for the chamomile cup. Yet I have had no more fluttering, so I'd say that is a good sign. Sit straight, dear. Catherine did as she asked, finding it difficult to raise her eyes to meet Lady Georgiana's. Come on, out with it. Lady Georgiana waved the cup at her before she set about her breakfast, gathering toast form a basket and lathering it in jam. I'm sorry, Catherine asked in a small voice. You were thinking intently of something just now. She nodded at Catherine and then mimicked her posture, head in hands with spine slumped, before returning to her toast. What were you thinking of? Dr. Bailey, 
Catherine said in full honesty. One of Lady Georgiana's grey eyebrows arched high. Handsome man, is he not? What? Yes, no, I mean... Catherine shifted in her seat and managed to knock her knife off her plate. She caught it in the air narrowly before it could fall to the floor, yet managed to grab it by the used end so it got jam all over her palm. I mean, I was thinking about how he mistook me for a maid yesterday. She wiped the jam off her hand. My mother would be most displeased. Dr. Bale is an unusual man. Lady Georgiana sat back in her chair with a smile on her lips. His humour is not understood by everyone, just as his manner is not. His priority is his patient always, and when that happens he does not notice other things around him. I imagine he gave you a casual glance, and upon seeing the dirt on your gown yesterday he made a quick presumption. That is all. Catherine nodded, trying to persuade herself that her cousin was right. But she struggled. He thought I was a maid. The fact he may have looked down on her so made her fidget once again, angered that she had spent so long the day before thinking of that handsome face when he had probably barely noticed her at all. Now, if you are worried about men mistaking you for a maid, there are things we can do. Lady Georgiana smiled. Which leads me well into our first lesson today. Fashion. Fashion, Catherine said, wrinkling her nose. She liked fine things but had never considered herself a fashionable woman. No need to curl your nose so as if you have scented something rotten. Lady Georgiana rolled her eyes. All fashion is truly as choosing gowns you like to wear, dear. There are many great names of designers and modistes out there, not just associated with Covent Garden but Paris and Milan too. Catherine gulped, feeling somewhat daunted by the names of such places. No need to look so afraid. Lady Georgiana laughed once more. Here, eat up your breakfast and enjoy it. I have asked Lady Nightburn to come by and talk to you about fashion. She is the font of all knowledge on the subject, after all. Catherine smiled once more, excited by the prospect of seeing Lady Nightburn again. Yes, thank you. Catherine nibbled at her toast as she looked at Lady Georgiana, checking the woman over for any signs of a repeated of what had taken place the day before. Fortunately, she seemed at peace today, with not a care in the world and a soft smile on her lips. You look content, Catherine observed. I am, dear. Lady Georgiana smiled broadly now. Very content with my life. Besides, I am happily distracted at this moment, thinking of something that took place yesterday. What is that? Catherine asked around a mouthful of toast. When Lady Georgiana arched an eyebrow, she apologised and went back to chewing, not daring to open her mouth again when she was eating. I was just thinking of that curious exchange between you and Dr. Bale. You never did quite answer my words about finding him handsome. Do you, dear? Lady Georgiana asked, smiling and seeming very determined to have an answer. Well... Catherine pressed her lips together, thinking hard about an answer. When she thought of Dr. Beale, she saw that handsome face again, but he had never once smiled in her company, and his words came back to her. I think his manner quite dispels any charm from his handsomeness. Lady Georgiana chuckled at her words but said nothing more. Catherine sighed and flung herself back on the chaise long in the sitting room. I remember that exasperated look. Lady Nightburn mimicked her position, flinging herself down on the opposite settee. I often thought that same in my younger days when sent to learn at my father's request. Yet today is supposed to be a fun day. We are talking about clothes. Catherine laughed as she raised herself up, rather startled that Lady Nightburn had lost her posture and tossed herself down on the settee in such a similar fashion. There was something inherently elegant about Lady Nightburn, even when she attempted to be informal, she looked much finer than Catherine. I fear I am not the fashionable sort at all. Catherine winced. As you saw yesterday, I inevitably end up getting dirt on clothes from my clumsy ways, and my choice in gowns is more about what I like than what is fashionable. As for the latter, it is the way it should be. 
Lady Nightburn gathered a magazine from a table nearby and moved to Catherine's side, sitting down on the chaise longue beside her. You should only ever choose what you like to wear. I was never one for choosing the modistes of Paris and Milan, she grimaced, clearly repeating Lady Georgiana's exact words. And what I have discovered in my career is that those names do not matter anywhere near as much as one thinks. As long as it is something you like, there is a reason for it, and you will usually earn a compliment from somewhere for it. I suppose, Catherine said, chewing her lip as Lady Nightburn stretched out the magazine in her lap. First, show me the gowns you like, she urged. Catherine turned the pages of the periodical, barely picking out anything at all. The more she looked, the more her mind dwelled on the matter of Dr. Beeler and how he had been so convinced she was a maid or a companion. It irked her that she could not separate her mind from the moment. The more she tried to push the memory away, the harsher it came back to her. Right, enough of this. Lady Nightburn took the magazine away. With drama, she tossed it over her shoulder, so it landed somewhere on the floor. Catherine held a hand over her mouth, doing her best to try and stop her laughter. What was that for? To get your attention. Lady Nightburn tapped her temple, making Catherine start in surprise. You are not looking at the dresses, for you are thinking of something else. Come on, what are you thinking of? Catherine had no wish to reveal her self-conscious thoughts to Lady Nightburn, so she opted for another conversation, something that had bothered her all night. I was admiring what you and your friends have accomplished. Catherine's words clearly took her by surprise as Lady Nightburn sat taller. You have all had careers, and yet you have married too, and you all seem so happy for it. Catherine's smile turned rather sad. It reminds me of my aunt. She was a healer for a time and now she is a duchess. I love her dearly and admire her more than I can say. I guess I'm wondering if such a path could ever be open to me. Well, it certainly can be. Lady Nightburn smiled without hesitation. The true question is here, what is it that interests you? For me, it was, of course, clothes. For my friends, it was writing. And you? What interests you? She cocked her head to the side, waiting for Catherine to speak her mind. In truth, she thought of all the notes that Arabella had given her, and the way she would pore over those notes at night, trying to learn as much as she possibly could. Healing. Yet in particular the botany side. It intrigues me more than I can say how some old wives' tales turn out to have scientific applications, such as Echinacea for colds and St. John's wort for melancholy. Is that a flower? Lady Nightburn asked with a wrinkled nose. It sounds more like a medical condition. Ha! Yes, it is a flower. Catherine laughed with her. Well, if you ask me, you should keep doing your research. Chloe sat forward. It was how all our careers began, so I would encourage anyone to follow their heart. Now that I have tossed the magazine away, let me approach our discussion about fashion in another way. Is there anything you truly like, Catherine? Any item of clothing or accessory you are fond of? Actually, yes, there is. Catherine stood and urged Lady Nightburn to wait where she was. Hurrying out of the room, Catherine went to her chamber and retrieved Arabella's earrings before returning to the sitting room and proffering the earrings to Lady Nightburn. My aunt has allowed me to borrow these, yet every time I put them on, I do not feel worthy to wear them. Ah, I see. Lady Nightburn stood and held the earrings into the sunlight near the window. So, what we need is a gown that will go with the earrings very well. That would be wonderful, Catherine followed her to the window. Though I admit I do not know what that would be. Leave it to me. Chloe smiled broadly. I can design such a gown for you. She took out a sketchbook and drew a quick recreation of the earrings on the page before she handed them back to Catherine. Right now, I must go. I shall return some day soon with your design for you to see, but in the meantime, remember this. She stood beside Catherine with a smile on her face. I may love fashion, but I will be the first to admit it should not be the sum of our characters. 
even if Lady Georgiana suggests it is at time, she added in a small whisper. I urge you to wear what you wish to, Catherine, not what you believe others should want you to wear. She walked toward the doorway. And one more thing, I meant what I said about your passions. Do not be afraid of researching more into botany. You might be surprised by what you find. She waved in parting and was soon gone, leaving Catherine standing in the sitting room with a smile on her face. For her first lesson in being a fine lady, it was not at all what she had expected it to be. Imbued with a new energy thanks to Lady Nightburn's words, Catherine decided she would indeed continue her research. Knowing she couldn't rely on Arabella's lessons completely, for there was more to learn, Catherine left the sitting room and headed toward the library Lady Georgiana had shown her the day before. She traipsed through the corridors and appeared in the library near the front of the house, opening it wide where the scent of the books greeted her, old and musty. She inhaled deeply with a smile and turned to the shelves, running her fingers over the myriad of russet red and brown book spines as she sought out a book to read. Lady Georgiana doesn't keep any of the periodicals in here if that's what you're looking for. Catherine dropped the book in her grasp and turned around at the voice. Chapter 8 Catherine, what is he doing here? Catherine breathed deeply when she saw Dr. Bale on the other side of the library. He was not wearing his jacket and had his sleeves rolled up to his elbows, revealing a flash of toned muscle on his forearms. Catherine swallowed and tried to focus on other things. He wore a plain waistcoat, a cheap one, and his hair was swept back as it was the day before. He stood on a ladder propped against one of the shelves and leaned on the top rung, with two books in his other hand. He looked down at her from this great height, a rather curious expression on his face. I beg your pardon. She managed to find her voice. I said, if you're seeking out that woman's periodical, Lady Georgiana always keeps it close to her. She doesn't leave them in here. He turned back to face the shelves and returned the books to their places. Good morning to you too, Doctor. Her wryness caught his attention, and he looked back at her over his shoulder. There was something in that look that made her fidget. She wrung her hands together before remembering the dropped book and gathering it from the floor. I was not looking for the periodical. I was searching for books on botany. She slid the book back into place on the shelf, finding it was not the kind of thing she was looking for. Then you need these shelves, Dr. Bale gestured to the shelves in front of him. I did wonder yesterday how you knew what digitalis was, he muttered these words more to himself than her at all. Yes, you probably wondered how a maid could read such words at all. She scoffed, lifting her voice so he could clearly hear her as she crossed the room to the shelves beside the ladder. He still hadn't stepped down, but he turned leaning on the top rung once more as he stared at her. There was something in his look that made that feeling jolt in her stomach once more, just as Sebastian said. It is like fluttering moths. Deciding Dr. Bale was far too handsome to look at for very long, she turned her focus to the books and pulled them out one at a time, reading their title pages before returning them to their places. My apologies for my mistake yesterday, Dr. Bale said as he stepped down off the ladder behind her. I was not really looking at you when I made the comment. For some reason, this made matters worse. Yes, I have a habit of disappearing into the wallpaper, she muttered, choosing another book. Why are you here? Lady Georgiana is kind enough to let me peruse her large library when I'm doing my research. I also wanted to check on her this morning. He abruptly took the book from her hands. Oi! She tried to snatch it back. If you're interested in botany, then this book is not for you. It's by a quack rather than a man with any real knowledge. He moved to her side, coming so close that Catherine staggered back, bumping into the shelves beside her. She tried to make it seem as if she had completely intended to press herself so close to the shelves, out of fear of looking like a complete fool again. His eyes rested on her, though he said nothing, that light blue rather startling. 
Then he shifted and reached for a book near her arm. He came so close that his bare wrist practically brushed her shoulder. You need this. He handed the book to her. She opened the front cover, careful not to touch him as she read the title page. An anthology of plants and their uses. She wrinkled her nose. Yet it is not a book dedicated to healing. Ah, I see. You are one of those. He walked away, the censure in his voice plain. You are not a man of a subtle opinion, are you? Her challenging words made him turn back to her from the nearest table. His hands rested on a stack of books, his eyes on her once more. You give it most assuredly. I speak as I find. Then I shall do the same for you. She lifted her chin. I have done nothing to be ill-mannered toward you. Yet this is the second time in the space of two days I have found you rude. His lips parted, clearly shocked at her audaciousness. Pray, tell what you mean by saying I am one of those. She had a feeling she'd regret hearing his answer, but couldn't stop herself now. You have an interest in healing? He motioned toward her. Yes. Yet you cling to herbs as the answer for all healing? I did not say that. She shook her head. Yet there is much to be learned from plants and their healing properties. That is something I do know. If you have an interest in healing, then do not rely on them completely, he said dismissively, opening one of the largest volumes in front of him. The latest research on apparatus and the like are equally applicable to conditions these days. This from the man who prescribed digitalis yesterday. She reminded him, arching her eyebrows. He mirrored that look, and for a moment they just stared at one another across the room. We should not be looked at one another in this manner. What would Lady Georgiana say? Catherine turned her back on him, looking down at the book he had given her. Herbs have their application. All I'm saying is that they are not the only means of healing, he explained, searching through the pages of his book so angrily now that she could hear the pages flicking in the air. I am wondering if that is how you really feel, or in the effort just to argue with me it is what you are saying. Catherine looked up from the book, noting he did the same from his own volume. I do not go out of my way to argue with young ladies. Oh? Am I just the fortunate one, then, to get such attention? Fortunate me. Her wry words she could have sworn brought the smallest of smiles to his lips, but the flicker was gone before she could be sure of what she had seen. A lot of references to botany these days and herbal medication is derived from old wives' tales. There is no scientific application. He was dismissive, turning to the back of the book he was reading and looking down at the page in front of him. How can you possibly know that? She feared what he would make of Arabella's books and the copious notes she had made. Catherine was immediately defensive, knowing how much her aunt had helped those around her over the years. Because of my research. Dr. Bailey abruptly lifted up the vast volume and crossed the room toward her. He held open the book for her to see the diagrams on the page. They were of a cross-section of a body the illustrator detailing each part of the heart and the lungs in shocking detail. The body is a complex system. It cannot be fixed by potions. Potions? Catherine laughed nervously. You make it sound like witchcraft. It reminded her all too easily of how Arabella had been suspected of being a witch for a time. I do not doubt the myth of witchcraft came from skilled healers using the right herbs, but they do not all work. He thrust the diagram toward her again. She smiled, turning to face him completely as she realised what he was doing. Dr. Bale, are you seeking to shock me with this diagram? Are you hoping like some fading flower I'll wilt and then run from your presence so you'll have the library to yourself once more? At her question, his brows quirked. Yes, I thought so. Yet your goal will not work. I have seen such diagrams before. He closed up the book and laid it down on the table behind him, clearly disappointed. Very well, Doctor. If you are so convinced that herbs are not the way to healing completely, then prove it to me. Prove it, he spluttered, 
folding his arms in front of his chest. How am I supposed to do that? Tell me ways to treat the body that are not reliant on botany, she urged, matching his stance and folding her arms, stepping toward him. He went to meet her, so they were standing even closer together. Constipation, for instance? How would you cure that? Water and prunes, he grimaced. Dates have also proved good. Last time I checked, prunes and dates did come from plants. She smiled, feeling as if she had won. If we are to play this game, then at least allow me to set the parameters a little. He stood taller, lifting his chin. Standing so close to him, Catherine was distracted by his handsome face once more and those light blue eyes. His lips were rather thin, and he often pressed them into a flat line. She wondered what they would be like if he dared to indulge in a smile. Injuries and inflammation of any kind are usually encouraged to heal with ice, for instance, the application of cold to the inflicted area that does not rely on any botany at all. Yes, I suppose, she whispered. And a headache? Treatment of headaches depends entirely on the cause. Whilst yes, I will admit there is some application for herbs in this case, most of the time I can reduce my patient's frequent headaches through other means. Shielding their eyes from bright light or avoiding certain foods that turn out to trigger a reaction in their body. You'd be surprised how urging someone to avoid exertion of the eyes can avoid headaches entirely. He stood taller once more, clearly pleased with his success. Did I win our little game, Miss Fitzroy? Not as well as you think you did, she said. Irked, he had proved himself so well. Ah, now you are just being difficult. He lowered his head a little more. I am the one between us who is a trained doctor, Miss Fitzroy. Trust me, I know what I am talking about it when it comes to such matters. Are you so proud as to think you know everything? Catherine couldn't resist needling him further. He irked her, and there was some satisfaction in the idea of irking him too. At least I know I am deficient in my knowledge, and I seem to remember one great philosopher saying once that he considered himself the wisest man alive, for he knew that he knew nothing. She smiled with victory. Plato. Dr. Bale's knowledge of the philosopher made her brows raise. Do you know everything? She huffed. For the first time, Dr. Bale smiled. It was small, yet it transformed his countenance so much that she couldn't stop staring at him. No, far from it. He shook his head. She wasn't sure which angered her more, his pride or his charm. So, have I won our game? he asked. Do you need me to openly admit it? She curtsied exaggeratedly to him. I bow down to your superior knowledge, Doctor although I wish you were not so proud in declaring it. Proud? His brows quirked together. I have never been accused of such a thing before. No? Her plain disbelief shocked him, and that smile appeared again, even if it was only for a few seconds. I have pride in my work, that is all. He softened his voice. Ah, is that why you disparaged my wish to read about botany? No, I just... He petered off and shook his head, as if realising what he had exactly done. That was not my intention. No, of course not. Why would you wish to disparage a maid? She teased him, her smile growing. I already apologised to you for my error. He pointed at her in emphasis. I know you did. She nodded, finding she couldn't let go of her frustration now. It was an ire brought on by her equal anger at his manner and the charm of his appearance. I see my apology has not been accepted then. He sighed and looked at the ceiling, perhaps hardly surprising considering how I have just behaved. He held up a finger, urging her to wait for one minute, then moved to the ladder and shifted it so it leaned against a different stack of shelves. Catherine moved to follow him, tripping on the edge of a rug as she didn't look where she was going. She hurried to grab the edge of a shelf, covering up what she had done. Dr. Bale glanced at her at the sudden sound but made no comment before stepping onto the ladder and reaching for another book. Here. He took it off the shelf and jumped back down the ladder. 
the sudden athleticism made Catherine's mouth dry. So shocked, she took a few beats to take the book he was proffering to her. If you do have a genuine interest in the study of botany and its herbal applications, then this should be your second read. She turned the title page, reading hurriedly. The Medical Applications of English Plants. Thank you, Catherine whispered in surprise. See, I am not such an awful man. I can do a kind turn every now and then. I did not call you an awful man, Doctor. Merely a proud one, he reminded her. He smiled once again, that tiny flicker which made those moths dance in her stomach. You gave me that impression, she reminded him. I should apologise too, I did not mean to offend you. He quirked an eyebrow, as if in disbelief. I meant to disarm you, not offend you. Ah, yes, I completely believe that, he said with thick sarcasm as he returned to the table in the middle of the library and reached for his heavy volumes. You are a bafflement to me, Miss Fitzroy. Likewise, Dr. Bale. Uncertain what they had really meant by such words, Catherine stared at Dr. Bale, startled to find he was looking at her too, rather than at the book in front of him. I should leave you to your reading. She thanked him once again for the books and left, sighing with relief once she was out of the door and leaning upon it. Oh dear, I should stay away from Dr. Beale in the future. She had a feeling that keeping away from him would reduce the amount she thought of him. Yet another thought lingered in the back of her mind. His knowledge was clearly superior to her own when it came to healing. If she did spend more time with him, he could certainly teach her a lot. Chapter 9 Nigel, do not think about her. Do not think about her. Nigel repeated this mantra to himself as he stepped down off the horse and moved toward the manor cottage. His eyes darted across the frontage that seemed alive with bees today that danced between the flower heads. Do not think about her. Yet he did regardless. It had been three days since he had last been to this house in Lady Georgiana's library, and in that time it seemed an impossibility to shift Miss Fitzroy from his mind. She crept into his thoughts when he least expected it. What was most inconvenient was how she had crept into his thoughts the night before when he had attempted to sleep. When such thoughts of her turned heated, he'd flung himself from the bed and sat in a chair for most of the night, intermittently reading and napping. He fought a yawn now as he approached the house. If he had to see Miss Fitzroy again, then he would have to get his urges under control. So what if she is different to other ladies of the ton? She shouldn't be so under my skin because of that. He was welcomed inside by the butler who told him that Lady Georgiana was in her usual garden room. Nigel approached with his medicine bag in his hand, prepared for her check-up. He prayed that Miss Fitzroy would be elsewhere today, but as he reached the door he found his prayers had not been answered. He stood in the doorway leaning on the frame as he watched Miss Fitzroy in the centre of the room. She was being taught how to curtsy properly by Lady Georgiana, who sat in her usual wicker chair with her walking stick in her hand. That's it, Catherine. Deeper and bow your eyes too. A lady should not hold a man's gaze when she curtsied to him. That would be audacious indeed. Lady Georgiana's voice was tight, if a little humoured by the idea. Catherine curtsied once more. As she stood straight, apparently unaware of Nigel's presence, his eyes darted over her, taken in by her appearance. Her dark hair had been swept back beautifully today into curls at the back of her head. As beautiful as it was, he rather missed the simple chignon she'd been wearing in the library a few days before. He'd liked the fantasy of undoing that chignon and watching her hair fall loose. Her eyes glittered with a pair of drop earrings bearing simple pearls. It complemented perfectly the dress she wore, a chiffon cream with gold hemming across the sleeves and under the bust. Along the neckline were a few pearls, mirroring exactly the detailing of her earrings. Quite striking indeed. He smiled as he watched her, so struck that he didn't yet announce his presence. Now, try again, Lady Georgiana urged. Clear voice, child, remember that. Miss Fitzroy raised herself from the curtsy and lifted her chin high, adopting a more formal and stiff tone, 
than he'd ever heard her use before. It is a pleasure to meet you, my lord. She spoke to some imaginary character in the room. At the stiff and awkward way that she spoke, Nigel held back his smile of humour. He preferred her when she was herself, talking freely. At this moment, one of her hands balled into a fist at her side, betraying her awkwardness with being so on show and performing to such standards. I remember similar lessons. When he was young, his father's tutors had tried to instill similar formality in him. One day, all those lessons had stopped when he'd told his father what he wished to do for a living. Better, much better, Lady Georgiana said, and gestured toward her with the walking stick. You are improving every day. Soon enough we'll have you climbing out of carriages without falling over. I don't do it every time. Miss Fitzroy blushed a deep shade of red. Nigel hung his head, realising now what must have been the source of the dirt on her dress the first day he had seen her. Now, we just need a gentleman for you to practice with. Lady Georgiana's eyes flitted to Nigel in the doorway. His chest tightened as he realised she was aware of his presence, even if Miss Fitzroy was not. Ah, Dr Beale, perhaps you could be our test subject. Miss Fitzroy spun sharply around so quick that she tripped on the hem of her gown. Nigel hurried forward, worried she would slip, but before he could offer a hand to her, she grabbed the back of a nearby chair and righted herself, forcing a rather uncomfortable smile. Nigel's hand now hung loosely at his side, as she no longer needed his help. Good day, Miss Fitzroy spoke eventually, disturbing what felt like a rather awkward silence to Nigel as they looked at one another. Good day? No, Catherine. Lady Georgiana sighed dramatically and thrust the foot of her cane into the boards beneath her feet. What have we just been practising? Greet Dr. Bale in a formal manner. Very well. She turned to face him once more with a forced smile, then dipped the curtsy. When she refused to look him in the eye during the movement, Nigel rather longed for that look again. He bowed to her, copying the formal instructions he'd had in his youth. Good morning to you, Dr. Bale. I hope your journey was a good one. She stood tall. Perfectly so. My horse enjoyed the fine weather. You ride here every day on your horse? She seemed excited by the idea. At once she lost her formal posture and hurried to the window, looking out in search of his horse. Nigel couldn't help smiling at her eagerness as Lady Georgiana tutted loudly. Slowly, Miss Fitzroy turned to look at her cousin. I was doing so well, was I not? She asked in a small voice. Chilled like excitement is not ladylike, dear. Lady Georgiana chuckled despite her words. Doctor, you have come to see me, I take it. Yes, my lady, just for a check-up. He walked toward her and placed his medicine bag down on the table beside Lady Georgiana. He took his usual stool and sat down before her, reaching for her wrist to take her pulse. Out of the corner of his eye, Nigel was very aware of Miss Fitzroy approaching the pair of them. From her eagerness to see the horse, he longed to ask if she too was a keen rider, but feared this was not the right moment. How have you been? he asked Lady Georgiana a series of questions instead, writing down all her answers in his notebook. He was relieved to see that she'd had no further episodes with the irregular beating of her heart, and she seemed much more comforted to now have an emergency vial of watered-down digitalis in a cupboard in case she needed it. What more can you say of my health then, Doctor? Lady Georgiana asked, as he took her wrist and checked the movement of her old injury. It was a little stiff, but he imagined she'd been holding herself very rigidly since the incident with her heart a few days before. You are well. I hope you are taking walks as I urged, he reminded her, and keep moving this wrist. We do not wish it to end up too stiff. Very well, Lady Georgiana nodded. Catherine fortunately keeps me distracted and active. She seems to have an eagerness to wander in the gardens and look at the flowers. Nigel looked knowingly to Miss Fitzroy, who stood nearby, knowing that she must have been searching out what plants there were and thinking of their medicinal applications. Curious. 
Nigel watched her for a beat longer than he should have done, wishing now he had asked her when they were alone in the library what her interest was for. His own interest in healing had started at a young age when he saw some servants on his father's estate falling ill. Ever since then, the need to help others had grown like a wildfire, something impossible to staunch. You are doing well, he said, turning his focus back to Lady Georgiana. He caught a smile on her face as she watched him and wondered how long she had been paying attention to him. Did she notice me staring at Miss Fitzroy so keenly? What I will say is that there are ways we can keep you calm and also a few ways to improve your wrist. He gestured to the old injury. I shall make you a tea, I think. For the next few evenings, I would urge you to press ice to your wrist too. I thought it was healed, Lady Georgiana muttered with clear distaste as she stared down at her wrist. Well, let me show you something. Nigel took her wrist and bent it a little. When she grimaced in pain, he nodded at her. It just needs a little more care, that is all. Before Nigel could do it, Miss Fitzroy requested a maid to prepare some hot water. The water was swiftly brought in a teapot and Nigel lifted the lid, adding some leaves into the mixture. A presence at his side caught his attention and he turned to find Miss Fitzroy very close indeed. He was startled by her proximity, thinking of the nearness of those dark eyes and the scent that lingered around her. Rose and honeysuckle. It was unmistakable and rather hypnotic now he was so close. He held his breath, hoping she would move away again. What is it you are adding here? she said with puppy-like enthusiasm. He couldn't hold back his smile as he watched her picking up some of the discarded leaves he'd left on the tray and pressed it to her nose. What did I say, dear? Lady Georgiana reminded her, clearing her throat. Yet Nigel wished she'd wouldn't dampen her enthusiasm. It was refreshing to see Miss Fitzroy when she was more herself. It was certainly captivating to see her so excited by something that thrilled him. Ginger, Nigel explained when Miss Fitzroy lifted the yellow herb to her nose. Gosh, that is pungent. What is it used for? Many things. High blood pressure mostly, but it is also good for inflammation, and that shall help Lady Georgiana's wrist. There are also chamomile leaves and ginseng too. Here I thought you weren't so fond of herbs, Doctor. Miss Fitzroy offered a knowing smile. He couldn't take his eyes off her as she sifted between the different leaves, pressing each one to her nose in turn. I never disparaged them completely. I merely said there were other parts of medicine that cannot be ignored. He deepened his voice as he looked at her. When she reached for a vial that he had taken out of his medicine bag and lifted it high, he hurriedly took it from her. Do not sniff that one. Why not? She leapt back as their fingers had brushed. Did she feel that jolt too? Chloroform, he said hurriedly. One sniff can knock a man out. Too many sniffs and I shudder to think how long it would take you to come around. How dangerous, she whispered, her eyes seeming alight with interest. You have to be careful with chemicals like these. He replaced the vial into the bag for he had taken it out by mistake and had no need of it now. Um, Lady Georgiana suddenly cleared her throat and Nigel snapped his eyes toward her. Just checking you two remembered I was here. Of course. Why else would I be here? Nigel said as he returned his focus to preparing the tea. Just being certain, Doctor. Lady Georgiana held on to her smile as Nigel looked at the tea. Deciding there weren't enough leaves, he reached to add more, but found Miss Fitzroy had them in her hands. If I may, he said with a thickly wry tone, trying to take his own leaves from her grasp. I'd like to be permitted to hold my own things. She eyed him cautiously and hurried to put the leaves back in his palm. Her fingers brushed his skin, though he tried not to think about that warmth too strongly as he added the leaves to the cup. Here, drink this, Nigel offered the tea to her. I shall leave the mix of leaves behind so you can have one cup a day. I can help prepare the tea, Miss Fitzroy offered. Nigel looked at her, uncertain whether to be angered at her eagerness to interfere or startlingly pleased. 
Most people didn't take notice of what he gave them to drink, so long as he told them it would do them some good if they took it. Thank you, dear, Lady Georgiana said, wrinkling her nose after she had taken a sip. On second thoughts, Doctor, I am not sure I particularly wish to thank you for this concoction. Trust me, I only give the truly pointless and bad-tasting medicines to patients I don't like. He jested, enjoying the warmth of Lady Georgiana's laughter. He looked out of the corner of his eye at Miss Catherine, wishing to see her laugh too. She smiled softly, but seemed more preoccupied with looking into his medicine bag. She now peered into it without restraint. A hill. He closed the bag up and she sat back, folding her arms with her disappointment palpable in the air. What is so wrong with me being intrigued by your work, Dr. Bale? Nothing at all, he said, his tone deepening. Everything. He realised abruptly that was part of the problem. Miss Fitzroy's eager excitement was rather too attractive, and he had long ago sworn off ever succumbing to such feelings of attraction again. I should stay clear of you, Miss Fitzroy. It is for the best. As he checked Lady Georgiana's wrist over one more time, he caught sight of Miss Fitzroy trying to peer in his bag again. He kicked the bag subtly over, stopping her from looking inside. You're no fun, she murmured. Yet they shared a smile between them, one he had to end fast. What is wrong with me? Chapter 10 Nigel Nigel looked over the papers in front of him. He longed to be reading, but he had correspondence to catch up on first, and the letters were tiresome to him. At the top of the pile was a letter from his elder brother, Robert. The letter went into detail mostly about Robert's own life, as was his usual style for writing such a letter. Nigel tried to concentrate on the words, knowing he should make more of an effort to stay in touch with his elder brother. Well, one can hardly complain, can they? When there are such events to enjoy. You know, Nigel, it is about time you attended more of these events with me. I know our father wishes for it too. He fears what people will say when they hear of your proclivities. Nigel broke off, feeling his hands ball into fists either side of the letter on the table. Proclivities, he muttered in anger. You mean my career? Standing from the table, he crossed the room and poured out a glass of brandy from the bottle. Unlike his father and brother who surrounded themselves with crystal carafes and decanters, refusing to have a drink ever from a bottle, Nigel was not so fussy. He poured out the drink and gulped the first, before topping up the glass and drinking the next one much slower. Pulling at the cravat around his throat, he loosened it, then threw it off altogether and shed his tailcoat too. Night had drawn in, but the heat of the day hadn't softened with it. He dropped the coat to the back of a nearby chair and lit two candles on the table to keep him company. Eventually, when he could summon the will, he sat back down in his chair and continued with his brother's letter. Robert went on for some time, pleading with Nigel to attend more events. As much as Nigel wished to write back and point out that at least he was doing something useful with his time, saving lives, and how standing in a ballroom making small talk would do little for that, he knew he could not. The deal he had made with his father years ago was that he would still attend some events of the ton if in return he could do his career. Nigel could still remember profusely the way Robert had last looked at him when it came to discussing his profession. Robert's nose had wrinkled and he lifted his chin an inch higher. Now he looks down on me as he looks down on so many others in this world. Nigel took another gulp from his brandy and pushed his shirt sleeves up to his elbows haphazardly, preparing himself to write a reply to his brother. The words came slowly, for he had been putting off this answer for so long. In the end, he promised Robert he would attend a few of the season's events this summer. He also wished his brother well and hoped the tenants were flourishing under his care now that their father had handed over the responsibilities of the tenants to him. One particular line stood out to Nigel in his answer, for it was an offer he had made before, and one that had been ignored by his brother. As always, I would be happy to look into the state of some of the tenants' health, if it is of concern to you. 
I know the last time I visited the farmland that some of the labourers were struggling with ill backs and sore muscles. It is something I may be able to help with. Even as Nigel read the line, he could already picture what would come in Robert's answer. Knowing him, he wouldn't even refer to the section at all and just leave it out, as if Nigel hadn't mentioned such a thing. A sound at the window drew Nigel's attention. Putting down his letter amongst the other papers, mixing it with other correspondence, notes he had made on the matters of the human heart's rhythm, and also the periodicals Lady Georgiana had given him. He stood and moved to the window. He flung it open, hoping for a breath of fresh air, though there was none. He looked down out of the windows, searching for what the source of the sound may have been. The street was a relatively quiet one, startling for this end of London town. At the edge of the street was a quiet inn, with the sign that read the Bell Inn, swinging above the door, flanked by the light of a burning torch pressed against the wall. Customers milled in front of the inn, and some drunkenly staggered outside of the door, heading home with their feet plaiting beneath them. Further down to Nigel's end of the road, the lane was narrowed, and the tall timber buildings squashed together. As it was London, these apartments were hardly cheap, despite the fact they were no grand thing. Nigel could have afforded more, and the one time his father had come to visit him in these apartments, he had insisted that Nigel move somewhere finer, yet Nigel refused. Here, he was at least close to his patients. That was more important than any fine apartment he could purchase or rent in Covent Garden. Another sound drew his attention far down the street. People wandered up and down, and a woman walked forward, a hood pulled high over her head. Nigel frowned as he stared at her, rather worried as to why a young woman was walking so alone in this street of all that she could have chosen. More than once, Nigel had seen the drunks leaving the inn and staggering against these walls, their stomach contents erupting from them. Hurry home, he whispered, as if the woman would hear him. She disappeared into the shadows of the road, and he retreated inside, moving back to his table full of notes. He sealed his reply to Robert, burning the red wax stick in one of the candles beside him until it dripped on the letter. Reaching beneath the papers, he found the stamp seal he used to address his letters to his family, bearing the emblem of the family's name. Yet for some reason he could not bring himself to use the seal. He turned it over in his palm instead, watching as the red wax dried on the envelope, completely blank. As he watched the wax dry, his mind wandered to someone he should not have thought of. He thought of Miss Fitzroy from earlier that day and his meeting with her and Lady Georgiana. He thought of her eager smile, the way she had peered into his medical bag so playfully, and how she had pressed those leaves to her nose, her eagerness to learn more about his trade strangely compelling. Stop thinking of her, Nigel ordered himself. Yet by uttering the words aloud, he only seemed to bring her to his mind much more than before. He imagined Miss Fitzroy was before him, with that dark hair fastened temptingly into another one of those simple chignons. He saw her smile and wished she was there to talk to, to lean toward, maybe even do something more with... Stop it, he muttered aloud again. There were many reasons he should not be thinking of Miss Fitzroy. She was young. Quite naive, he was sure, in her approach to botany and medicine. Forming an attachment to the young woman was ill-advised indeed, especially as she would soon be gone. She was only here for the summer and would eventually return to Dorset with her family. I shall not indulge in some foolish idea of an attachment. I loved before. I will not do it again. This was perhaps the greatest reason why he could not let himself think about Miss Fitzroy. He had vowed never to be close to a woman again. Miss Fitzroy, despite her charms, her eagerness, her wit that could make him laugh, would not change his mind. Boards creaked beyond the door and there was a low thud, as if someone tripped as they walked up the stairs in the building. Nigel looked toward the door, wondering who else would have a cause to climb so high up in this building, for his apartment was the only one on the top floor of the building. The rooms had characteristically sloping ceilings, with dark corners where the candlelight could not reach. A light knock sounded at the door. 
Who is it? Nigel called in uncertainty. No sound followed, though there was a low thud again, and he could have sworn he heard a woman's voice muttering in some sort of pain. Hurrying to his feet, he pushed back his chair and moved to the door, stepping around the stacks of books in his room and the table full of the latest medical instruments he had acquired. There were bone saws and forceps, as well as quinine, kept in a tall glass jar and long wooden stethoscope. Reaching for the door, Nigel opened it, stepping back to allow some of the candlelight from behind him to fall on the person before him. At first he saw nothing, only someone cloaked in rich black material. Then a pair of slim hands reached for the hood and started to slowly lower it. It was the woman he'd seen walking down the thin alleyway. Why is she here? Yet this question was soon replaced by other much more burning questions as he saw the face revealed in that candlelight. Miss Catherine Fitzroy lowered her hood to her shoulders, revealing a small smile. From the way she shifted her weight between her feet, then reached down to rub her hip, he guessed that she had stumbled on the top step and perhaps walked straight into the banister. Words failed Nigel as he stared at her. For a second, wild fantasies entered his mind. Every thought he'd allowed himself to have in moments of weakness came to him. With Miss Fitzroy here in his rooms, those wild imaginings did not seem as mad as they may have seemed earlier in the day. What? He stepped back, getting a hold of himself. Miss Fitzroy, what on earth are you doing here? Good evening to you too, she said with a sudden smile. Her eyes flitted past him to his rooms. Miss Fitzroy. Angered at himself and the tightening knot of excitement in his stomach to have her here, he found sudden volume in his voice. She pressed a finger to her lips, glancing back over her shoulder and down the stairs, fearful of discovery. Do you have any idea what this means? He stepped toward her, pressing his arm against the doorframe. Her head snapped to him, but she didn't move back. They were standing rather too close together. You are visiting me at night without a chaperone. This is outrageous. This will be scandalous. You are the daughter of a baron. God's blood if you were seen here. I shudder to think what people will say. You do always have a lot to say yourself, do you not? She smiled, seeming amused by the idea. Then she rolled her eyes. No one saw me. Trust me in that. And yet you could be seen at any point. He stepped even closer toward her, peering up and down the landing and across the staircase. She still didn't move away from him, and Nigel was suddenly all too aware of how close they stood together when he was not properly dressed. He moved back, clearing his throat. I know you need lessons in propriety, Miss Fitzroy but even you must realise what danger you have now placed yourself in when it comes to the opinions of the ton. He waited for her to answer, noting the fact that her smile had slipped completely away. Smile again, Miss Fitzroy, I beg of you. Chapter 11 Nigel I know this is bold, Miss Fitzroy murmured, hanging her head forward a little. You think? he spluttered, stepping forward once more when he heard the staircase creak. Peering over her shoulder, he saw a shadow on the stairs, fearing someone would come up to investigate all this noise. Very bold, I am aware, she spoke hurriedly, but I have come to ask something of you. It is important, so I beg of you. Please do not send me away now. You beg me, he said in amazement, jerking his head toward her. Standing so close to her, he found the perfume she wore, lingering once again. That honeysuckle fragrance was a strong contrast to the must and dampness of the apartments and the piles of books. It was a pleasant change indeed. Yes. Do you wish me to get down on my knees to beg? For heaven's sake, we do not need an even greater scandal. He looked to the stairs once more, noting that the shadows were moving. Someone's coming. I cannot believe I am about to say this, but get inside. He stepped back and held the door open wider. She hurried in without a hesitation and he shut the door sharply. He did his best to peer through the gap between the door and the frame, trying to see something about what was happening on the landing. The moonlight through a distant window cast onto the stairs. 
A shadowy figure lurked in the middle of the staircase, craning his neck back and forth. He hovered there for a minute, clearly hoping to see what the source of the sound was, before he retreated back down the stairs again. Sighing with relief, Nigel turned, leaning against the door. The sight of Miss Fitzroy wandering around his rooms made him stiffen once more. She trailed a hand over one of the stacks of books, her cloak slipping off one arm in the heat. His eyes followed her, in a way that they should not have done, admiring her figure. Draping the cloak across the back of a chair, she looked at the jar full of quinine, her eyes widening. This is extraordinary. What is all this stuff? Oh no. You cannot possibly expect me to have an ordinary conversation with you now. He stepped away from the door, abruptly aware what state he was in. He was hardly dressed, so proceeded to roll his sleeves back down to his wrists. He looked around for his cravat, but couldn't remember where it was, so just held the neck of his shirt together instead. Have I made you nervous? she said with a giggle. No jesting now. He shook his head slowly, his tone deepening, and her giggle faltered altogether. Why are you here? If you're seen, it will be awful for us both. Your reputation will be damaged, and you can bet I'll never be hired as a doctor again. She picked up one of his books off the table and turned it over, reading the spine. That is not my intention. I do not wish to hurt either of our names, but I had to see you, she murmured, seeming amazed by the book before her. Nigel hurried around the table to her side and snatched the book away, holding it behind his back. That got your attention, he remarked, nodding at her. She huffed and folded her arms. Come, Miss Fitzroy, what is the meaning of all of this? I wish you to teach me. She reached around him, trying to get the book back again. Teach you what? He turned, attempting to stop her from getting the book. She simply moved around him faster. She tripped on one of the chairs beside the table, planting her hands on the table. Nigel went to help her to stop her from falling, then realised how awful it could be if he touched her and backed up. In his momentary distraction, she managed to right herself and snatched the book away again. Miss Fitzroy. She walked around the table, increasing the distance between them as she flicked through the book. He followed her, half tempted to demand she left at once. I wish you to teach me more about healing, please. Her words shocked him so much he stopped walking. She continued to walk around the table until she reached the other side and looked up from the book her manner now much more serious. You know many things, a lot that I do not, and I am in need of a teacher. Wait. Nigel placed his hands on the table between them, leaning forward as she rested the book on the other side. You wish to heal people, Miss Fitzroy. This fancy of yours to read books on botany, it is not just a casual interest? This fancy, she spluttered, shaking her head and laughing. Now I see how you look at me, Doctor. Tell me, am I just a child in your eyes? Or a young woman with her head so full of gowns and the latest fashions that I must be incapable of having a serious or noble thought in my life? That is not what I said. His tone deepened. Yet it is what you think, is it not? She matched his stone, her deep tone turning huskier still. Nigel didn't answer for a few seconds, distracted by that tone. Maybe I have met many women in my life who would not think of healing. He accepted with a slow nod. You are something of a surprise, Miss Fitzroy. She revealed the glimmer of a smile. It made his stomach knot once more. I suppose that is a compliment. It is. His hasty answer made her shift, that smile growing a little more. Yet there is something I have to know. Why do you wish for such learning? Do you wish to be a healer? As a woman, you cannot be a doctor. He gestured toward her and that smile fell. Yes, I heard how that sounded that time. He sighed deeply, looking down at his books. I did not mean it to sound so disparaging. Yes, he lifted his eyes to meet hers. Tell me why. Miss Fitzroy. 
She stepped back from the table and moved toward the other one, where his many medical instruments rested. She reached for the jar of quinine and peered through it, talking as she fidgeted. We all have people we admire in our lives, and the person I admire more than any other is my aunt. Her name is Arabella, though most call her the Duchess of Gordon. She smiled over her shoulder at Nigel. And she is a healer. A duchess? A healer? Nigel murmured in surprise. He followed her to the other table. When Miss Fitzroy lifted the bone saw beside her, he took it out of her hands, not wishing for her to end up hurt. How did she become a healer? She trained from a young age. She helped many people and continues to. There was a time when people were not so welcoming of her ways. Miss Fitzroy's nose wrinkled. The foolish gossipers called her a witch. Some old healers were thought of as such things, Nigel said rather sadly. A cruel thing to call any woman who tries to help others. Miss Fitzroy looked suddenly fierce. The anger in her tone captivated Nigel as much as any of her previous smiles had done. He waited for her to go on, tilting his head to the side as he watched her. Yet she has done much good in this world. She has been successful and has helped those in great need. She smiled sadly now. I wish to be like her. If I could learn something more from your teachings, then maybe I could be of use to people. Is that so wrong a name, Dr. Bale? To wish to help people? She leaned on the table. Knowing her clumsy ways by now, he conveniently slid one of the forceps away before she press upon it and mistakenly pinch herself with the implement. He rested forward too, moving that inch closer to her. His eyes darted over her face, noting the genuineness of her expression and the earnestness of her tone. She truly meant her words, keenly. I know what that wish is like, his voice softened. Trust me, I do. Yet local healers, he grimaced, already sensing the way she pulled back form him. They can often do more harm than good. All the good intentions in the world cannot make a difference if a healer gives the wrong thing to a patient. Some local healers are excellent, she argued, her tone firm. Take my aunt. Yes, and some are misinformed. They cling to old wives' tales and out zero F date practices that can do more harm than good. He waved a hand in dismissal. And here I thought you were going to refrain from being disparaging any more. She folded her arms across her chest. I am not being disparaging. I am being practical. He sighed heavily, thrusting a hand into his hair and pulling on the tendrils in frustration. Healers can be dangerous more so than helpful if not taught right. Then teach me not to be dangerous. She stepped around the table, speaking with such sudden passion that Nigel didn't walk away. He watched her to approach him, his body strangely still. Tongue-tied, Nigel said nothing. He ran a hand over his face, scratching his jaw in stress. I can understand that. Something inside of him twinged at the pain on Miss Fitzroy's face. You have gone quiet, Doctor, she observed. For one thing, stay here. You and I keep standing far too close to one another for what is appropriate. He walked away across the room, putting as much distance between them as possible. He stood between a settle bench and a full armchair, walking back and forth. Well, you have already pointed out it is scandalous for me to be here, so we are down the rabbit warren regardless. She shrugged, calling his attention back toward her. That is not helping, he said simply, glancing toward her. She smiled a little, showing she was enjoying teasing him. Enough, he warned, surprised when a smile leapt to his face. You have a habit of doing this, do you not? What's that? Jesting with me. Life's too short not to smile, Doctor. She picked up the book she had been reading and lifted the front leaf, reading the text. Do you intend to snatch this book from me again, I wonder? Desist he said softly, still unable to take the smile off his face. How did she do this? She had made him smile, 
more often than he had thought possible, considering she was in his apartment so late at night, in a very scandalous situation indeed. Well, she murmured after a minute, would you teach me some things, please? She looked up from the book. I wish to be of some use in this world, Doctor. You could teach me, and those teachings could be a way to make me of some use to this world, if you'd be willing to help me. He sighed deeply, lowering his hands to his side as he considered her offer. He could empathise with her longing to do something good for this world, and he could also sympathise with the wish not to be dangerous. I know what it is like to make an error that can be all too costly. As the image of that graveyard flashed in his mind, he turned away and rubbed his eyes, abruptly needing to remove Miss Fitzroy from his thoughts entirely. Such errors had haunted him for years now. He may not have lost a patient since, but once was enough. He didn't want to have to revisit those memories. Please, Miss Fitzroy's voice was closer than he had expected it to be. He turned, lowering his hand to see she had stopped on the other side of the settle bench. I wish to help people, Doctor. That is not so awful, is it? No but you ask a lot. He sighed deeply. Miss Fitzroy, look at the position you have put me in by coming here. This is not only a scandalous position, but if I were to help you, then you would no doubt wish to come here again. What position would we both be in then? I am not asking for you to risk your name, she said with sudden passion. We could find a way to make it work. I am asking you as someone in need of your help, your guidance. You were quite happy to crow over me in the library the other day that you knew so much more than me. I was not crowing. He disliked this description of herself. Well, here's your opportunity to do something with that knowledge. Teach me, she pleaded, leaning toward him, her hands pressed to the back of the settle bench. God, do I wish to say yes. He stared at her thinking of spending more time in the captivating Miss Fitzroy's company. He was tempted indeed, but it was also dangerous. I need to think about it. Is that a yes? No. But it's not a no either, she asked with a small smile. In answer, he raised his brows, showing her he was not going to say anything more. Then I suppose I shall have to be settled with such a thought. She turned back to the table and collected her black cloak from the chair, wrapping it around her shoulders. I have stayed too long. You have clearly been desiring my absence, so I shall go. As she reached for the door, Nigel felt as if he had been wounded, as though someone had kicked him harshly in the stomach. Wait, he called to her and crossed the room. She hovered by the door, turning back to face him. Nigel looked at one of his stacks of books. Sifting through the top three, he chose one which was relatively small and well-thumbed. He crossed toward her and handed it to her. What's this? she murmured, taking the book. If you wish to be a healer some day, then this should be the first book you read beyond any others. Is this a yes? Are you saying you will help me? she asked excitedly. No, I'm saying get reading. He folded his arms across his chest and nodded at the door. Good night, Miss Fitzroy. Good night, Dr. Bale. She left the room, smiling so broadly that the feeling of being winded loosened from his stomach. She passed through the doorway as she tucked the book under her arm and raised her cloak to cover her face. As the door closed behind her, Nigel released a shuddery breath. You are dangerous, Miss Fitzroy, in more ways than one. Chapter 12 Catherine Catherine, dear, you are not concentrating. The Duchess of Lestonmere waved the book in front of Catherine's face. Oops, sorry. Catherine shifted her focus to the Duchess, who sat back in her seat with a humoured smile on her face. And what is it that has captivated your thoughts so much? No one. No one. The Duchess sat forward once more. I mean nothing. Catherine lied. She rearranged the books on the table in front of her, glancing around Lady Georgiana's library and remembering the last time she had been in this room. Dr. Baylor had been here then. 
and they'd had their little playful game between them. She thought so much of the way he'd looked with his sleeves rolled up to his elbows that it cast her thoughts back to the night before. He was barely dressed. Her palms were clammy just at the memory of how Dr. Bale had looked, with his hair quite wild, the neckline of his shirt open and the skin flashing on show. No wonder she had been so tempted to stay with him longer the night before. It was an indulgence to see him so undone and unbidden compared to how he usually was with Lady Georgiana. Ahem. The Duchess cleared her throat and waved her hand in front of Catherine's face another time. I feel strange pushing such books on you to read when I'm beginning to think you may know some of their contents already. She turned over the nearest book beside her, Sense and Sensibility, by Miss Austin. Do you know something of love, Catherine? No, not at all. Catherine shook her head firmly. I have never courted your grace. That does not have to necessarily prerequisite falling in love. Yet if you insist nothing is amiss in your mind that no one... She paused after these words, clearly showing she had picked up on what Catherine had said. Is on your mind, then I presume we can continue with our lesson. By all means. Catherine sat forward and straightened her spine, determined to concentrate at last. Lady Georgiana had been most insistent over breakfast that morning on how a lady should be well read. She had even confessed to Catherine that when she was younger she had enjoyed reading widely before her husband had made some comments and she'd retreated from such enjoyments. In later years she had taken up reading widely again. She read philosophy as much as she did novels and encouraged any woman to turn her head to political books on occasion. Now, these are some of the books that may be of interest to you. The Duchess of Lestonmere pointed to a stack at the back of the table. It reminded Catherine of the way the books had been piled high in Dr. Beale's rooms. They'd seemed dangerously close to toppling over, but he hadn't held himself back from adding more to those stacks. Some piled on the floor were now as tall as his chest. There's Plato's and Socrates' works. Have you ever read philosophy before? The Duchess of Lestonmere placed the books down in front of her. No, I have not. Catherine opened the book by Plato and flicked through the pages. To be honest, Your Grace, this sort of thing seems rather lofty to my eyes. I am not sure I have the right mind to study the works of the philosophers. You would not be the first to admit it was the case. The Duchess smiled softly. Yet you seem nervous to admit it. Why is that? Lady Georgiana made it clear what she expects a young lady to be, and my mother sent me here to learn such things. She closed the book and slowly lowered it back down to the table in front of her. Chewing her lip, she thought of her mother. What your mother thinks matters to you greatly, does it not? The Duchess asked, her voice softening. It does, Catherine whispered. Feeling quite nervous, she couldn't raise her gaze to meet the Duchess and kept it down on the closed book instead. She has always been elegant, in every way. I can only imagine sometimes what she thinks of me when I stumble into rooms behind her and grip to chairs to stop myself from falling over. I see. The Duchess's smile grew. Have I told you yet about my brother, Catherine? Catherine looked up, slowly shaking his head. You could not find a clumsier man in your life. The Duchess leaned toward Catherine, a humoured glint in her eye. I believe he'd call you quite the amateur in your clumsiness. Chloe has become quite an expert in picking up after him after the last few years of their marriage. She's able to avoid some of his worst accidents, which, believe me, can be bad at times. She laughed warmly. Never has my brother been disparaged for such a thing, though. He's an earl, has had a very successful career as a lawyer, and is highly respected. If you fear that someone will look down on you just because you trip on the corners of rugs, trust me, that is not the case. The Duchess leaned forward and tapped Catherine's chin, urging her to raise it a little more. Hold your head high and be proud of who you are, clumsiness and all, for there is no other like you. I am sure your mother would agree you are the perfect version of yourself. Am I? Catherine was not so convinced. She sent me here as she wants me to be a little different. 
What are all these lessons then? Catherine asked with a knowing smile. They are to change me. No, far from it. The Duchess shook her head. They are to give you the option to learn more, to be the woman you wish to be. You do realise at any point you could say there were things you did not wish to learn, and Lady Georgiana would take such a response into account. For instance, take these. She gestured down at the philosophical books. What do you wish to do with these? Do you wish to read them or return them to the shelves? I'd rather read something on botany, Catherine confessed, wrinkling her nose. In which case you shall. The Duchess stood with the philosophy books and returned them to their shelves. She retrieved other books and returned a few minutes later, dropping down a fresh stack in front of Catherine. She turned the first leaf of the book, quickly reading the words on the title page. The Scientific Principles of Botany. Catherine smiled, both stunned and gladdened by the Duchess of Lestonmere's words. All I would say is make sure you read widely, the Duchess said, as she sat down beside Catherine again. It informs your knowledge and your understanding of language as well as the subject matter. Even if philosophy is not your thing, there are other books you can turn to. For instance, these. She pushed forward a second stack. Within were a few of her own books, and a couple by Miss Austin too, as well as the darker gothic tales by Miss Anne Radcliffe. Thank you. Catherine retrieved the top book by Miss Austin and turned the cover, reading the short description of Pride and Prejudice. I am curious. What about? The Duchess asked, reaching for a teapot they had nearly forgotten about left nearby on a silver tray. She poured out two teacups, pushing one toward Catherine and encouraging her to drink. The notion of love in these books, Catherine whispered with interest. Are they accurate, do you think? Her mind was elsewhere even as she asked the question. As she finished reading the description of Pride and Prejudice, Dr Beale returned to her thoughts. The scent of tobacco and bourbon had clung close to him in the room. It was a heady scent one she had been strangely intoxicated by. It had made her move toward him repeatedly across the room, even when she knew she should not. Some books, no. It is not accurate in my opinion. The Duchess shook her head and lifted her teacup to her lips. What's important to note is that love can be many different things for different people. Some are so fortunate to feel a rush of love when they first meet, that momentary excitement that blossoms into deep attachment. In my experience, love of that ilk does not occur as often as you think. How do you mean? Catherine pushed the books away, concentrating on the Duchess's words. I mean that in my opinion, that is attraction. I have seen a lot more couples fall in love through time, shared interests, shared understandings, and above all, shared values. She smiled softly. When two people grow to understand what one another values in this world, it offers a better compatibility than any partnership formed on momentary attraction. Some of these books understand such growing attachments, others do not. She picked up some of her own books and placed them to Catherine's right. With them, she added Miss Austen's pride and prejudice, and sense and sensibility too. She put together a second pile with names that were not so familiar to Catherine. One side covers the matter of love very well, and the other does not. The Duchess sat back and urged Catherine to look at the books again. You'll find in these books that friendship exists as much as being drawn to another party. When you are fortunate enough to have both in a partnership, one is lucky indeed. She smiled happily and trailed a hand across the necklace at her throat. Distracted by that dreamy look, Catherine stared at the Duchess. Are you thinking of your own husband? Perhaps a little, she whispered softly. He knew me and what I desired more than anything in this world before anyone else could even begin to understand that longing. He is a part of my happiness in many ways. Why else do you think I can write such good romance books? I know what a good heart looks like. She trailed her fingers across one of her books, making Catherine wonder if it was her favourite of her own works. Now, I have told you much of my own thoughts on this matter. In return, 
you should share something more with me. She tapped her teacup as she raised it to her lips, offering a rather mischievous smile. Who was it you were thinking of so intently at the beginning of this conversation? Nothing, no one. Catherine fumbled over the correct answer, bringing an even greater smile from the Duchess. Someone has turned your head, that much I can tell. She motioned to Catherine with the teacup. No one has. Catherine looked down at the books, fearing the blush that would overtake her cheeks. Part of her wished to dislike Dr. Bale. He had been rude to her at times, even disparaging, yet she found it made her crave his good opinion even more. That morning, she had read much of the book he had gifted to her the night before, trying to take in as much as she could from the contents, so that she could soon return the book to him. Yet as she read, her distraction had only grown greater, and she thought of Dr. Beale again the night before when he'd stepped toward her in that doorway of his apartments, panicked she might be seen. I shall find out who it is on your mind soon enough, Catherine. I am certain of it, the Duchess declared eagerly. There is no one. Catherine's insistence clearly didn't persuade the Duchess, who continued to smile. Instead of saying any more, Catherine returned her focus to the books, deciding it was best if she no longer talked to the Duchess about the notion of love at all. Chapter 13 Nigel Avoid her! Avoid her, you fool! Nigel climbed down from his horse and looked at the manor cottage. As he retrieved his medicine bag from the saddle of the horse, he turned to see the butler in the doorway gesturing around the house. You'll find Lady Georgiana in the garden, Doctor. Thank you. Nigel nodded in his head in gratitude and took the garden path around the house. Really, he hadn't needed to come and check on Lady Georgiana today. He had been confident after his visit the day before that she was doing well enough without him. Yet for some reason, when he had risen this morning, it had seemed like a good idea indeed to come to this house. As he neared the back of the building, his steps grew slower and he looked at the windows, checking to see if Miss Fitzroy was anywhere to be seen. On the patio at the back of the house between tall lupins and foxgloves was Lady Georgiana. She sat primly with a tea resting in one palm, though she wrinkled her nose as she lifted it to her lips, suggesting it was the ginger tea that Nigel had gifted to her the day before. Dr. Bailey, she said in surprise, placing her teacup down in its saucer on the small table before her. This is a surprise. What can I do for you today? I was riding past to visit another patient and thought I'd check on you as I was in the area. The lie made him fidget, scratching the back of his neck, for the truth was that he had no other patients in this part of London at all for the rest of the day. How are you? I'm doing quite well indeed. Lady Georgiana looked very at ease, reclining back in her chest as she gestured to the seat beside him, encouraging her to sit. You find me quite alone this morning. Alone? Nigel's stomach knotted. This is a good thing, is it not? It means Miss Fitzroy is not here. My cousin is out with my daughter-in-law this morning. She is introducing Catherine to some of the other young ladies who assist her in writing her periodical. She is. Nigel smiled a little at the thought, considering Miss Fitzroy's eagerness to learn from him the night before. She's not one for being idle, is she? He reached for his bag and lifted it into his lap, retrieving his notes on Lady Georgiana. No, I believe she prefers to be active. She likes to be of use, rather like you. Lady Georgiana smiled and nodded her head at him. I could have sworn you were looking for my cousin just now as you appeared in my garden. What? No, I was just admiring your flowers. Nigel avoided looking at her as he reached for her wrist. Now, tell me about your day whilst I check your pulse. Lady Georgiana went into detail about her morning, telling Nigel everything she had done so far that day. He tried not to show a response in his face when she mentioned Miss Fitzroy and what sort of time she would be home again. Right, Doctor, how am I? You have sat here and listened intently to me for some time now as you check my pulse and mix more of this awful tea together. She wrinkled her nose at the tea. You must have some estimation of my health by now. 
I'd say you are doing well indeed, Lady Georgiana. I shall leave you to it. He stood and gathered his medicine bag. Already? That is an abrupt departure indeed. She smiled up at him. Well, I have other patients I must get to now. I shall call again in a couple of days, my lady. Thank you, Doctor. So attentive, as always. She tried to stand with her stick, but he bid her to stay seated and comfortable. Nigel hurried away around the house, feeling strangely jittery and uncertain whether he wished to leave quickly or maybe hang around and stand the chance of seeing Miss Fitzroy again. Without knowing what to do, when he reached the front of the house, he stepped in through the open front door and found the empty hall table. He glanced up and down the hallway, being careful to check it was completely empty, before he reached into his pocket and pulled out a slim book. Placing the book on the edge of the table, he adjusted it a few times. Inside there was a small note that merely read, For Miss Fitzroy, N. He'd left nothing more in the note and pressed the book to the back of the table, praying it would not be easily noticed by the butler when he walked past. Returning back outside, Nigel climbed into the saddle of his horse and rode away, out onto the road. He'd only been travelling a short distance when a carriage he recognised appeared before him, moving fast. The combination of their speeds in opposite directions meant he barely had a chance to see the carriage properly, but he caught a brief glimpse through the open window of the occupants. One lady was turned away, looking out of the other window, but Miss Fitzroy was facing toward him. She saw him at the same moment his eyes found hers, and she lurched forward in the seat, toward the window, but the carriage flew past all too fast. Nigel glanced back over his shoulder, urging the horse to slow his pace. Miss Fitzroy poked her head out of the window, looking back at him with a great smile on her cheeks. He nodded his head at her, a brief greeting, and that smile seemed to grow impossibly wider. When her friend took the back of her gown and pulled her into the carriage once more, she disappeared from view suddenly. A low laugh escaped under Nigel's breath as he faced forward once more. Her smile should not affect me so. She should not come. She shouldn't. Nigel adjusted the cuffs of his shirt one more time as he looked in the mirror. He knew well enough it was a foolish thing to do, dressing well in case Miss Fitzroy did make another unexplained appearance. But at least this way he would not be caught in such disarray again. His cravat he adjusted until it sat flat at his neck and fidgeted with the edges of his waistcoat too, pulling down the bottom of his waistcoat around his waist. Once happy with the clothes, he smoothed his hair too. It was flatter tonight, not so wild as it had been the night before. She will not come. It would be foolish of her to do so. Nigel turned sharply away from the mirror, wondering when exactly he had started to talk aloud to himself so much. It is a foolish thing. A boy's approach to a woman, to talk aloud, as if I am going mad. They'll put me in the bedlam if anyone hears me. He closed the door on his bedchamber and walked to his main rooms, setting about cleaning up the space. As the evening sunlight faded from the windows and darkness grew increasingly, he tidied away his things. The stacks of books became neat, and he managed to empty one of the tables, finding places for all of his medical apparatus. He thrust open a window to let in some fresh air, and lit candles too as the darkness grew thicker, so at least he would be able to see her when she arrived. If she arrives, she will not come regardless, why am I doing this? He remembered well enough telling her to go so he could think of her offer, and part of him prayed that she would not be so foolish to come again. She may be seen. What scandal then? He whispered to himself as he sat down in his armchair. She has spirit. Try as he might, he couldn't stop thinking of her. He sat back in his chair and lifted a book into his lap, turning to the pages that showed the latest Italian illustrations of the inner workings of the body. Even the most grotesque and gruesome subjects of the body's machinations could not halt his mind from turning back to thoughts of Miss Fitzroy, though. She soon came into his mind again, as if she had walked into the room. She was very different to any other young woman he had met. As well as such spirit, she had revealed a steady determination 
by seeking out his home in the middle of the night and risking coming here without a chaperone. She was an independent soul, and despite her cousin's eagerness to teach her fine manners and posh ways, Nigel rather liked Miss Fitzroy for who she was, without those excessively polite manners. He found himself smiling at the thought of her standing in his apartment. He scratched his jaw, trying to get that smile to stop. The hours went on and on, and the candles burnt down as he read. It was so warm in the room that he shrugged off his tailcoat and laid it neatly over the arm of the chair. Repeatedly, he glanced at the door, but no footsteps made the stairs creak, and there was no knock at the door. He soon gave up with the book and folded it on his lap, realising something about what she had asked of him. He wished to give her those lessons, so she could improve her knowledge of healing. Despite his wish, he also knew it was a bad idea to give in to her request. After all, it would mean spending time in her company. That time would be commented on by her cousin, Lady Georgiana, and it would be dangerous for him too. I'd be breaking my vow. He dropped the book on the table beside him and leaned back, coming to accept something. Despite all his preparations that he had done so blindly, the adjusting of his clothes, the clearing of the room, Miss Fitzroy was not going to come. She would do as he asked and stay away from here, for it was for the best. Why am I disappointed by such a thing? Slowly, Nigel stood from the seat. He undid his cravat, no longer needing for it to be so rigidly in place and uncomfortable around his throat. He tossed it over the back of the chair as he moved to the window and peered down at the road. It was busy out there tonight, with so many people milling back and forth from the tavern, that even if a woman did wander between them all, heavily covered in a cloak so that her face was hidden, she would not be seen. Nigel stepped back from the window and looked at the clock on his mantelpiece over the fire. It was late, far too late for visitors. He moved toward the candles that had flanked him in the armchair and blew one out. It cast the room into long shadows. He lifted the second candle and was about to blow that one out too, deciding he could make his way to the darkness of the other room without being able to see and undress for the night, just fine without the light. Moving the candle close to his lips, he took a deep breath in, readying to blow it out, when he heard that customary creak on the stairs beyond his door. That's not possible. The creak was followed by another, and there was the unmistakable sound of someone moving up the stairs and onto the landing outside of his apartment door. This evening, there was no small thud or wince of pain, suggesting that they had not tripped on the top step. Suddenly there was a knock at his door. Chapter 14 Nigel Nigel lowered the one candle to the table and crossed the room, hurrying toward the door as quickly as he could. Opening it a fraction, he peered out into the darkness of the hallway. Only a little of the light from his candle fell on her face. Miss Fitzroy stood before him with her cloak lowered around her shoulders, smiling at him in an almost giddy fashion. The sight of such a smile made his stomach coil, with a sort of excitement that lodged deep inside of him. I should not be feeling such things. Without speaking, he pushed the door open wide, urging her to come inside. She stepped in, and he closed the door hurriedly, checking just once down the stairs to ensure that this evening no one had heard her coming. Leaning against the closed wood, he sighed and stared at her, trying to get control of the excitement fluttering within his stomach. Miss Fitzroy should not be here, should not be alone with him, yet this yearning seemed to want to keep her around. Had he not waited all evening for the possibility of her turning up? Had he not hoped for it, fidgeting constantly and repeatedly glancing at the door? What dark apartments, Miss Fitzroy said with a sudden giggle, moving to the table. Do you just have the one candle to keep you company in the evening? Curious. She fiddled with the brass plate beneath the candlestick. Miss Fitzroy, you and I must talk about this. He stepped away from the door, thoroughly believing now that his hope of seeing her was a foolish one indeed. Every wise thought in him knew it was bad for her to be here. Good evening to you too, she murmured with an easy smile. 
She took off her cloak and dropped it over the back of a chair. She wore the same peach gown he had seen her wear that first day, yet now it was not dappled with dirt. It suited her well, flattered her figure so much that Nigel's eyes went where they shouldn't. What is wrong with me? He adjusted his waistcoat and crossed the room, keeping as much distance between them as he possibly could. I wanted to thank you for your gift today, she said in a rush as he reached for a cabinet and opened it wide. The book, I found it in the hall. She smiled sweetly as he glanced back at her. He had no idea such a simple act of giving a book would cause such happiness, but with Miss Fitzroy, it had done. I cannot thank you enough. You're welcome, he murmured, as he poured himself a glass of brandy, hoping to dull the burning feeling in his stomach when he looked at her. He gestured to another glass, uncertain why he offered her one when he was intent on making her leave again. Yes, please, she crossed toward him. He poured out a second glass and left it for her to take, raising his own and crossing the room once more, keeping as much distance between them as he possibly could. Miss Fitzroy, I am not sure this is a wise idea. He rubbed his brow and his temple, feeling the beginning of a headache lodge deep within. He could only presume it came from overthinking so much. Why is it you have just one candle, Doctor? she asked, raising her glass between her two palms as she returned to stand by the table and nodded down at it. It leaves this place rather dark, does it not? What? He looked sharply at her, confused by the line of her questioning. Do you eat here too? She motioned at the table. I did not realise. There must be something nice about taking your meals amongst your work. Goodness, if I had ever tried to bring a book to the dining table, my mother would have snatched it away instantly. Parents can be like that, Nigel muttered, more to himself as he took a sip of his brandy. He could remember all too easily taking books about human biology to the dining table and his father's look of horror when he had looked over and seen the books. It had grated on him, his father's curling of his nose and the press of his thin lips together. You are such a well-dressed doctor, Miss Fitzroy declared suddenly and walked around the table, her eyes dancing across his things. Nigel suddenly felt self-conscious of his rooms, in a way he had never bothered to be before. He liked this place. It might be small, pokey, hardly what he was used to growing up, and the last time his father had come here, he'd pressed a scented posy to his nose throughout. Yet it was his own space, and he loved to fill it with candles. Looking to the side of the room, he saw a small tray where he'd left a tobacco pipe still smoking. He stepped toward it and turned the tobacco out, putting out the burning. The scent leapt into the air. What of it? Nigel asked, glancing back at her. She ran a hand across one of his stacks of books, and he feared for a minute that she could be checking for dust. These apartments are just not what I was expecting the first time I came here. They are rather small, and I just thought... She looked at him squarely this time, and Nigel stared back, raising a solitary eyebrow. Enough he said, his voice dark. I am sorry. Enough. His voice was sharper this time. If the wealthy daughter of a baron has merely come here to disparage my situation, I will have no part in it. What? She took a step back, her jaw falling slack. That is not what I meant. No? From where I'm standing it appeared very much as if your haughty manners were making you look down on my things. Look at the way you search for dust on my books. He used his brandy glass to point toward her hand resting on a stack of books. God's wounds. Are you so prepared and ready to be insulted that you see insult where there is none? She shook her head, clearly bewildered by him. I beg your pardon. He stepped toward her. Something in her inspired an energy in him. Something that he was no longer sure was annoyance, frustration or just attraction. He moved around the table, coming close to her. She held her ground, no longer holding on to his books, but taking a sip from her brandy. What did you mean by that? What did you mean by your own words? She nodded at him. I meant no insult by asking you about your candle, 
or these rooms. They are justified questions, questions of interest, that is all. If you perceive ignorance in them, that is your own fault. You seek fault where there is none. I am not that sort of person. No? Are you not? She frowned deeply. As far as I can see, between the pair of us, you are the one who has been disparaging ever since we have met. I have not been, he declared with abrupt vigour, aware that they had stepped very close to one another now. It didn't seem to matter that he knew it was inappropriate. Arguing with her was natural, and being close to her even more so. No. Then remind me, who showed haughtiness that first day of our meeting? To choose your specific synonym for pride. You were the one, Doctor. You insinuated I was a maid. She motioned to him with her brandy glass, coming dangerously close to sloshing the golden brown liquid over the rim of the glass. He reached out and laid a hand to the spindle of the glass, stopping that liquid from falling. She stared down at his hand on the glass, their fingers mere inches away from one another. That was a genuine mistake. I meant no ill will in my statement, he explained hurriedly. My focus when I am with a patient is them. I was hardly looking around and taking much notice of you. So I see. She retracted her hand back, pulling the glass from him. When she looked down at the glass, her face blushing a deep red, he realised how his words had sounded. That is not what I meant. You said it, Doctor, she said simply, raising her head to reveal a rather amused smirk, though he wondered if it was forced. Have I hurt your feelings? God's wounds, I have lost the ability to talk clearly around Miss Fitzroy. You took no notice of me. It's a wonder you have noticed me at all by now. I suppose you cannot avoid it when I keep turning up in your apartments. It's a matter of focus, that is all, he explained hurriedly, moving toward her once again. They were so close now. It was very inappropriate. Her scent wafted around him, the honeysuckle lingering under his nose, and he wondered if she could smell the brandy and tobacco on him. I was not focused on you. I was focused on my patient. And now? Well, it would be hard not to be focused on you, would it? No matter how much I drink this to try to dull that feeling. He held up his own brandy glass between them. What do you mean by that? Her brows quirked together. Nothing. His voice deepened. He feared just how much he had said and revealed to her. Would she understand from that conversation that he was drawn to her, inexplicably so, even when he tried to pull back from her? I am merely frustrated by your questioning of my situation. Is it so poor compared to your own? Do you wish to disparage it? Come off your high horse, would you? She laughed this time. The sudden sound shocked him, and he stared at her. I was not being proud, but inquiring as to your situation. Once again, Doctor, you see fault and insult where there is none. Why is that? She tilted her head to the side. He felt strangely watched in the same way he imagined some of his patients felt examined by him when he came to see them. Her eyes were penetrating, staring straight at him. You baffle me. The words were out of his lips before he could stop them. Her brows shot up in surprise. For someone so intrigued about the idea of helping people, you do seem a little proud. He raised his hand and held up his fingers a short distance apart. It is a natural assumption based on the things you have said. Proud? This from the man who has lectured me in practically all of our meetings, she asked, stepping toward him. She was now so close, she had to tilt her head up to look at him. Is that what I have done? Without fault, every single time, she spoke with vigour. That was not my intention. These are merely spirited debates, he said hurriedly, bending down a little toward her. Is that what they are? She laughed once more, almost scoffing at the idea. For they sound like arguments to me. He said nothing. Abruptly, their argument ended, and they stared at one another, their chests rising and falling. What am I doing? He was so close to Miss Fitzroy that he could have given in to a longing. He could have kissed her, 
and his eyes even flitted down to her full lips, imagining what it could be like. Would she taste like honeysuckle? Just like her scent? Do not be a fool. He returned his eyes to meet her own, knowing he had to back up from her now. See? This is why even considering your proposal to teach you is a poor idea indeed. He backed up from her, watching as she blinked. It was as if she had come out of a trance the way she looked at him, shaken at the sudden distance there. What do you mean? she asked, clutching tighter to her brandy glass. I mean that we debate or argue continuously. How could I even be your teacher, Miss Fitzroy? if we cannot keep the peace between us in a simple discussion over a brandy. He walked around the table and kept himself on the other side, so many of his books were between them. Very well, I see that I must offer something more if I am to persuade you to even consider my offer seriously. She stood taller and lifted her wrist. Nigel noticed for the first time there was a small reticule latched around her hand. She dropped it to the table between them with a small thud. I can pay you for your lessons to me. What did you say? He nearly choked on his brandy. It is customary, is it not? If one is a tutor, they are paid. She slid the reticule toward him across the table, but he didn't reach for it to look inside and see what money she had brought with her. This is why I was asking before about your situation, the candle, the small apartments. She winced, gesturing to the apartments as she seemed to realise just how it had sounded. I was trying to gauge whether you were in need of money and if you would be open to such an offer, Doctor. Ah, he looked down at the reticule. That was hardly the act of a proud woman, but a practical one. He had misjudged her conversation entirely. What do you think? she asked, nodding at the reticule. I can pay you fairly, and this way it is simply a business deal. You and I both obtain something we need or desire. Her use of the word desire made his spine stiffen. As he stared at her, he realised that was exactly what he did feel. Yet it had nothing to do with the money, and everything to do with Miss Fitzroy. You can earn a little money, and I can learn what I need to learn. Now, what is so awful about that idea? she asked, a small smile appearing. Firstly, he reached for the reticule, holding it up and grimacing when he found it so heavy. Walking alone in this part of London with so much in your reticule is an ill idea indeed. What if someone realised what you were carrying? And how would they know that, unless they could look through silk? She snatched the reticule from him with a triumphant smile. Well, Doctor, what do you think of my proposal? Nigel's jaw slackened. I do not know what to say. Chapter 15 Nigel. The silence stretched out between them as Nigel looked at Miss Fitzroy. Tongue-tied, he struggled for words. He knew he should have sent her away and said with finality that he didn't need her money, and certainly had no wish for it. But it was the passion with which she had spoken that left him dumbfounded. She opened her reticule and reached inside, pulling out some coins. She placed them one at a time on the table, stacking them high, just like his books were. Wait, Miss Fitzroy. I can pay, see. I wish you to know that I mean my promise. I would pay you for your services, she said hurriedly. It would be fair, would it not? She halted, looking up at him. Nigel didn't even glance at the money, for it mattered naught to him. He earned a good living in his career, and he had an annuity from his father too. It was just that he chose not to spend it. He was not a man for the fine things of life, and they brought him little comfort. It was why the money interested him so little. I've baffled you again, have I not? Miss Fitzroy asked with a sudden laugh. A little? Nigel allowed himself to share in a smile with her. Well, at least that is a better response than the anger. I was not angry, he insisted. She merely raised an eyebrow and he smiled once more, perhaps a little. You were outraged, she giggled. All I ask is you consider my offer seriously, Doctor, before you reject it outright. You have dedicated your life to helping people. Is it so wrong for me to wish to do the same with my life? Her words captivated him. 
Slowly he walked around the table, moving back toward her as he drew his fingers along the edge of the table. She faced him so hurriedly that she elbowed one of the sacks of books. They both darted to catch them together. He caught three, she caught another two, though one slipped down completely and landed on his foot. Oof! He tried to hold in his grimace of pain. That was a rather heavy tome, was it not? She asked, scrunching up her face. Well, I'm not one for light reading, sadly, on this occasion. He dropped the books back on the table and reached down to pick up the other. He lowered it to the table too as he straightened up to look at her. She was fidgeting now, barely standing still as she shifted her weight between her feet and looked at him with only what he could describe as pure excitement. She chewed her lip and tucked one of the dark locks of her hair that had escaped her updo behind her ear. He was almost tempted to help her, to push that lock back too. But he knew how mad that would be. This is inappropriate enough as it is. Tell me something, he whispered, watching her closely now. What? You have suggested that your mother would not approve of your endeavours. Why then do you wish to do them? He folded his arms over his chest and suddenly realised that his cravat was missing. Having tried to be so well-dressed tonight, earlier he had taken it off in frustration when he thought she was not coming. It was too late now to return it, especially as his neck had been open to her throughout their conversation. She will think of me as a poorly dressed fool. My mother would not be so disapproving of wishing to help others. Miss Fitzroy shook her head. Far from it, for she admires my aunt greatly for what she has done. It's just that she wishes me to be a fine lady too, and in truth, I have no such desires. She shrugged. I'd rather do something useful with my life than parade around in fine rooms, simply trying not to make a fool of myself when I trip on door jams and rugs. He smiled with her, recognising something of himself in what she had said. It is just the same the recognition that there is something more to this world. You have gone quiet, Doctor. She no longer fidgeted, but looked straight at him. Is something wrong? No, I was just thinking something. It does not matter. He found it hard to tear his gaze away from her. She has a good heart, a sympathetic one too. He had met so many young women in his line of work both affluent and poor. He was ashamed to think it, but most of the women of the ton he had met these days he found to be either proud or out of touch with realities. Even those who had an empathetic heart did not always make the effort to understand the wider world around them, something he had always been keen to do. In contrast, Miss Fitzroy was exactly the sort of woman he had not seen in a long time. She had heart, curiosity, and a determination that was admirable. Doctor, she murmured after he continued to stare at her, struggling to say anything. He tore his gaze away and looked down at the table beside them, focusing on the money she had laid out. I could help her. It would be assisting in a fellow healer, one with the same mission in life as me. If he helped her without any formal agreement, then it could start something rather too intimate between them, too close. Yet if he agreed to take the money, then there would be a wall between them. As she had said, it would be a matter of business, an understanding that would be all. Perhaps then he could look at Miss Fitzroy as he would a pupil or an apprentice, and he could desist from this constant thought of her and push away his desire. If I was to say yes, if, he reminded her hurriedly when she clapped her hands together, it would be a business deal, yes. Yes, it would. It would be a fair understanding. You get something and I get something too, she murmured, gesturing between them with her brandy glass. Is that so awful? He raised his glass to his lips, buying time before he answered her, sipping the liquid that had a pleasant burn at the back of his throat. This could work. Nigel reasoned that if he did teach her, not only could he keep her at a distance because of the money, she would soon be gone too. At the end of the season, she would return to Dorset, and he'd be free of temptation. Is this a yes? she asked excitedly. Not quite. Oh, God's wounds! 
What more do I need to say to you? She pleaded, stepping toward him. Nigel turned and sat on the edge of the table, toying with the coins beside him on the surface. She moved so near and as he sat down he was brought to her eye level. Do you wish me to drop down to my knees and beg you? Pray, do not do that, he said fast. The mere image of such an idea put a thought into his mind that should not be there. Then what more do I need to do? she begged, her fervour so plain that he was captivated by it. Talk to me, he said simply. Tell me more about what you learned from this aunt of yours. You wish to know? I do. Tell me something about what you know and how you wish to help people. I need to understand your thinking if I am to even consider agreeing to your proposition. His words must have given her hope, as she smiled broadly. Well, it all began last year. Miss Fitzroy started a tale that Nigel had not been prepared for. She told a story of her cousin, Lord Wareham, or as she called him, Seb. How the two of them had discovered a box that belonged to her aunt. How it was filled with old notes and letters from various customers. Some letters were advice to help women with aching hearts, and others were detailed accounts of health problems. Where Lord Wareham had ended up more intrigued in the letters that offered advice, Miss Fitzroy had been drawn toward the medical matters. Miss Fitzroy had pored over the notes that had been made by her aunt and had even read notebooks that her aunt had recently given her. You should see the way people talk about Bonadea in Dorset, Miss Fitzroy said with a smile as she came to the end of her tale. It is with pure awe. Is that what you crave? he said hesitantly. Some sort of fame for your good doings. Far from it. Miss Fitzroy laughed at the notion as she sat on the table beside him. Somewhere in the midst of their conversation, he'd gone to retrieve the carafe of brandy. He now filled up their glasses, and she took another small sip before she went on. The liquor had made her cheeks flushed, and with her animated speech Nigel was quite entranced, waiting for her to go on. Aunt Arabella has been so fortunate to occupy a place of anonymity. Maybe that is something I wish for too. I am not really sure. But I do not wish to do this to be known. I wish to do it to help people. If you could have seen the way that some people write back to my aunt, thanking her for what they have done, you would understand that feeling. It is pure elation to know that you have made such a difference to another's life. Believe me, Miss Fitzroy, I know that feeling. He smiled as he looked down at his brandy glass. It was a feeling he had been fortunate enough to indulge in many times over the last few years, though I have not always been so fortunate. A brief image appeared in his mind. He could scent death on the air once again and feel a coldness creeping up his neck. Then you feel it too? Miss Fitzroy's sudden words chased away the cold. He looked up at her form, his brandy glass, smiling a little. I do, he whispered. I understand that feeling all too well. Yet there is something I must warn you about. For every person you find thankful for your good work, you will find another who expected you to do more. There will always be someone out there who imagines doctors and healers to have the powers of God or witches. If I could wave a magic wand and make everyone better, I would. But no such thing exists. Some people place such hope on you and it is hope that sometimes must be left unanswered. He placed a hand on the carafe, tempted to have a little more. Doctor. Miss Fitzroy placed her hand over the top of the carafe. She didn't quite touch him, but it was close enough it captured his attention. I understand. I can see you are haunted too by certain thoughts. Haunted? The word struck a chord within him. Yes, perhaps he was haunted. Yet the good moments, the times when you are able to help people, surely it makes it all worth it, Miss Fitzroy asked, leaning toward him. Yes, it does. Nigel answered the question without hesitation, rather startled by how quickly it fell from him. It means everything to make such a difference to someone's life. And how did you get into this career? She released the carafe. Rather than topping up their glasses again, he just toyed with the stopper suddenly riveted by it. 
I cannot tell her that. It just started quite naturally. When I was young, I saw many people taken down by consumption, a nasty sickness indeed. You know of it? Before he had even finished asking the question, she was nodding. I suppose that first garnered the interest, wishing to help these poor people, yet feeling powerless, and knowing I could not. How did you begin your career? Various ways. His evasive answer made her frown. I tell you so much, and yet you are enigmatic in response. If your teaching is as woolly as the way you talk about yourself, our lessons should be interesting. Her jest brought a smile to his lips. If I do this, I promise to teach you to the best of my abilities, Miss Fitzroy. She sat taller, seeming impossibly happier than before. There was something refreshing about being around Miss Fitzroy, where most evenings he would sit alone, either reading or in a morose manner in the corner of his room, she was making him smile. It was a different way to live, one he had not considered before. You keep your cards close to your chest, Doctor, she observed after a moment. It suggests to me you are a man of secrets. Perhaps I am, but I am the only man who knows my secrets. He lifted his brandy glass, taking a small sip as she turned and stared around the room. A man of great independence. She smiled rather sadly. There is something to admire in that, yet I cannot help but wonder, is it sometimes lonely, Doctor? He lowered the glass to the table, feeling his stomach knot at her question. Surely everyone should have another to share confidences with. Not everyone. He shook his head. My heart is known only to me, and there it shall stay. She looked at him, her lips parted, and he rather thought for a second that she had heard something in his words that he hadn't intended. He grew aware of how close they were, sitting together on this table, sharing a brandy. I must end this, as tempted as I am. He feared if he stayed much longer in this situation with Miss Fitzroy, the temptation of her would be so much it would dissolve his resolve not to capitulate to any form of affection for her. Ahem. He cleared his throat and stood from the table, crossing the room. Right, here is what we shall do then. He reached for another stack of books on the far side of the room and took out an empty notebook. He held it in the air, waving it so she could see it. What's that? Your own notebook to make notes so you have something quick to refer to. He crossed to her and passed it into her hands. Wait. She looked up, smiling. Does this mean you are agreeing to my proposition? You will teach me after all? I will. When she jumped off the table with delight and nearly fell over on a nearby chair, he reached out to catch her, but she righted herself by gripping that chair and offering an innocent smile. God's wounds, I hope this goes well, he muttered. Chapter 16 Catherine Catherine why are your hands covered in ink? Catherine looked down at her fingers. They were indeed spotted with flecks of dark ink, as if tens of spiders had been squished in her palms. Um. Lift your chin and speak clearly, child, Lady Georgiana said with clear affection. Catherine lifted her chin and looked across the carriage at Lady Georgiana. The coach jolted slowly from side to side as they travelled down the road. Lady Georgiana held her walking stick in front of her, holding herself up in the seat as the coach threatened to toss her out of it. Catherine, in contrast, kept gripping to the bench beneath her, fearing she would fall at any second. I was making some notes this morning, that is all. Catherine smiled, hoping it looked innocent. Hmm. Lady Georgiana was clearly not quite taken in by the innocent act, but as the carriage was coming to a stop, she didn't ask any more. Ah. We are here. Catherine sighed with relief. Two nights before she had spent what felt like half the night with Dr. Beely. He'd given her the notebook and a few more books to read, then sent her on her way. Since then, she had pored over every book he had given her, trying to draw more information, not just in terms of botany and the use of herbs, but also in the way the body worked and its biological functions. 
She had been so fascinated by what she had read that she had made countless notes, filling the pages of the notebook that Dr. Bale had given her. Dr. Bale. Catherine sighed again when she thought of him. Something she was trying not to think about was just how close they had been together that night she had gone to see him. Their proximity to one another had been an easy thing, and more than once he had moved back from her, clearly sensing they should not have been so close. Yet Catherine couldn't help it. Every time he came near, her heartbeat had thudded in her chest and her palms felt clammy. Come, Catherine, Lady Georgiana called as she stepped down from the carriage. Best put those gloves on if you're going to hide all those ink stains. Catherine pulled on the lace gloves that had been resting in her lap, masking the ink blots, then stepped down to follow her cousin. The grand house stretched out before her, making her falter and trip on the loose stones of the gravel driveway beside Georgiana. Her cousin took her arm, stopping her from falling. No tripping today, dear. No tripping? Catherine spluttered. It's not as if I do it on purpose. Hold your head high. Georgiana smiled and tapped her chin, urging her to look up. That makes the effort not to trip even harder. All I'm saying is, have confidence. You do not need to be nervous going in here. You belong here, and you are a fine lady indeed. Georgiana's words warmed her, though Catherine couldn't stop the nerves that were now growing within her stomach. Come, follow me. Catherine followed behind Georgiana, repeatedly fidgeting with the new gown that Lady Nightburn had made for her. She flattened the skirt and readjusted the gloves on her wrists. So determined was she not to make a fool of herself and embarrass her cousin that she tried to do exactly as Georgian said and walk with her chin lifted. Climbing up the front step of the grand three-storey mansion, she held her head high but didn't look where her feet were going. Tripping on the hem of the gown, she fell straight into the doorframe. Georgiana paused with her walking stick striking the floor. I'm sorry, Catherine murmured beside her. Despite Georgiana's rigid posture as she turned to look at Catherine, there was a small smile on her face. You do make such events more entertaining, Catherine. I do not do it on purpose. I'm nervous. I fear it is making me worse. She stood straight and rubbed the sleeve of her gown, making sure she had got no dirt on it. Come on, you shall be fine. Georgiana led the way inside of the house. Catherine followed behind, not holding her chin quite as high anymore and repeatedly glancing down at where she was putting her feet. The two of them were shown through the house toward a large room at the back, where an afternoon tea soiree was being held. The long gallery room, flanked by vases of delphiniums on one side and portraits of previous generations of the host family on the other, was decked beautiful and full of people. Various tables filling the space were stacked high with plates full of cakes and various delicacies. The teapots, all patterned with flowers, had steam curling from the spouts, and any teacup was raised daintily with little fingers held in the air. Is it not beautiful, Catherine? Georgiana asked as they stepped into the room. It is. Catherine chewed her lip. It is much larger than any tea soiree we have in Dorset. Fear not. It is only drinking tea, Georgiana reminded her. And walking to my seat without falling on the nearest table and making the cakes fly everywhere, Catherine added in a hushed tone. Well, yes, that too. Georgiana laughed. Come, let me introduce you to our hosts. She led the way to the end of the room. Catherine tried to walk as calmly as she could, but her nerves had grown so great she couldn't keep control of herself. All she could think of was her mother and how worried she would be to see Catherine in a room like this. She had a feeling that if Clara was here, she would have held on to Catherine's arm to keep her from falling. Catherine realised now that she longed for her mother's arm, for that encouragement and safety. Am I incapable of walking alone? Apparently so. She followed Georgiana, stopping when they reached a couple at the far end of the room. The gentleman was staggeringly tall with a hooked nose and a rounded mouth, his stomach straining at his tight waistcoat. 
His dark eyes darted over Catherine, clearly looking down on her before she had even said a word. In contrast, the lady beside him was already giggling, incredibly happy with her cheeks pinched pink. Ah, Lady Georgiana, I'm so delighted to see you again. The lady hurried to curtsy. And who do we have here? Allow me to introduce my young cousin. This is Miss Catherine Fitzroy, daughter of the Baron of Aldington. Georgiana gestured to Catherine and she hurried to curtsy as Georgiana had taught her to do. She noticed at once that the gentleman's expression improved when he heard her father's title. Apparently, that was the most important thing. Catherine suddenly longed for other company. She wished she could speak to Dr. Beale to talk about real life and real people rather than titles. Catherine, these are my good friends, the Earl and Countess of Cambridgeshire. It is a pleasure to meet you, my lord, my lady. Catherine completed the formal introduction and the Countess smiled gleefully. Oh, isn't she lovely, she said with a giggle. Pretty as a picture. I bet your parents are proud of you, dear. Coming all this way from Dorset to London for the season too. How wonderful. Catherine felt a tightness in her throat and looked at Georgiana. She nodded softly, showing she understood that Catherine was ill at ease. I have been so looking forward to your tea, Lady Cambridgeshire, Lady Georgiana said calmly. Then please do take your seats. Enjoy. Lady Cambridgeshire ushered them on. As they stepped away, Catherine looked at her cousin in amazement. How did you know such a statement would extricate us from them? Catherine whispered. It is the virtue of the ton, Georgiana said with a small smile. Their need to be incredibly polite means their next words are sometimes quite predictable. Come, let us find a seat. She led the way around the room, seeming completely in control with many turning to smile and greet her as she passed. Catherine scurried behind her, feeling rather like a mouse at the fine lady's heels. When two ladies looked toward her, one curling her lip and the other looking away to whisper behind a cupped hand, Catherine hung her head. This is worse than I thought. Her nerves grew so great that her hands became damp in her gloves, and she rather wished she had had the forethought to scrub her hands before she came, to get rid of all those ink splotches. As they reached a table, Georgiana took her seat. Catherine did not look where she was putting her feet, and had not noticed that Georgiana had put down her walking cane beside her. She was far too busy glancing at the two gossiping ladies that were still pointing toward her. Catherine tripped on the walking stick, feeling it roll under her foot. Oh! Georgiana reached out and grasped the stick as Catherine fell forward. She reached for the back of Georgiana's chair, hoping to stop herself from falling any further, but instead of finding the chair, she found a pair of hands instead. What the? A pair of strong man's hands caught her and urged her back onto her feet. When she saw an ink stain on his own hands, she felt at once she knew who it was. That's not possible. Her chin jerked up and she found it was indeed who she had suspected. Dr. Beale! she exclaimed in amazement. He offered the smallest of smiles as he released her hands. Thank you. It is no matter, he nodded at her. Take care, Miss Fitzroy. He stepped toward her and offered a small whisper. There are many here who will gossip about such clumsiness. Then I am doomed to be talked of, she whispered back. It is hardly something I can stop. Be yourself, he urged and stepped back. Can he mean that? Before Catherine could say any more, someone called to him across the room. A tall man with distinctly dark auburn hair waved at Dr. Bale, wanting his attention. Excuse me, Miss Fitzroy. Dr. Bale bowed to her and left, crossing toward the man who had beckoned him so eagerly. Catherine reached for the chair beside Georgiana, her focus so fixed on Dr. Beale that she had to have two goes at reaching for the chair. Pray, sit, Catherine, before anything else goes wrong, Georgiana whispered hurriedly. Catherine sat down beside her with a heavy sigh. I am sorry. I feared I would be such a mess. Her cheeks felt heated, and she knew she was blushing a deep shade of crimson. There is no need to apologise, Georgiana shook her head. Now, 
Do you remember our other lessons? She looked pointedly at the table. I do. Catherine reached forward and poured tea out for the two of them, being careful to offer the teapot to others at the table, and she even served Georgiana's cake too. The entire time Catherine glanced repeatedly at Dr. Bale, wondering why he was in such a room. He is a doctor, housed in such small apartments. How come he has received an invitation here? As he spoke animatedly with the man beside him, she saw that they could, in fact, have been arguing. There appeared to be a vehemence in the hushed tones of the doctor, and the man with him kept striking his hand through the air as if it helped to emphasise his point. Look what you're doing, child. You're about to spill the tea everywhere, Georgiana said hurriedly. Catherine spilled a little of the tea out of the spout and hurried to mop it up. Returning the teapot to the table, she nodded at Dr. Bale across the room. Georgiana, how come Dr. Bale is here? What do you mean? Georgiana's brow wrinkled. Well, he is a doctor, and so far my impression of this society. Catherine paused and looked around the room, noting that the two young women who had whispered about her before were now pointing at other young women in the room and gossiping about them too. In particular, they pointed to a young woman who had just walked in, and was perhaps a little larger than most with her floral gown making her stand out from the others. Self-consciously, she hung her head forward, embarrassed. Catherine decided she would try to be friends with this woman. She clearly knew what it was like to be singled out as not belonging to the rest of the ton. Yes, dear, Georgiana urged her to go on. Well, some of the people here seem rather haughty. She halted realising she had used the exact word Dr. Beale had used a couple of nights before. She looked toward him once more. The heated debate he was having with the man beside him had calmed down a little. Well, at least from the doctor's point of view. He stared at the other man as he continued to speak. It surprises me they'd invite a doctor, Catherine explained in a rush. Oh my goodness, Catherine, have I never fully explained to you who Dr. Bale is? Georgiana held a hand to her chest. I suppose that is hardly a great surprise. The day you were introduced, I was rather distracted. She chose the word carefully, clearly not wishing to confess to any illness or what she might perceive as weakness. I know Dr. Baylor would never introduce the manner of his birth either, for it does not interest him. Catherine looked once more at Dr. Bale's clothes. It was not the first time she had noticed the detailing in the embroidery of the waistcoat, or even the fine material, even if plain design of the jacket. She had commented on him being well-dressed before, but had not thought much about it. He's part of the ton? Catherine spluttered. Of course. Georgiana nodded. He is the second son of Viscount Purbeck. I cannot believe you did not know. I... Words failed Catherine as she stared at Dr. Bale. Suddenly, so much had made sense. It explained why he had looked so shocked when she offered him money for her lessons. What it didn't explain was why he had accepted her terms of payment. But he's a doctor! Yes, it is perhaps a little unusual for members of the Ton to have such a profession. Georgiana leaned toward her, lowering her voice to a whisper. Between you and I, I believe it best his father is not here today. Viscount Purbeck has not always been so proud of his son's vocation, though in truth I do not understand the objections. The gentleman talking with Dr. Bale now is his brother, the honourable gentleman Robert Bale. Oh. Catherine still sought out words that would not come as she stared at the doctor across the room. It was as if he sensed her looking for he turned to face her, even as his brother continued to witter on about something. He didn't smile but returned that stare. Don't stare, child, Georgiana urged. It is not ladylike. Not much is, Catherine muttered to herself, far too quietly for Georgiana to possibly hear her. She tried to focus on her tea with Georgiana, but soon enough her cousin was called elsewhere in conversation with other guests and Catherine was left alone at the table. She busied herself with eating the cake and sipping the tea, hoping it made her look busy and hardly bothered to be alone. When a shadow passed over her, she looked up, 
startled to see that Dr. Bale had approached her. Doctor, Miss Fitzroy. They spoke at the same time, hurriedly, almost awkwardly. He bowed to her, and she attempted to stand up to curtsy, but he waved a hand, urging her to sit again. There is something I wish to speak to you about, he said, taking Georgiana's vacant seat. Please do not let anyone here know about our Les. Ah, brother, who do we have here? Mr. Bale appeared beside them, cutting off their conversation. Catherine's mouth was dry as she looked between the two brothers. There was a pain lodged in her stomach as she realised what the doctor had been about to plead with her. No one can know. Is he ashamed of his association with me? This is Lady Georgiana's cousin. The doctor adopted a very formal tone as he stood and gestured to her. Once more Catherine stood, and this time managed to avoid any clumsiness as she curtsied. Miss Catherine Fitzroy. Ah, pleasure. Mr. Beale looked rather disappointed. He shared similar features to his brother, but where the result in Dr. Bale was a pleasant face, Mr. Bale was too angular, and if anything the contortion of his expression made him a little ugly. She is the daughter of Baron Aldington. When Dr. Bale added these words, his brother lit up. Ah, a great pleasure indeed. Mr. Bale now offered a deep bow. What a sudden bow, Catherine remarked with a humoured smile. She caught sight of Dr. Bale trying to hide his laughter. He coughed and adjusted his collar behind his brother's back. I have met Miss Fitzroy once before at her cousin's house. I believe you are with us for the season, are you not? The casual and rather cool way the doctor spoke of her, as if they did not know one another at all, hurt indeed. I am. When she saw him smile a little, her feelings changed. Should she be offended? Or perhaps thrilled that they shared a secret, and the man beside them had no idea how well they were actually coming to know one another? And how do you enjoy London, Miss Fitzroy? Mr. Beale asked. Very much. She tried not to look at the doctor too much with her answer, fearing he would understand why she was enjoying it. So many questions filled her mind as she looked between the brothers. Why did the doctor work if he was the son of a Viscount? Had he been cut off? Had he turned his back on his father? Well, Miss Fitzroy, I'd be very glad to hear more details of your visit, Mr. Bale said with sudden warmth, and she snapped her gaze toward him. What did he mean by that? Chapter 17 Nigel, what in God's name is my brother doing? Nigel stared slack-jawed as Robert tried to charm Miss Fitzroy. Robert gestured to the seats, clearly encouraging her to sit so he could perch beside her. Oh, thank you. Miss Fitzroy was wrong-footed as she took her seat, glancing at Nigel. He wished he could communicate with her silently not to sit, but what could he say? If he shouted, Stay away from my brother! It might have been a little too obvious. Why do I even wish her to stay away from him? Nigel stood beside the pair as they sat together, and Miss Fitzroy poured out tea for the two of them. You live in London, then? she asked, clearly trying to politely make conversation. I do. I'm a great lover of the ton life. London has so many attractions to offer, too. Robert smiled, his wide lips taking over his features. And what do you think of it? I think it is alive with energy, but it is the people that interest me so much. She poured out a third cup of tea and easily passed the cup to Nigel. He took it with surprise. She could have easily not included him, but she made the effort to do so. Thank you, he murmured, aware of the way their fingers brushed on the saucer. To his amazement, she hadn't pulled back, and there was a small thrill that passed through his body with that touch. Oh yes, the people are fascinating too, Robert said with sudden eagerness. He clearly tried to appeal to Miss Fitzroy by pretending to be interested in what she was interested in. Nigel sighed, rather loudly, earning his brother's attention, who subtly tried to stand on his foot to quieten him. Fortunately, Nigel saw it coming and stepped to the side. Have you yet been to Somerset Gallery, Miss Fitzroy? As Robert launched into a great detailed description of the gallery, 
Not giving Miss Fitzroy a chance to answer his question, Nigel hid his smirk of amusement behind his teacup. She will not be interested in that. She thinks of people, not artwork. Just as he had expected, Miss Fitzroy looked away, examining people nearby rather than paying attention to Robert. Nigel's smile grew at her disinterest. For the life of him, he couldn't figure out why Robert's interest bothered him. Perhaps it was because Robert was so plainly interested in her now that he had discovered she was the daughter of a baron. He had not taken much notice of her at this tea beforehand. Forgive me, Mr. Bale, Miss Fitzroy said with ease as he reached the end of his discussion, but I must admit a lack of understanding when it comes to Somerset Gallery. I have been known to paint. You do, Nigel said in surprise. She looked at him with a humoured smile and he softened his voice. I mean, your cousin never said. No, I paint people, though, rather than landscapes. The judgment of one's face, the recreation of it, it can bring out someone's character to life so completely. That is what I find so interesting, she explained. Fascinating, Nigel agreed with her. Yes, I quite agree. Robert leaned forward, trying to capture her attention once again. Nigel's hand tightened around his teacup in anger. Robert had had much attention from ladies his entire adult life. For some reason, Nigel didn't want him to have Miss Fitzroy's attention now. Dr. Bale, may I borrow you for a minute? Lady Georgiana appeared at his side. Nigel didn't answer at first. He longed to stay with Miss Fitzroy to see her continue to spurn Robert's attentions, for it would at least give him some amusement, but he could not refuse a patient. Of course. Nigel bowed to Miss Fitzroy, noting the way her eyes lingered on him as he walked away with Lady Georgiana. Why does she look at me in such a manner? What does that mean? Nigel spent the next half an hour trapped in conversation with Lady Georgiana and various friends who all subtly tried to ask his advice on medical matters. He gave what advice he could, though in his distracted state, he managed two more cups of tea in that short amount of time using the opportunity to drink to give him the chance to look across the room. He watched Miss Fitzroy, growing increasingly irked with the attention she received. Not only did Robert hang at her side, like a persistent budgerigar, pecking and wanting her approval, but other gentlemen moved toward her too. When she nearly dropped her cake fork, one of the men was there to catch it for her. They laughed off her clumsiness unaffected by it. Do they find it as endearing as I do? Doctor, are you quite well? Lady Georgiana asked as a couple of her friends walked off to find others to talk to. You seem perturbed. I am quite well. My apologies, I'm just a little distracted this afternoon. I can't imagine why. He looked at Miss Fitzroy again. Something she said earned a laugh from both Robert and another gentleman beside her, and Nigel longed to know what the jest was. Can you not? Lady Georgiana said with clear humour. Nigel looked at her, uncertain if she had seen the eagerness with which he was staring at her cousin. I take it your brother is irking you a little today. Ah, yes, yes, that's exactly what it is, he murmured hurriedly, rather relieved she had mistaken his stare for his brother. If you would excuse me, my lady, I must have another word with my brother before I depart for the day. Of course. Go to him, doctor. She smiled and waved him off. Nigel hurried across the room, self-consciously adjusting his cravat and his waistcoat, trying to make them lay a little flatter before he reached the group. Some of the other men had now been intercepted, and there was just Robert and one other gentleman hanging at her side. Robert! Nigel stopped behind his brother, leaning down toward him. What is it, brother? Robert said with laughter. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm taken up by Lady Georgiana's cousin at present. You are quite captivating, Miss Fitzroy, if you will forgive a clumsy fool for saying so. The plainness of his compliment made Nigel grip his teacup so tightly he was in danger of breaking it. Oh, I... Miss Fitzroy shifted in her seat, clearly uncertain what to do about the compliment. I suggest a need for some spectacles then, my lord. You may not be looking at the real me. 
Robert and the other gentlemen laughed warmly. Nigel suddenly felt so protective, so angered at them for being so close to her when they didn't know the real her. All he knew was that he had to get them away from her. Robert, his hand reached for the back of Robert's chair. What is it, Nigel? Mr. Braithwaite wishes to speak to you. Nigel nodded his head across the room. Mr. Braithwaite was an elderly gentleman, a kindly soul who was fortunately also one of Nigel's patients. In recent years he had found himself forgetting things and frequently forgot that he had asked Nigel to come and check up on him at all. Nigel knew if he sent Robert to speak to him, Mr. Braithwaite would just assume he had made such a request in the first place, then think of something to say. Best not to leave him waiting. Yes, very well. Robert stood with an exaggerated sigh from his seat, buttoning his jacket. My apologies, Miss Fitzroy. He took Miss Fitzroy's hand and kissed the back. I hope to return to you soon. Miss Fitzroy said nothing but stared at him blankly. Nigel was so angered at that kiss, he practically thudded his teacup down onto the table beside him. The other gentleman hovering at Miss Fitzroy's shoulder clearly caught Nigel's expression, for he made his excuses too, and hurried off. Now Miss Fitzroy was alone, Nigel sat down, taking his brother's seat. Good Lord, is this what all tea soirees in London are like? Miss Fitzroy asked with a laugh. Do men flutter around women as butterflies do around flowers? It's amusing indeed. Nigel couldn't laugh with her. He scratched his chin, staring at her, angered that he had divided her from two men who clearly had a genuine interest in her company. Doctor, are you well? She leaned toward him, closing the distance between them. Perfectly, he said tightly, the lie obvious even to his own ears. Oh, well, she paused and looked away. The way her eyes trailed after Robert made his hands tighten so much, his knuckles cracked. Your brother is a curious soul. Curious? Is that a good word on this occasion? An entertaining one, she confessed in a whisper, looking back at him. I have never known anyone whose opinion of me changed so rapidly when he heard my title. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor, hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Yes, Robert does have a habit of prizing position and wealth over anything else. I apologize if his behavior was a little forward just now, Nigel said hurriedly, leaning toward her. I wouldn't want you to be uncomfortable. On the contrary, he amused me. She laughed once more. Nigel fidgeted, unable to stay calm. He didn't want her to be amused. He supposed if she was laughing at Robert, that would be something. Yet he feared that she could have been laughing with Robert at his jokes, and that made it much worse. He does not appreciate healing, Miss Fitzroy, Nigel added in a hurried whisper. He thinks of himself more than any other. I wish you to know that. Doctor, I could see that well enough for myself, she murmured moving to the edge of her chair. They were now sitting so close together, whispering, Nigel feared what people would think if they looked their way. Despite that fear, he couldn't bring himself to pull back from her. At least now he was close to her, and no other man was. What is this feeling? You look quite green about the gills, as they say, Doctor. Is all well? She reached toward his teacup. Here. Have some more tea. It might help you. Words failed him as he stared at her, abruptly realising what was so wrong with him. He felt pure envy seeing her with any other man. Seeing her with Robert had mixed that envy with fury too. I care for her. Good God, when did that happen? When did I care for her so much? She and I may know each other, but that all that well. This was not what was supposed to happen. Here. Drink this. Miss Fitzroy pushed the cup into his hands, and their fingers brushed together on the cup. He looked into her eyes, wondering if she felt that same rush of heat which passed through him. I hope you and I shall start our lessons soon. There is much I wish to learn from you. Ah, Miss Fitzroy. He grimaced when another much more indiscreet thought entered his head. 
There were things he could teach her, things he could show her that had little to do with healing and all to do with the two of them. Get a hold of yourself. You're worrying me now, Doctor. She placed a hand on his wrist. Please let me do something for you. Tell me what is wrong and maybe we can figure it out. It does not matter. He shook his head. Please do not think on it. Yet the touch of her hand was doing something to him. It was the sweetness of her manner, her concern. All of it was driving him mad. Abruptly, he saw another woman before him. She was quite different to Miss Fitzroy, but she had shared that same sweetness of manner, the same wish for kindness. Apparently, it was what he admired in women more than anything else. Pure kindness. Then that image changed. The woman was no longer sat looking at him, but she was prostrate, her eyes staring glacially up to a ceiling. Nigel put down the cup and stood. He had to get out of here at once before his panic attack completely overwhelmed him. Doctor, you're breathing heavily. Miss Fitzroy stood beside him. He looked at her, a new panicked thought taking over. With horror, he imagined Miss Fitzroy was the ill one, staring up at the sky, glacially unable to move. It hurt him so much he turned his back on her. I am. A sudden sickness, that is all. If you'd excuse me, Miss Fitzroy, I must leave at once. She laid a hand to his arm. My aunt always said that in times of such heavy breaths, one must remain calm. Breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. She repeated this mantra a little, but Nigel wasn't paying attention to her. All he could think of was the realisation that despite everything, despite his wish to stay clear of Miss Fitzroy, they had come together repeatedly regardless, and in all of their meetings he had developed a deep and swift attachment to her. Forgive me, he muttered, backing up from her so that her hand fell from his arm. Forgive me. I must go. He left the room hurriedly. Across the long gallery he caught sight of Robert in conversation with Mr. Braithwaite, who had clearly found some subject to discuss, for he talked eagerly. Nigel nodded at his brother in parting and hastened out of the room, through the house, his breathing growing worse as his fears overtook him. Bursting out through the front door on the other side of the manor, he stumbled down the front steps and gave a swift request to a stable boy that came running, asking for his horse to be prepared at once. As he waited for the horse to be brought around, Nigel placed his hands to his hips and paced in a small circle, finding it impossible to calm down. Then Miss Fitzroy's words break through to him, repeating in his mind. Breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. In and out, Doctor. In and out. He did as she had suggested now, breathing in through his nose and slowly out of his mouth. It wasn't sudden but gradual. Eventually, his breath started to calm, and his chest no longer rose and fell at an alarming rate. When the horse was brought before him, he was able to slowly climb into the saddle, puling himself up and glancing back at the house. To his amazement, he saw that the doorway was no longer empty. Miss Fitzroy stood there, her cheeks slightly pinkened, as if she had run through the house to catch up with him. Nigel didn't flick the reins to ride off, but stared at her, sensing she had something to say. Taking the skirt of her gown in her hands, she hurried down the steps at the front of the house and crossed the drive toward him. Completely at ease with horses, she patted the mare's nose, comforting her so she could not escape. The mare pushed her nose into Miss Fitzroy's hand. It seemed just like Nigel she craved Miss Fitzroy's attention. Dr. Bale! she called up to him in the saddle. I pray it was not something I said that upset you. I am deeply sorry if it was. It was not. He reached toward her, surprised that his hand yearned for hers so easily. She released the horse's nose and gave her lace-gloved hand to him. He held it softly, nervous about holding on to her for longer than he should have done. It was nothing you did wrong. He tried to smile, struggling with it. It is something in my own mind. My aunt says sicknesses of the mind need more care than we sometimes give them. 
The softness of her voice made Nigel lean toward her, in danger of falling out of the saddle. More than anything did he wish to raise her hand to his lips, to kiss her and leave her with his kiss rather than his brother's. But he held himself back. I cannot be weak. I swore I would never have this feeling again. Your aunt is wise, he whispered. Good day, Miss Fitzroy. Good day, Doctor. Please, take care. He held tighter to her hand for a few seconds, then released her and flicked the reins. The horse darted past her down the drive and out into the open road. In his haste, Nigel didn't look where he was going, and he nearly collided with another carriage on the road. He narrowly managed to avoid an accident and rode away, determinedly refusing to glance back in case he caught sight of Miss Fitzroy again. Chapter 18 Catherine Catherine pulled the hood of the cloak closely around her face as she stepped into the dark alley. Having always crept into the small lane twice in the depths of London, she felt more confident about where to go now. She kept close to the wall, hiding with the shadows, her cloak only occasionally lit by the orange lanterns that swung outside of the inn at the far end of the street. The drunkards passed her, leaving the inn with merry spirits indeed. She smiled, hiding her face around the lip of the cloak, as two men walking arm in arm down the street left, singing a happy tune. Tucked under the cover of her cloak in a bag was the notebook that Dr. Bale had given her. She supposed she was coming for one of her lessons with the doctor, but in truth that was not her motivation for sneaking out at such a late hour. Try as she might, she couldn't stop thinking of how he had been at the tea party two days before and how he had run out. The memory of him kissing her hand before he left still burned in her mind. What did he mean by such a kiss? Could it be that it mattered to him? Or was it just meant as a mark of respect? It had certainly felt like more than respect. The heat of his hand against hers was a memory she couldn't forget, as was the burning stare of those rich eyes. Stop it! She halted her own thoughts, tapping her head beneath the cover of her cloak as she crept toward the doorway that led to the building of Dr. Bale's lodgings. Over the last couple of days, two parcels had arrived from Dr. Bale at the house. Each one she'd had to hide quickly before Lady Georgiana could discover she was having parcels at all. In each were fresh lessons from Dr. Bale. The first parcel was full of his notes on herbs related to the heart. She had read over them most avidly before his second parcel had arrived. These notes pertained more to the instruments used to measure the blood flow in the body and bloodletting. She wrinkled her nose at the mere idea of bloodletting, remembering what Arabella had said in her notes about her belief that it weakened the body. Reaching for the door, Catherine crept inside into the darkness. She didn't dare lower her hood just yet as she headed for the stairs, turning her head back and forth. There were many apartments in this building, and at any second one of the doors could open and she could be seen sneaking up to the doctor's rooms. At this time of night, no one would believe she was a patient. It would be scandalous. Yet she had to come. As she climbed the stairs, trying to avoid the creaking floorboards that she had discovered before, she thought of his panic two days before. Something was wrong at that afternoon tea, and she was determined to find out from Dr. Beale what had upset him so much. She tapped lightly on the door. Something thudded inside the room, and then footsteps moved toward her. The door opened, and as Catherine lowered her hood, her jaw slackened at the state Dr. Bale was in. Miss Fitzroy? He blinked madly, as if he thought he was imagining her. Doctor? What has happened? Her eyes darted across his being. Though she had seen him in a state of a little undress already, things were different tonight. Once more his cravat was missing, the neck of his shirt open, but tonight his waistcoat was also undone, hanging loose, and his shirt was partly untucked. His sleeves were rolled up to his elbows, and where they had been neatly rolled before, they were now jumbled, as if they had been put there hastily. His hair was tangled around his neck, his cropped moustache not as neat as it often was. Doctor, she stepped forward. Ah, I didn't. He raised his hand and rubbed his eyes. 
Forgive me, I was not expecting you this evening. He slurred his words a little as he stepped back into the room and beckoned her inside. Catherine hurried in, taking off her cloak and laying it across the back of a chair. The table beside the chair bore an empty brandy glass. His pipe was spent beside it, the ash upturned in a small tray. The carafe of brandy beside the glass was only half full. Are you in your cups? she asked, turning around as she realised the reason for his slurring words. A little. He closed the door and leaned against it, tipping his head back. I am sorry, Miss Fitzroy. You should not see me like this. I didn't expect you. You said that already, she pointed out with a small smile. Did I? He mirrored her smile a little. Then it faded away. Have you come for a lesson? I suppose, she murmured. But first, let us talk. She reached for the empty brandy glass. Why are you drinking this? Would it have something to do with why you left the tea party so suddenly the other day? That hardly matters. He moved toward her. Catherine raised the glass to her nose and sniffed, only to find it didn't have the scent of just brandy. There was something else mixed with it, something tart, acrid and chemical. What on earth is this? she murmured in panic. He took the glass and put it down on the table. A tincture to help calm my nerves. I do not know what to say first. I could point out that alcohol hardly seems a wise way to do that when it's known to raise the heart rate. She began, but he cut her off. Miss Fitzroy. Or perhaps instead I should just ask why your nerves need calming at all. Her question made him fall still, blinking. Always so penetrating, he murmured, the smallest of smiles. He seemed to be staring intently at her. My questions, she whispered. Those. And your eyes. He nodded at her. Wait, was that a compliment? She wasn't sure what to make of it. He rubbed his eyes again and walked around the table, putting distance between them. What is in this drink? she asked again. That doesn't matter. Now you're here, we could have a lesson. He rubbed his hands together, stood tall and breathed deeply, clearly trying to sober himself up. Did you read the notes I sent you? I did though I had some questions about the use of leeches. Very well, one minute. He moved to the edge of the room and reached into a tall cupboard. Pulling out a large jar of water inside, he placed it on the table beside her. Charming, she murmured wryly, as she stared at the jar full of leeches that were bobbing about in the water. What a pleasant dinner companion to have at your table. Dr. Bale laughed warmly. He leaned on the table, looking like he might fall over at any second. Shall we sit? Catherine said, gesturing to the chairs, hoping she could get him to sit before he did indeed fall over. He nodded wordlessly and sat down, gesturing to the leeches. What was your question about them? It was about bloodletting in general, really. She grimaced as she leaned forward, her curiosity bringing her nose nearly flush to the jar as she looked at the leeches. My aunt has always been convinced that leeches and the loss of blood makes the body weaker. Your notes said nothing of that. It's a practice that has been done for many years. Nigel nodded slowly, reaching for a book in one of the stacks behind him. He managed to knock the stack over with an almighty thud that made Catherine jump. Sorry about that. You're getting as clumsy as me, she jested, rather glad when he smiled a little at her words. He opened a book in front of him and turned to a page that was an illustration of the human body. Shifting his chair around the table, he dragged the book with him along the surface of the table and moved it toward her to see. Catherine looked between him and the book, startled and thrilled by how close he had come, though he didn't seem to notice her staring at him. These are the old humours of the body. It was once believed that the body was completely ran by these humours. He tapped the ink flecks on the page. Phlegm, blood, yellow bile and black bile. It's a theory that goes right back to the Greeks and the Romans. They thought that too much blood in your system was bad, for it made the body hot, leading to fevers. He paused, his fingers trailing across the book. 
You speak as if it is not a theory you believe any more, Doctor, she whispered. It's not. He shook his head. I believe these days that the body is not as loyal to these four humours as was once said. You mentioned your aunt thought the same. She thought it made the body weak. Why is that? He looked up from the book, staring at her. Catherine reached beneath her cloak and pulled out a small bag, laying it on the table. She took out her own notebook, then Arabella's too. When she laid out Arabella's book, Dr. Bale grew even more interested, leaning forward. The scent of the brandy and smoke came nearer. Rather than finding it off-putting, Catherine turned toward him, rather startled by the effect it had on her. Here, read this. She pushed an open page to Dr. Beale, remembering exactly what Arabella had put on that page. She had described in detail a number of patients and how they had all responded negatively to bloodletting. She also described in detail how they had weakened once leeches were applied to the skin, or when blood was drained through an implement. It is my belief, the doctor began to read from the bottom of the page, that blood may be the source of strength when fighting diseases. I vow not to take blood from the body again. I will leave my patient strong. Slowly he placed the book back down on the table. This is fascinating. He reached for his glass on the table, but finding it empty, he topped it up from the carafe beside him. Before he could finish, Catherine leaned forward and took the carafe from his hand. What the... What is this, exactly? she asked, wrinkling her nose as she sniffed it. If it's supposed to be calming your nerves, I'm not convinced it is working. What makes you say that? he asked, raising his glass toward his lips. Your hand. She nodded at his hand around the glass. Slowly, Dr. Bell turned his gaze toward his hand. Seeing the fingers shaking on the glass, slowly, he returned the glass to the table, not taking a single sip from the liquid. Ah, yes, ah, indeed, she declared, and snatched the glass away from him. You will not tell me what has set your nerves on edge, will you? He shook his head, sitting back in his seat and folding his arms across his body. Disappointing. I thought you and I were friends, Doctor. She chose the word friends very deliberately, for she longed to think it was something more, but she would not push the matter. All she wished to know was that there was some sort of connection between them, a bond that he would acknowledge. We are, his expression softened, but what happens up here? He raised his hand and tapped the side of his temple. They are my demons to cope with. How interesting. Catherine took Arabella's book from in front of him and turned a few pages. Let me read you something else my aunt wrote. She cleared her throat before she began. I have seen many times how the darkness and the fears in one mind can have a direct impact on the body. If we are left alone to face such fears, how can we possibly escape them? I believe it's like being plunged into deep water, to be lost in one's thoughts. Sometimes it's impossible to climb back out, unless we have a hand offered to help us. She lowered the book, smiling as she looked up to the doctor. His head was angled to the side his eyes unblinking as he stared at her. You're much wiser than I first gave you credit for, you know that, he whispered. Ha, she laughed warmly. I am not sure whether to be impressed with your compliment now, or disappointed you thought so ill of me. I didn't think ill of you. He shook his head. No, you did. Well, I... He laughed too, clearly tying himself into knots with his own words. Perhaps I should stop. Perhaps so. She smiled softly. May I suggest something, Doctor? He seemed dazed and unfocused, sometimes looking at her, sometimes looking around the room. They were so close together that it was all too easy to lean forward and rest her hand on his arm, making him snap his focus to her. What? May I make you a drink? A mixture of my aunt's creation. She softened her words, not wanting to spook him in his already nervous state. I am sure it will help, certainly more than whatever that thing is. Perhaps it will. The doctor reached forward and slid the carafe away, clearly having no wish to partake in drinking any more of the mixture. 
Very well, show me what your aunt would make me. Catherine smiled. It was the first time the doctor had placed his trust in her so completely. She stood, her hand still on his arm in silent comfort. As she walked away, she let her hand fall and moved toward a small fire at the side of the room. Lifting a pot of water, she placed it over the fire and started to bring it to a boil. Turning to the few cupboards he had, she reached inside, pulling out various herbs and checking with him at each stage that she had found the right ones. She gathered chamomile and rosemary, along with fresh peppermint leaves. She ground them together with a clean pestle and mortar and dropped them into a teapot. Lastly, she found a bowl of lemons that he kept hidden away in a drawer. May I? she asked, holding up one of the lemons. You can use it, but why do you need it? His brow furrowed. I'm investigating them as a possible cure for scurvy. My aunt believes they contain a nutrient, something to invigorate the body. She chopped the lemon in two and added a good squeeze of the juice to the teapot, then stirred the mixture together. When the water started to boil, she took it off the fire and added it to the pot, leaving it to brew for a few minutes. Dr. Bayliss stood and moved away from the table, staggering a little. Where are you going? To find cups. Dr. Bale stopped, his hand still shaking as he raised it to his eyes, rubbing it once more. Sit down. She halted in front of him, her hands on her hips. You giving me orders now, Miss Fitzroy, he said with a smile. Who is the teacher here? Ah, do you think you have learned all you could possibly learn in life? Her playful tone made his smile grow a little more. Sit down, Doctor. Very well. Rather than returning to the rigid-backed chairs at the table, he chose a comfortable armchair instead, sighing as he flopped down into it. Catherine found two cups and poured out the tea for the two of them. Crossing toward the doctor, she placed a cup in his hands, all too aware of the way their hands brushed together as they passed it between them. He seemed to notice too, for his eyes flicked up from the cup to meet her own gaze. Thank you, he murmured as she moved to another seat, taking the second cup with her. He sniffed the concoction suspiciously for a minute or more, wrinkling his nose. I have hardly poisoned you, she said pointedly, and took a big gulp. Trust me, doctor, just try it, I beg of you. He lifted the cup and took a small sip. His lips softened and he allowed himself a small smile. Is that a smile? Do you like the taste? It certainly tastes better than what I had made. He sat further back in his seat, relaxing back. As he drank more and more of the tea, Catherine sat forward, watching him intently. It took some minutes, but gradually his body calmed. His hand stopped shaking around the cup and he drank much more easily, rather than staring at it suspiciously. Thank you, he said after some minutes, his eyes half-lidded as he laid back on the chair. I suppose as a doctor you don't have many people try to look after you, she murmured. They never do. He shook his head, his eyes closing completely now. Have you not been sleeping? She stood and moved to his side, reaching for the cup in his hands that started to slip sideways. Barely slept a wink, he managed yawning. Why, doctor? I cannot say. She took the cup from him as his head started to loll to the side, sleep mere seconds away. Sleep well, Doctor. His head stopped moving, leaning against the wing back of the chair as he inhaled deeply and sighed, his breathing growing even. Catherine smiled as she stared at him, watching as the Doctor slept. Turning away, she placed the cups down on a nearby table and hunted for a blanket. Laying it across his lap, she tucked him in keeping him warm. His body softened even more, and a gentle snore filled the air. Catherine could have left. She could have left him, but she couldn't, for she was too worried about what else was in the concoction he had drunk earlier. Instead, she returned to her seat and her tea, watching him in his peace. Chapter 19 Catherine Emily, 
The name that escaped Dr. Bailey's lips made Catherine nearly drop her cup. Who is Emily? Dr. Bale shifted in his seat. He'd been at peace for some time as Catherine drank from her cup, nearly draining it completely. The doctor hadn't stirred at all until now. His head turned to the side, a slow murmur leaving his lips. Then he said the name again. Emily. Who is she? Is this why he was so upset? Has this Emily hurt him? Is he in love? Catherine felt such a fool that she couldn't move. She stared at him across the room, realising that the sudden ache in her chest was a form of heartbreak. In her time with Dr. Bale, she hadn't just been longing for his teachings, but longing to be with him, and yet he had no wish to be with her. He thinks of another. Oh, how could I be such a fool? Catherine hurried to place down the cup on the table without making a sound and raised herself to her feet. She had to get out of there as fast as she possibly could before her foolish heart placed any more hope on a man whose love was clearly placed elsewhere. Emily. Oh, enough. He kept saying it repeatedly now to such an extent that she felt as if she was being tortured by it. Catherine crossed the room toward her discarded cloak and lifted it around her shoulders, fixing it tightly. She gathered her books and her bag, hurrying to her task so much that she nearly forgot Arabella's book and had to dart back from the door to get it. No! No! Dr. Bailey's voice abruptly grew louder. Catherine stiffened, with her hand outstretched over Arabella's book as she stared at Dr. Bale. His head flicked from one side to the other, hitting the other wing of the armchair. His face was no longer pale but bright red, and there was sweat on his temple. What is happening? No, no, it can't happen. Not again, not again. Again? Catherine could not make any sense of what Dr. Beale was saying, but what was plain through the dim candlelight between them was that he was suffering some nightmare. Catherine slowly released Arabella's book, remembering she had read a section her aunt had written on nightmares. She believed nightmares were sometimes mere wild imaginings, and other times were memories sent to torment us with fresh problems resurfacing. It was a mark of the scars that people's problems left on their minds. Doctor, Catherine whispered. He gave no sign of hearing her. He just pleaded for things to stop again. He pulled at the blanket around him, as if desperate to escape it. She reached for Arabella's book and flicked the pages open, turning to the one about nightmares and night terrors again, reading the words fast. A true night terror one cannot always be woken from. All an onlooker can do is wait it out and make the room as calm as possible. I once treated a man so locked in his nightmare that when his wife tried to wake him, he was scared and lashed out, breaking their furniture. He was not himself. If someone shows reluctant signs of waking up, there are things we can do to calm them. Catherine shrugged off her cloak and put down her book, crossing the room toward Dr. Bale. Doctor, doctor, can you wake? Can you escape this? She laid a soft hand on his shoulder. He shrank away from her, becoming small in the chair, his face contorting as if in pain. No, no, it's happening again, all over again. She's gone. Emily. The words started to torture Catherine. Tears stung her eyes, but she knew she couldn't dwell on that ache now. She had to help the doctor, to give him a way to escape the demons of his mind. She returned to Arabella's book reading all the things she could do to help calm Nigel. First, she moved back toward him and placed her hand to the back of his head. He had no temperature, and if anything, simply felt a little too cold. She tucked the blanket around him one more time. When his feet lashed out toward the nearest table, she snatched off his boots, placing them out of harm's way. His feet relaxed a little under the blanket, and he sank down in the chair, the words still escaping him fast. No, no, let me out of this. I can't see it all happen again. She ran toward the cupboard full of jars of herbs. She collected all the ones for relaxation. In particular, she gathered lots of chamomile and lavender. When she found fresh lavender, she tied the sprigs into small bundles and placed them near the doctor, 
trying to give the air a calmer scent. Moving toward the window, she closed it tightly, blocking out the sounds of the street and the drunkards beyond. She turned back to the doctor, facing him for a minute as she took stock of whether there were any changes. His manners had softened and slumped, but he was still murmuring words repeatedly. I must do something more. She returned to Arabella's book. There was nothing more on the page about what to do. She flicked through the pages, searching for anything that could help. Catherine cursed under her breath, for Arabella could offer nothing more in this moment. As she moved to close the book, the pages turned, and the book opened on a different page entirely. At the top of the page read, To Calm Feverish Nightmares. Catherine halted, her hand falling flat to the page. Dr. Bale had no fever, but it was possible some of the learnings could be extrapolated. There was one line on the page that offered Catherine some hope. As mad an idea as it could be to try, it was just possible that it could work. Sing or hum a soft tune. When one's spirit is wild, something so calming can have a greater effect than we can possibly imagine. Catherine moved toward Dr. Beale. She shifted a stool and sat before him, praying that her singing voice, something she had no confidence in at all, would at least perform for her now. She waited for a small lull in his ramblings so he would hear her, then began to hum a soft tune. It was a song from Dorset, about old Harry Rocks and the way the waves would roll across the sand and children would play in the shallows. It was a tune she'd often returned to over the years, and as she hummed it now, she at first felt mad, certain it would do no good. Gradually, she realised the doctor's words did not come as hurried any more. They softened, and eventually they stopped altogether. Catherine sang a few of the words from the song, sitting back and trying to maintain her tune as the doctor angled his head toward her, clearly listening to her attentively. She finished her tune with a soft smile on her face. Slowly she stood and moved across the room, tiptoeing so as not to disturb the doctor. Looking down at the page, she read Arabella's notes, checking to see if there was anything else she could do. The final words, scribbled at the bottom of the page, startled Catherine so much, she stepped back from the book. When I first met Daniel, I sang to him often when he had a fever. He told me later he remembered those songs. They gave him peace in the darkness. Oh, Catherine gasped and turned her back on the book. It now felt strange to have done something for Dr. Bale that Arabella had done for her husband. The candle was burning down, the light growing dimmer. Determined not to leave the doctor alone in case these nightmares returned, she reached for a new candle and a tinderbox, lighting it with the iron wool. The candle holder was placed on some of the periodicals that Lady Bingley ran. Interested, Catherine picked up the periodicals along with the candle and moved to Dr. Bale's side. Pouring out a second cup of tea for herself, she sat in her chair with the candle close by and read the periodicals, occasionally looking up to the doctor to check he did not suffer those nightmares again. Catherine read about the women she had met at Lady Georgiana's house, the Duchess of Lestonmere and the Countess of Nightburn. Yet there were other women on these pages, other ladies that were being held up as trailblazers in their industries. Miss Radcliffe and Miss Austen were talked of in the literary world, and Miss Angelica Kaufman was celebrated as one of the greatest artists of the last century. Catherine stared in awe at the paintings that were recreated in print before her. All the women described had successful careers. They were admired for what they had done. It made Catherine look toward Arabella's book on the table nearby thinking of how Arabella had missed out on the praise she deserved in life. Maybe not everyone gets the light they deserve to stand in. Catherine smiled more and more as she read the periodical, noting the happy tone of the articles within. At all stages, they encouraged women to take their future into their own hands, and there was even a section toward the back of the periodicals where women wrote in, asking for advice or telling their own stories. One of the stories caught Catherine's attention in particular as she read, 
for it reminded her of some of the letters that had been written to Bonadea in Dorset. Dear editors for the women's periodical, I am writing to you in some desperation. I have always been an independent soul, quite wild in nature. Where my mother would have me sat at a piano, perfectly musical and charming in the way that an ornament is pretty to look at, I'd rather be out of the house. Most days you'll find me striding across our country estate, enjoying the weather, come rain or shine, and admiring the natural world. My mother insists this is no way for a woman to be, and that if I ever hope to be married some day, I should become the version of a lady that she wishes me to be. Yet this periodical seems to show me a different life. These pages are full of women who are exactly who they wish to be. I ask you this, to put the matter to rest in my own mind once and for all, should I do as my mother asks. There is so much pressure on a lady's shoulders these days to marry, to avoid being a spinster, to have a family of her own. Yes, I want those things, but should I compromise who I am in order to get them? I look forward to your reply. Your avid reader, A.E. Catherine, smiled as she read the sign off. It was clear the woman was afraid of her name being recognised in the periodical, so she had chosen to write it anonymously. Catherine shifted her attention to the reply that had been written in the periodical. She recognised something of Lady Bingley's turn of phrase in the words and wondered if she was the person who had written the answer. Dear A.E., never compromise who you are. Yes, there is an expectation these days for women to live up to a certain ideal. Yet that doesn't mean this ideal makes us happy. It is a tragedy of this world that I have seen many women who have married too young, too soon, and for the wrong reasons. Their happiness is compromised because of it. Be who you wish to be. If you wish to go for a walk, then go walking. If you wish to look at nature in the rain, then do so and trail your muddy boots back toward the house to make a point to your mother. You can be yourself. Most women wish to marry because they want a family and they want love. But love only comes from being your true self. If you forget the expectations, ignore the pressure and just enjoy every day of your life, you'll find someday you'll come across a man that suits you. He will be a man that, like you, will probably enjoy traipsing through the rain. Trust me. That marriage is worth waiting for, no matter how long the wait is. It is the greatest advice I can give to any reader of this periodical. Be who you wish to be and don't sacrifice anything for any other's expectations of you. We only have one life. Live it the way you wish to. Your friend, from the women's periodical. Catherine slowly lowered the paper down to her lap as she thought of these words. It imbued her with energy, a knowledge that she was doing something right after all in pursuing her medicinal knowledge and trying to improve it. She could make herself happy, live her days the way she wished to, and someday she could marry and be happy with someone who was like her in mind. Her smile faltered as she turned to look at Dr. Beale beside her. It would be a lie to pretend that she hadn't considered the idea that Dr. Beale could be that partner. She was attached to him, far more strongly than she had realised before. Sighing deeply, she now recognised the truth for what it was. It didn't matter if her heart was devoted to him, for he was attached to another. This Emily, the woman's name who he had muttered so repeatedly in his nightmares, clearly had his heart. In comparison, what was Catherine? She was simply the frustrating daughter of a baron who kept calling at night and pleading for medical lessons from him. I have to let go of my wishes for him. I have to focus on myself instead. She reached up, for she had a strange sensation that Arabella's earrings in her ears were abruptly heavy. She took them off and placed them on the table beside her, far out of reach, before she returned her focus to the periodical before her. She read of other women like Arabella, women who deserved to wear such treasured things. Chapter 20 Nigel Nigel was standing in the cold, pokey room once again. The stone walls were icy at this time of year, and the poor accommodation made it nigh on impossible to bring any warmth to the room at all. 
The whole atmosphere was grey, with the white light of the early morning stark against those grey stones and the dark floorboards. Move, Bale, the elder man said behind him. Lord knows we do not have long. Nigel didn't need reminding. He could feel it in the air. She was fighting death, tackling with it hard, but losing the battle. He stepped forward with his medical bag in his hand and moved toward the bed at the side of the room. The elder doctor, his mentor, Dr. Valentino Richards, stepped into the room and around Bale. He walked straight to the bed and to the tall woman who stood beside it, with a scented posy of roses pressed to her nose. Do something, doctor. I beg of you, the woman pleaded with Dr. Richards, her hands shaking around the posy. We shall do what we can. Dr. Richards offered a sorry sort of smile, then leaned back, jerking his head at Nigel, urging him to get going. Nigel stepped up to the other side of the bed. Wordlessly, he placed down his medical bag and sat on a stool, reaching for the young woman's hand as it laid on top of the sheet. He reached for her wrist. She was cold to the touch, much colder than normal, and her hand didn't turn up to reach for his as it had so often done before. The young woman angled her head around. The dark hair fell past her cheek. Her eyes were firmly closed, yet her chin turned toward him. It was as if she was acknowledging his presence, even in her depths of despair. Miss Emily Walters, he whispered her name, trying to rouse her, but she didn't move again. She just inhaled deeply. Nigel had been coming to see Emily for at least three months now. It had started off as a pain in her chest, something a little uncomfortable, and it had slowly gotten worse and worse. Most days, Nigel had come with Dr. Richards. When Dr. Richards would go to see her family in the kitchen and update them on her condition, Nigel would be left alone with her to talk. She was sweet in nature, soft and quiet, but when they were alone, she had a smile that she only ever showed him. It had been all too easy to fall in love with Emily, like stepping off a cliff and plunging toward the waters. She had offered her own hints of caring for him too, such as when he checked her pulse, she would turn her hand and briefly grasp his fingers. They'd come closer and closer, and now he called on her most days, though her family only believed it was his medical care that led him to make the visits. How long has she been like this for? Nigel asked her mother, feeling an ache in his chest as he stared at Emily. She had always been quite pale in the time that he had known her, but today she was deathly white, as pale as the snow and frost that peppered the ground outside of this cottage. All night, Mrs. Walter's voice hitched. I thought she was sleeping, resting. Then this morning I could not rouse her. Try, she doesn't wake. It's as if her spirit has, ha has, fled. She stammered through her tears. There now. Dr. Richards placed a hand on her shoulder. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walters. She is still with us. We can fight for a little longer yet. Nigel nodded in agreement. He was not going to give up so easily on Emily. He'd worked for months, trying to care for whatever condition had taken hold of her lungs. Now he knew how kind she was, how sweet in nature, how much she deserved a full life, he would not turn his back on her. He would stay by her side for as long as it took to make her feel better. Mrs. Walters, could you prepare some hot water for us, please? Dr. Richards asked. Of course. Mrs. Walters walked out of the room, her tears quickly falling down her cheeks. She pressed her posy closer to her nose as she left the room. The moment the door was closed, Dr. Richards leaned down, pressing his ear close to Emily's chest. She's wheezing, he whispered. Nigel stood up and copied the other doctor's movements, recognising he was right. It was as if there was some impediment to her breath. Each time she breathed in and out, her chest wheezed. This is not good news, Bale. Not good at all. The doctor's jowls shook as he stood straight. We need to help her breathe. Steam, Nigel suggested. Yes, yes, we'll fill the room with it. God, how are we going to do this in this bitter cold? 
Nigel leaped toward the window, closing it tight. Evidently, the mother had opened it in the hope that fresh air would help, but it was only increasing the iciness in the room. He tossed some logs onto the small fire grate in the corner of the room next, setting them alight and building the flames high. On the other side of the room, Dr. Richards poured out a fresh vial of some concoction. Nigel halted what he was doing and watched the doctor warily. What is that you are giving her? Doctor? he urged impatiently. Richards tipped the liquid past her lips and lifted her neck in such a way that it forced her to swallow. A tincture. Turpentine. Hopefully it will calm the inflammation of the lungs. Nigel stiffened, with his hands so close to the flames that it took a minute for him to realise he was in danger of them getting burned. It was an experimental cure for inflammation, and he wasn't convinced about it, yet Richards was the more experienced doctor. He had to do what Richards told him to. You do realise what we're facing here, do you not? Richards asked, slowly stepping up from the bed. No. What? Nigel crossed the room, moving to the other side of the bed. We thought it was a lung infection, a slow one. You even suggested it could have been the coal dust from the mines nearby. I know what I said. Richard sighed and thrust a hand across his balding head. I now fear we have missed some other signs. What? What signs? Nigel asked impatiently. Dr. Richard stepped back and gestured to a stack of handkerchiefs that had been placed on the table just beside the bed. I presume Mrs. Walters held these to her daughter's lips overnight when she coughed. Look, Bailey, look closely. Unable to see properly, Nigel circled the bed. He moved to the handkerchiefs and saw there was something dark and speckled on the white clothes. He picked through the handkerchiefs, moving as carefully as he could. Some were dark spots, almost black, but others were brighter, enabling him to see much clearer exactly what it was. It's blood, he muttered, looking sharply at Richards. Oh, God, God's wounds do not tell me you think it is. What other conclusion can be formed after that? Richards waved a hand at the handkerchief. Look at it, Bale. Can it be mistaken? But, Nigel looked at Emily, consumption usually acts quickly, within a few weeks. For whatever reason, the infection has been slower for Miss Emily. It has been harder to spot, I think. All her other symptoms, are they not similar? Lung infections and consumption are remarkably similar. But what about... Nigel paused and looked at Emily's hand. Her finger was moving, as if she was trying to rouse. He reached for her hand and turned it over, pressing his finger to the pulse point to take it. Well, how is her pulse? Richards asked at his shoulder. Fast, considering how still her body is. It's too fast. Nigel gulped around a sudden lump in his throat. He stared at Emily, beginning to fear for the first time that it was possible she wouldn't wake up at all. Oh, God. Richards, you could be right. Are there any swellings? Anything at all? Nigel bent down. He'd noticed a shadow on Emily's collarbone the day before when he had visited, yet thought nothing of it. Now, as he bent forward, he peered at the point where the bed sheets finished. A glimmer of her collarbone was on show. The skin was puckered pink, and a small ridged swelling had settled near the top of her sternum. He pointed it out to Richards, who cursed once more. What can we do? Nigel asked. You know as well as I that there is no cure for consumption. But... Nigel turned back to face the doctor. That cannot be it. We cannot give up now. I'm not suggesting we do. Richards shook his head. Let us start with more steam. I'll build up the room. You go and ask Mrs. Walters to bring up as many pots of water as she can. We shall fill this room in the hope of flushing it out of Miss Emily's system. The idea of flushing it out seemed mad to Nigel, but what else could he do? As Richards had said, there was no known cure. There was nothing he could do. He hastened from the room and darted down the stairs, pleading with Mrs. Walters to bring up more water. 
Emily's younger sisters hurried to help her, and as Nigel watched them work, he ached more and more. There were many similarities between Emily and her sisters. They reminded him so much of her that the thought of poor Emily laying so still on that bed was too much to bear. He wasn't sure how long he was down there for, hurrying to the task with the steaming water, but soon enough Richards appeared behind him in the stairwell. Dr. Richards? Mrs. Walters noticed him first and turned to face him. What is it? What has happened? Has she awoken? Nigel slowly turned to face the doctor. He knew that expression. He'd seen it before, the grave face, the firm line of his thin lips pressed together. No, it cannot be, Nigel whispered, terrified to hear the words. When Richards hung his head, yet didn't say the room, the air in the room shifted completely. Emily's two sisters started to cry, great wailing sobs that Nigel was tempted to take part in. Mrs. Walters flung herself from the kitchen, demanding to see her daughter at once. Nigel numbly followed, his body running cold. On the stairs, Richards took his elbow, lowering his voice and whispering in his ear. Belle, listen, his voice softened. I know that there is some sort of closeness between you and the girl, the mother. He shook his head. I know. Nigel nodded. He stiffened, stunned that Richards had even recognised there was an affection there at all. In his own way, Richards was trying to warn him that Mrs. Walters had not noticed. Now was not the time for her to know if it. She had to be left to her own grief. Nothing will be said. Good man. Richards clapped his shoulder. I am sorry. Nigel stepped forward, letting the hand drop from his shoulder. He walked up the stairs, moving slowly, every part of the air now feeling cold and icy. As he stepped into the room, his head bending down under the frame, his eyes shot to the bed. Emily's chest no longer rose and fell with her breath. She was completely still. Mrs. Walters's cries pierced the air. She flung her hands into the air, then reached for her daughter, pulling her up from the pillows and grasping her daughter into her arms. She kissed Emily's head repeatedly, across her forehead and her cheeks. Oh, my poor girl, my poor darling girl. Nigel stared, tears in his eyes that he was trying to stop from falling. All he kept thinking of was how this couldn't be happening. He'd pictured a life with Emily, of marrying her some day. And now what? He'd failed her, in so many ways. The image changed before his eyes. Strangely, Emily was no longer the one in that bed being clutched to by her mother. Lady Georgiana was kneeling on the bed the one to cry instead as she reached for another, trying her best to rouse her. The young woman who could be roused with her eyes firmly closed was Miss Catherine Fitzroy. This isn't possible, Nigel backed up. Where the stone wall should have been, it abruptly dropped away. In its place, there was nothing but open air. Nigel turned and ran into the space, desperate to get away from the image of Miss Fitzroy on the bed. She couldn't be there. She didn't belong in this frame. Miss Fitzroy was alive, full of life, always smiling and reaching for a jest. She couldn't be in that bed. He couldn't lose her as he had lost Emily already. He kept running before he collided with something hard. He ran straight into the yew tree, the very place where he had taken refuge from the rain the day of Emily's funeral. He circled the tree, stumbling into the rain. His body was soaked in seconds the great droplets tumbling down from his hair to his neck and seeping under his shirt. The rain came down so hard that he could soon feel it running off his fingertips and onto the ground. Between the graves, the mourners were climbing the hill toward the open grave. He saw Mrs. Walters and Emily's sisters, then behind them other faces. They were faces that did not belong there. Lady Georgiana led the train of people with the Duchess of Lestonmere, Lady Nightburn and Lady Bingley following behind. There were also two people that Nigel presumed to be Catherine's parents. Her cousin Sebastian, that she had spoken much of, followed too, his head bowed. At the back was Arabella, the Duchess of Gordon at least, it was the imagined face that Nigel gave to the woman. 
she walked carrying white lilies in her hands, the funeral flower. Over her shoulder was a medicine bag, as if there was still something she could do for the person that was following them in the coffin. No. Nigel walked through the puddles. It started slowly, then his pace quickened as he ran toward them all. No. No. Not Catherine. Not her. Catherine. He reached for the coffin. He pushed into the men carrying it and it tumbled to the ground. He couldn't pay attention to the cries and the panic of him interfering. He just had to see her, had to prove that this was some nightmare and that it wasn't some twisted truth. He reached for the lid and found it wasn't nailed down. He pushed the lid off where it clattered to the earth with a heavy thud. Bending down, he found Catherine was inside the coffin. She held a single white lily to her chest, her body very still and her eyes closed. Catherine, he whispered her name. Those eyes opened. Chapter 21 Nigel Nigel's eyes opened. He sat forward in the armchair, finding a blanket half tangled around his legs. He panted, struggling to breathe clearly as he took stock of what he had seen in his mind. It was a dream. Just a nightmare. That was all. Catherine is not in a coffin. He raised his hands and rubbed the palms over his eyes, trying to dissuade any last images from his mind. He dreamt many times over the night, sometimes of Emily and other times of Catherine. What struck him now was how he had stopped thinking of her as Miss Fitzroy at all, but simply as Catherine. What is happening to me? He shifted the blanket from his lap and looked around, only to see that his second blanket was across another. In the chair beside him, practically leaning out of the chair and nearly on his arm, was Catherine. Fast asleep, her eyes closed, her chest rose and fell with her calm, peaceful breath. Her hair had tumbled out of her updo a little, the rich brown tones curling at her neck. Nigel blinked. For a second certain she would disappear. He had to still be dreaming, surely. Yet the more he looked at her, the more he realised it was no dream at all. Catherine was indeed sitting beside him. He leaned toward her, reaching for her loose hair and praying she would not wake at his touch. He gave into temptation and trailed a finger through a loose lock of her hair pushing it back from her cheek and behind her ear so that he could see her face. She had a pleasant pink hue to her cheeks, showing she was warm. There was a strong scent of lavender in the room too, and he lifted his head from her, looking around to see much had changed. She'd arranged herbs around him, all scents that were supposed to have calming effects. The blanket on his lap suddenly made sense too. She did all of this. She took care of me. He longed to wake her and to thank her. Her efforts to bring him peace when it must have been apparent that he was having nightmares showed kindness indeed. He reached for her another time, tempted to give in to even greater temptation. Maybe lay a hand on her cheek, just to let her know he was there. It was then he caught sight of the burnt-down candle beside her elbow, placed on the table with the periodicals on her other side. The light in the room wasn't from the candle at all but from a glimmer of light through the curtains. No, it cannot be morning already. He moved to his feet, hurrying to the window where he pushed the curtains open, peering beyond. It was early morning. The lane was still mostly empty, but with the grey light, it was clear it wouldn't be long before the sun rose above the rooftops. It's morning. He turned around, his eyes darting to the sleeping figure of Catherine. Back at Lady Georgiana's house, people could be rousing any minute. They could discover that Catherine wasn't at home. What then? The scandal that would ensue would be outrageous. I have to get her out of here. Catherine? He didn't think about the fact he hadn't used her title. He crossed toward her, reaching for her shoulder. Catherine? He shook her shoulder. She roused, her eyes blinking open as she sat straight. Doctor? You're awake? She smiled softly. His chest ached to see that smile, for he knew he was about to ruin it. I hope you didn't have any more of those nightmares. It is morning. He didn't have time to chat now. 
Her eyes widened and she sat forward, with his hand dropping from her shoulder. It can't be. She stood up and moved to the window, copying his same movements. God's wounds. She thrust her hands into her hair, ending up pulling at what remained of the updo even more. You have to get out of here. If you're seen around here at this time... I know, I know, she said hurriedly. She darted past him, running toward the nearest mirror where she tried to fix her hair. What time does your maid check on you in the morning? Will she know you're missing yet? He reached for her cloak and gathered it together along with her books, stuffing them into her bag. She comes in at eight o'clock. He reached for his pocket watch, discarded on the table. You have time to get home. How long? Not long. He grimaced, catching her eye in the reflection of the mirror. You shall have to move fast. I'd offer to take you there on my horse. Pa! That would make the whispers even worse. Exactly. He nodded, moving toward her and wrapping the cloak around her shoulders. Go, quickly, before anyone can know. I'm going. She turned her chin down. He thought he caught sight of a glimmer of sadness in her eyes. But that could have just been panic, and he had mistaken it for something else. He followed her to the door where she pulled her hood up around her head. Oh, Catherine, he called to her as he held the door open for her. She stopped at the top of the stairs, turning back to face him. Thank you for last night. He jerked his head back into the room. The drink, the herbs, they helped. He offered a soft smile. She smiled back briefly. Any time. The kindness of the words made him inhale sharply. Then she was gone, all too quickly, darting down the stairs and out of sight. As he heard the door close in the distant regions of the house, he hastened to the window, looking down into the street to watch her path as she left. She disappeared into what remained of the shadows of the street. The effect was so instant, so sudden, that Nigel had to remind himself that her presence there hadn't been a dream at all. She had been real. Why did I dream of her? Nigel sighed deeply as he rushed through the house. He fetched fresh water from his garderobe and pulled out his bath in his chamber, preparing for a bath. The entire time he worked, he thought of the dreams he'd had of Catherine and of everything that had passed between them. When he caught sight of their empty cups and remembered the tea she'd made the previous night, he made his own version, trying to remember as best as he could what quantities she had put in of each ingredient. With the water freshly boiled, he poured himself a cup of tea and took the tea with him to the bath. Plunging into the water, the heat helped to dissuade the memories of dreaming of Emily and that awful day when he had witnessed her death. Since then, he hadn't lost a patient. It didn't seem to matter how many times Dr. Richards had reminded him of the fact that consumption was a highly fatal disease, one that was nigh on impossible to fight. It still left Nigel riddled with guilt. Since that day, he'd fought tirelessly to save every single one of his patients, and he'd determinedly refused to ever be charmed by a woman again. Until now, Nigel muttered aloud to himself. He took a big gulp of the tea, praying it would help distract him. Then he plunged his head under the water, feeling the heat envelop his face. Catherine. It was plain to him what the dream meant now. He knew it as well as he had known what she meant that day of the tea party, where he had been incredibly jealous at Robert's attentions toward her. I care for her. Far more than I should do. When he ran out of breath, he pushed his head above the water again and brushed back his wet hair across his forehead. He coughed a little on some of the water and shook his head. This was not supposed to happen. Good God, what am I going to do about Catherine now? Catherine peered around the gate of Manor Cottage, looking toward the house. Her eyes danced between the windows as she watched warily for any sign of life. Fortunately, it was still so early that the road behind her was relatively quiet. But she also knew that Lady Georgiana was sometimes an early riser, and she feared her cousin would come to her chamber window and notice Catherine trying to sneak in. I cannot use the front door. It is too risky. By this time, the butler could have risen 
and he could be preparing the dining room for breakfast. Determined to avoid meeting him or their eyes passing as she walked past the dining room window, she darted for the longer way around the house. She kept closer to the walls, at all times moving fast past the windows and peering inside before she dared step out. Where the curtains had been pushed back, fortunately, there was no one inside. When she reached the back of the house, she hovered by the door to the servant's entrance. She reached for the handle, but before she could take hold of it, it turned. Someone was opening it from the other side. Catherine leaped back and hid behind the door just as it opened wide. With a hand across her own mouth, she held her breath, trying not to make a sound as someone strode out of the house. It was the gardener. He always rose early and now stepped away from the house, shaking out his legs. He must have had his breakfast already, for he wiped his lips and moved toward the thick borders of flowers, rubbing his hands together as he prepared for the day. As he kept his back to Catherine, she slowly reached for the door again, opening it a crack and peering inside. No one was in the hallway. Checking back over her shoulder to ensure the gardener hadn't seen her, she stepped into the hallway. Walking on her toes, she tried not to put her heels down, fearing they would make too loud a sound and give her away. She crept down the corridor until she reached the kitchens and the open doorway, hearing the unmistakable sounds inside of people moving around. Won't be long now, one of the cooks said to another. Get those pastries upstairs, girl. Yes, Simmons. The maid must have grabbed a tray for she emerged out of the doorway. Catherine once more flattened herself to the wall, only daring to breathe again once the maid had gone far enough that she was certain she would not be seen. When the cook in the kitchen started to hum a soft tune, Catherine peered around the doorframe. He was lost to his work, kneading fresh dough and singing his merry song. She walked on, darting past the open doorway quickly before he could see her. Reaching for the stairs that led to the top floor, she hastened up as quickly as she could, trying to avoid the steps that she already knew creaked. On the top floor, she peered out of a door, looking up and down for any sign of Lady Georgiana. For a moment, she imagined what her cousin would say if she discovered the scandal. She could practically hear Lady Georgiana's voice, taking on that sharp tone, echoing through the rafters of this great house. What would be worse than the voice would be the icy gaze. She much preferred Lady Georgiana's soft and often humoured smile. Only occasionally would her cousin raise her eyebrows in a little shock or derision, usually when Catherine tripped up or made a spectacle of herself. What would her expression be if she truly knew where I had been this last night? She shuddered as she looked up and down the corridor. Seeing no sign of Lady Georgiana nor a maid, she walked quickly down the hallway, heading for her chamber. Turning the handle, she darted inside and planted her back to the door, looking around the room with a heavy sigh. Her eyes widened when she realised the mess that she had left the room in. The nightgown she had changed into the night before with the maid's help was curled up at the bottom of the bed, and the bed was too neat, showing it hadn't been slept in at all. There was a pile of shoes by the open cupboard door, where Catherine had hunted out a pair of boots for her walk to Dr. Bales. Footsteps sounded in the corridor behind her. That must be the maid. She reached for the laces of the gown and dropped the dress fast, casting it aside so that it fell across the pile of the shoes, conveniently hiding them. She didn't have time to undress out of her undergarments, so she pulled the nightgown on over them and kicked off her shoes into the cupboard. Pulling on the ends of her hair, they fell down out of the hasty updo she had made that morning. Falling back on the bed, she scrambled in it, trying to make the covers as messy as possible, just as the maid knocked on the door. Miss Fitzroy, may I come in? The maid's voice sounded softly from the other side of the door. Yes, Catherine called, laying still and affecting a yawn as the door opened. The maid stumbled on the doorframe as she looked around the room, clearly finding the space in a different state to how she had left it the night before. Is all well? the maid asked with concern. Yes, all is very well, thank you. Catherine attempted to clear her throat, to take on some semblance of nonchalance, though she felt her heart pounding in her chest, fearing the maid would suspect something. Actually, I do have something of a headache, 
Perhaps I could have breakfast served in my chamber this morning. Yes, Miss Fitzroy, of course. The maid bobbed a curtsy and left the room, but not before she cast a glance at the gown that had been dropped over the boots. As she left, Catherine dropped down to the pillows on the bed and exhaled sharply, blowing the loose hair out of her face. I was far too close to discovery then. Chapter 22 Nigel Nigel rubbed his temples as he looked around the room. His head was sore after the night before, though he knew very well it had little to do with the drink Catherine had given him and everything to do with the concoction he had made himself. Once bathed, he sat down on the edge of his bed, leaning forward as he pulled a shirt on over his head. What happened? he whispered aloud, trying to recall every minute of her being here. He felt confident in some parts of the evening, but after he had taken the tea and he'd relaxed in his chair, he was no longer sure what was reality and what was a dream. There seemed to be a black abyss in his mind where a memory should have been. The feeling of waking with Catherine leaning on him made his stomach quell, both with excitement and fear. Was I a perfect gentleman last night? The fear that he may have behaved inappropriately had him moving quickly, changing as fast as he could. He reached for his book, listing his appointments as he finished the tea that he had made in the image of the one Catherine had made the night before. Turning to his appointments, his heart leaped into his mouth when he saw the first name of the day. Lady Georgiana Bingley. God's wounds, he muttered aloud. It felt foolish indeed to go to the house now, when it might yet be discovered that Catherine had not been there for the night. Could he avoid going to the house at all? Could he send word that he was needed elsewhere and attend to his other patients instead? I cannot do that to Lady Georgiana. He shrugged on his tailcoat and reached for his medicine bag, tucking it under his arm as he made his way to the door. It would be idiotic of him to turn his back on any patient, and he had no intention of not checking on a patient just because of his own misdemeanours. His need to protect his patients far outweighed his fear of being discovered with Catherine. I must go, he muttered repeatedly to himself, as he made his way to the door of his apartments, pulling on his hessian boots and attempting to flatten his now damp hair. Just before he left, he glanced back at the chairs where the two of them had been sitting together the night before under the blankets. The blankets were now screwed up in one of the seats. Nigel felt momentary warmth spreading through him, remembering the peaceful look on Catherine's expression and the way he had reached toward her. For one wild minute, he'd felt free of all his worries. He'd been purely happy. Then he'd realised it was morning and reality had returned. What have I done? he whispered as he strode out of the room. What is going on? a voice asked. The door creaked open just as Catherine walked uneasily across the bedchamber. She hadn't been given enough time to sort out the room, or her own clothes. She had only managed to tip all the shoes back in the cupboard, leaving her gown still on the floor and her undergarments beneath her night rail. She turned around, seeing Lady Georgiana standing in the doorway with the maid behind her, who was blushing a deep shade of red. Are you unwell? Lady Georgiana asked, stepping into the room toward Catherine. Yes, a little, I fear. Catherine was so jittery with her nerves that she at least didn't have to act the part of being shaken. Her hands fidgeted together in front of her, and her breathing was laboured. I asked if I could have breakfast in my chamber. I think it wise I rest this morning. Here, let me see. Lady Georgiana walked toward her, striking her cane across the floor as she moved. She placed the back of her hand to Catherine's temple, her brow furrowing deeply in concentration. Hmm, you are a little warm. I am. Catherine presumed it was her hasty dash through the house that had made her body heated. What the... Georgiana looked down at what Catherine was wearing. Catherine shifted the sleeves of her gown but knew there was little she could do to hide the undergarments that peeked through the night rail. Did you not undress properly last night? I... I fell asleep like this. You did not. 
the maid stepped forward. She blushed an even richer shade of crimson as Lady Georgiana turned to look at her, as if she feared speaking out of turn. Forgive me, my lady, but I prepared Miss Fitzroy for bed properly last night. The room was neat and tidy. I plaited her hair too. Catherine forgot this and reached for the loose locks now, pushing them behind her shoulders. She was perfectly ready for bed when I left, the maid whispered, clearly confused. I... I struggled to sleep. Catherine hastened to explain. Yes, Eloise is right. She prepared me for bed, but my headache soon came on. Finding I could not sleep, I dressed again and went to the library. I tried reading for a bit, but I'm afraid it didn't help. I came back to bed and found I was too tired to undress myself properly. I am sorry, Eloise. I have made quite a mess of this chamber. The maid still frowned in confusion. Rather than saying anything more, she went to tidy things up. She snatched up the gown first, though her nose wrinkled when she got near it, and she recoiled a little from it. What is it? Georgiana took the gown from the maid and sniffed it herself, her eyes going wide. An unusual smell, Catherine. One would think you had been smoking a pipe with this smile. There's something else to it, too. Something acrid. Catherine stiffened, thinking of Dr. Bale's rooms the night before. His pipe had been discarded on the side again, filling the air with the scent of smoke. The acrid smell must have come from that strange brandy and chemical concoction he had made himself. I... I knocked something over in my garderobe. She pointed toward the door that led to her garderobe. I cleaned it up again, she added hastily, before the maid could cross to the garderobe to investigate. I am sorry. I seem to have made quite a mess last night. Hmm. Well, one can do strange things when they are not well. Despite Georgiana's words, she didn't seem to believe them. Her head was cocked to the side, and her eyes didn't blink as she watched Catherine. Come sit, dear. You do look a little heated and flustered. Thank you. Catherine moved to the edge of the bed and sat down, her hands repeatedly fumbling and fidgeting in her lap. Georgiana passed the gown to the maid, urging her in a whisper to send it to the laundry to get rid of the smell. Fetch some tea for Catherine too, please, Georgiana pleaded. I shall sit with her for a minute. Slowly she sat on the stool in front of the vanity table as the maid left. When the door closed behind her, Georgiana rested two palms on her walking cane and raised her eyebrows. Well? Well? Catherine repeated, her fidgeting growing worse. Out with it. There's something more to this than just a headache. One does not wander the house at night to such an extent, reading and knocking things over in the garderobe just because of a headache. I... Catherine inhaled deeply, knowing there was one way to end the conversation. A particular subject matter was a way to explain odd behaviour, and with so few people willing to talk of it in front of others, it usually ended discussion right away. I do have a headache, cousin, yet I'm also struggling with the moon's cycle. She lowered her head, avoiding Georgiana's gaze. I am in some discomfort, and I hoped that wandering could distract me from the pain. I was wrong? Ah, I see. Georgiana stood at once. Just as Catherine had hoped, Georgiana did not ask again what was wrong. Come then, I think it best that you rest in bed for a while. She flickered her fingers toward the head of the bed where Catherine had puffed up all the pillows. I'll arrange for your breakfast to be brought to you here. Thank you. Catherine raised herself from the edge of the bed. Before she could move to the other end, though, the door opened. The tea must have already been brewed downstairs, for Eloise had returned quickly indeed, with a steaming teapot on a tray. She bobbed a curtsy and crossed toward the table that was by the head of the bed. Eloise, Catherine will have her breakfast in her chamber after all. She is suffering a little from, well, you know, her time. It comes to us all. Well, it did in my younger days, though not any more. Georgiana laughed at her own jest. Catherine caught the maid's eye as Eloise nearly dropped the tray in surprise. As her maid, it would be Eloise's responsibility to bring flannels and wash clothes that could be bound into pads to stem such a flow. 
Catherine held her breath as Eloise clearly knew that she had not been asked to bring such a thing the night before. The crockery on the tray chinked a little loudly as she looked up, catching Catherine's eye in confusion. I thought... She began but said no more. Oh, excuse me. Catherine sat down on the edge of the bed. Not knowing what else to do, and only feeling that she had to distract Georgiana at once, she covered her face with her hands. I fear I feel dizzy. How strange. This month is taking its toll on you, is it not? Georgiana took her shoulder. Come, sit back against the pillows and rest your head. Perhaps the tea will help to revive you. Thank you. Catherine sat back uneasily, lifting her head enough to watch Eloise. At least now the maid was rushing to her task, pouring out the tea and no longer looking at Catherine with pure suspicion. Here, drink this. Georgiana took the tea from the maid and thrust it into Catherine's hands. We have all had our bad days when it comes to such a thing. Sometimes it takes a strangling hold on our bodies. She sat down on the edge of the bed, huffing loudly. A strange thing, is it not? Very, Catherine agreed with a nod, startled that Georgiana was willing to talk of such private things at all. I have often wondered at the science behind it, the biological function. Her nose screwed up. My late husband believed it was God's way of showing women were sinful creatures. He said that? Catherine spluttered, her jaw falling slack. She had read enough in Arabella's notes to know something of the science. He did. Fortunately, I did not believe him. Georgiana looked at Catherine, her frown growing greater. You do look quite ill, dear. She placed her hand to Catherine's brow again. Hmm. I think it best we get someone to take a look at you. That will not be necessary. I will be quite well after a short rest. Catherine said hurriedly, fearing she knew where Georgiana was going with this. A horse neighed close by, and Eloise darted to the window, peering down at the drive. Is that him? Georgiana called to her. Yes, my lady. Dr. Bale has just arrived for his appointment with you. Excellent. Georgiana stood from her seat on the bed. Then he shall see Catherine before me. What? Catherine spluttered, nearly dropping her teacup and spilling tea all over her hand. Chapter 23 Nigel I beg your pardon? Nigel stared at the butler, certain for a minute that he had imagined the request, for it could not possibly be true. Lady Georgiana has asked that you examine Miss Fitzroy first this morning, the butler said again if you would follow me. The butler bowed his head, then turned away, encouraging Nigel to follow him. Yet Nigel didn't follow straight away. He was too shocked. He picked up his medicine bag and scrambled to catch up, hurrying through the hallway. This can't be happening. It cannot be. He was shown up the stairwell, with the butler only glancing back at him on occasion to check he was there. Partway up the stairs, Nigel heard sounds across the landing. He looked up to see a maid leaving one of the bedchambers. She had a deep frown on her face and shook her head as she moved down the corridor, clearly perplexed. Nigel walked across the landing, following the butler to the same bedchamber where the maid had just left. What are her symptoms? Nigel asked the butler, hoping to at least get some idea of what was happening in advance. Has she fallen ill since she left me this morning? Did she have some incident in the road? Guilt raged within him. Damn the consequences of being seen with her at such an early hour. He should have escorted her himself to make sure nothing happened to her. I do not know, Doctor. The butler shook his head. All I know is that Lady Georgiana was most insistent you see Miss Fitzroy first. He knocked on the door, standing tall as he waited for it to open. When the door opened, Nigel held his breath, waiting to see the face of Miss Fitzroy. Instead, Lady Georgiana was the one who answered the door, with her walking cane at her side. Her eyes darted to Nigel at once. Ah, I am glad you are here, Doctor. Please, come in. What has happened? Nigel asked, 
stepping past the butler and walking into the chamber. Miss Fitzroy? He looked across the room, his concern palpable. When his eyes fell on Catherine, he stilled. For a minute he feared the past would be repeating itself, or God forbid his nightmares were coming true. Catherine was sitting up against the pillows of the bed, her brown hair wild about her shoulders. Her chin jerked up at his entrance, the night rail slipping off her shoulder to reveal the hint of her chemise beneath. To see her so unclothed only made things worse. Nigel clamped down on a tightening in his stomach, forcing his gaze away to look at Lady Georgiana instead. My lady! He encouraged her to speak, desperate for an answer. One minute, Doctor. She purposefully closed the door on the butler, giving them privacy. Please examine my young cousin. She is struggling with some dizziness, a headache and some... other symptoms. She coloured red, clearly nervous to talk of what it was. On the bed, Catherine raised a hand and hid her face in her palm, clearly just as embarrassed by this conversation. Georgiana, please, this is awful enough as it is. Must I have this conversation with Dr. Bale? I wish to be sure you are well, child. The doctor may be able to provide something to help the pain. Lady Georgiana moved to the bed and squeezed her shoulder in comfort. How about this? I shall leave you two to talk alone. The door will be left open so you can have a little privacy, but the butler will stay in the corridor as a distant chaperone. How does that sound? Yes, thank you. Catherine lifted her head from her hand, seeming suddenly excited by the idea. Nigel's brows lifted as he looked at her. The same excitement filled his own stomach at the thought of being alone with her. I need to get a handle on this. At once. He smiled to Lady Georgiana as she passed and walked out of the door. Nigel waited until her footsteps retreated, along with the butlers a little. Then he crossed to the bed as fast as he could, lowering the medicine bag down to the floor. He took a stool and dragged it close to the bed leaning toward Catherine just as she leaned toward him, off the pillows. What has happened? he whispered to her. Was there an incident as you walked home? No. No. Far from it. She shook her head. Then, what is it? He took her head. He meant to take her wrist, to check her pulse and ensure all was well, but in his fumbling gesture, he did what he truly wished to do instead and took hold of her palm. Her gaze shot down toward that grasp. In her shock, she said nothing at all. Catherine? His whispered use of her Christian name made her head snap up again, her gaze meeting his. There is nothing wrong, she assured him. What? This is all some dreadful ruse. Oh dear, I hardly expected it to become so out of control. Her hand slid against his own, and he entwined their fingers together, not truthfully thinking about the inappropriateness of doing this when they were alone together in her chamber. All he wanted was to be closer to her. When I came back to the house this morning, I did not have enough time to change or make the chamber right. To explain my attire, my manner, everything, I told my cousin I had a headache, was a little dizzy, and... She sighed deeply. And? he encouraged her on, and that I was suffering from a woman's usual monthly affliction. She widened her eyes pointedly at him. Nigel couldn't help smiling at the ingenuity of such a lie. Most people avoided talking about such topics. It was a clever way to attempt to stop Lady Georgiana talking about her problems altogether. Yet you are well, Nigel asked, needing to be sure. I am, she assured him, her smile matching his own. It is just that I was so close to being discovered that I was scrambling for lies. She sighed and laid back on the pillows. I am certain Eloise suspects something. The maid, Nigel presumed, watching as Catherine nodded. Nigel felt as if he had been winded, punched squarely in the stomach as he gazed at Catherine and held onto her hand. The night before, she was taking care of him, in a completely illicit situation. Now he had been asked to come and take care of her. Their web of lies was becoming greatly entangled and complicated. If this continued on for much longer, 
then they could both be tossed in scandal. There was more to this fear, though. It was about protecting Catherine from scandal and also protecting himself. Had he not vowed never to care for another woman again? Yet here he was, clinging to her hand as if it was the very thing that kept him alive. I must retreat. I must protect us both. He disentangled his hand from Catherine's. She let her hand drop to her stomach, though she now stared at him, a small frown on her features. Worry not, he assured her in a whisper. I shall tell Lady Georgiana that you are quite well, but just overwhelmed with your new life and all these lessons. I shall prescribe rest. Thank you. Catherine sighed with relief, tipping her head back on the pillows. I do not like lying to my cousin, but it must be done. Yes, it must be, he murmured. He wrung his hands together as he rested his elbows on the edge of the bed. He longed to touch her again, to hold on to her hand, but it would be wrong too, especially now he had made the decision that for both of their sakes they had to retreat from one another. You and I must talk of something else too. He looked at the door, straining to hear for any footsteps. He had to make sure that neither the butler nor the maid was close enough to hear their conversation. There were no sounds at all, encouraging him that they were quite alone. The butler must have taken his place up as chaperone, standing quite far down the hallway. Miss Fitzroy, our lessons must come to an end. He refused to look at her as he said the words, but stared down at his hands instead. Out of the corner of his eye, he was aware of her movement. She hurriedly sat up so fast that one of the pillows fell off the bed. He hurried to catch it, before it could knock against a teacup resting on the table beside her and spill tea everywhere. What? What are you talking about? She hissed in a panicked whisper. He reached behind her, returning the pillow. They must end, he said with resounding firmness. You know it as well as I. Why must they? Her eyes wouldn't rest still. They darted across him, resting on various parts of him. He loved that look, then hated himself for desiring it. I was learning from you. The notes you have given me, all the things you have said, it has helped so much. I shall give you more notes, but this thing must end. Why? she asked again, her voice growing higher in its pitch. He longed to take her hand again. Instead, he sat back on the stool, increasing the distance between them. You know it is for the best. You were nearly caught this morning, he reminded her, gesturing to the position she was in now. I could be more careful in the future. And what happens when you are caught, hmm? His voice was a little sharper than he had intended. She stiffened on the bed. Your good name will be ruined, your reputation, and mine too. No one would employ me as a doctor again, you can guarantee that. But no one need ever know. Catherine, it has to end. The simplicity of his words took the wind out of her. She moved back on the bed, inching away from him her lips hanging open. Where before she had looked pink-cheeked, she was now strangely pale. He longed to reach out and touch that cheek, to offer some sort of comfort, yet he knew he could not. There is more to this, is there not? She looked down at the covers between them. Something you do not wish to speak of. Perhaps, he whispered. He looked down too, finding his hands had clasped together so tightly in his lap that the knuckles had ridged white. I cannot tell her what I feel, but can she see it? It is best we do not talk of this other reason, he murmured, fearing saying the words aloud. Why not? Love is no awful thing to talk of. Her words made him close his eyes. Love is pain, Catherine. It always is. I am right, am I not? she asked her voice breathy as if she was afraid to speak at all. You are in love, Dr. Beale. I... He inhaled deeply and raised his head, meeting Catherine's eye. I am. He waited for her to realise exactly what he meant, staring at her. I do love you, Catherine. God knows how it happened or exactly when, but it happened anyway. And that is why I cannot see you again. 
It is why these lessons must come to an end, for both of our sakes. You understand, do you not? he asked, sitting further back on the stool, staying as far back from her as he could. She said nothing but nodded, then turned her head away. Is that tears? He caught a wetness in her eyes, and then it was gone. Catherine. I understand. Her breath hitched. Please, Dr. Beale, leave me now. If it must end, then let it end at this moment. Nigel slowly stood, looking down at her hand as it rested on the covers. He longed to take that hand, raise it, and kiss the back. But he couldn't cross that boundary now. Instead, he gave way to momentary temptation and brushed the back of his fingers across hers. Then he left swiftly, heading for the bedchamber door. Chapter 24 Nigel The door closed behind Nigel. He leaned against the wall for a few seconds, calming his breath and the jitteriness that threatened to take over. Once he was certain he was in control of his own being, he walked away down the corridor. I cannot believe I just confessed I love her. I can hardly believe it. What must she think of me now? Confessing I love her and then turning my back on her. She must despise me. Nigel's mind ran wild with many thoughts. He no longer could make sense of his own meanderings. All he knew was that he had to divide himself with Catherine. Loving her would merely bring them both pain. He'd been down that road before and he'd vowed not to do it again. Ah, Dr. Bale. Nigel halted at his name. Lady Georgiana stood in the middle of the landing with the butler and the maid at either side of her. Eloise was fidgeting with the apron over her dress, clearly nervous, and Lady Georgiana clutched firmly to her walking cane as she walked forward to meet Nigel. Tell me, how is my cousin? she asked. Fear not for her. Nigel forced himself to smile, despite the pain in his chest. She is quite well, but in need of rest. I think exhaustion from her busy life here, all her lessons and the events of the ton, have taken their toll. The body must be allowed to go through its natural processes at this time. Yes, yes, of course. Lady Georgiana nodded in agreement. I think a day's rest in her chamber is the best thing, then perhaps the next few days should be taken a little easier as she recovers, Nigel suggested. All will be well for her. Thank you, Doctor. I'm comforted by your words already. Excellent. Now shall we attend to our own appointment, my lady? Nigel followed Lady Georgiana downstairs to the garden room where they conducted many of their appointments. He checked her pulse and asked about the fluttering of her heartbeat. He also checked on her wrist that was recovering well once again. Finding Lady Georgiana was in good health, he soon stood to take his leave. Thank you for being so attentive to myself and my cousin, Lady Georgiana said, lifting her chin to meet his gaze. You have given much time to me as of late. I hope your other patients have not suffered because of my need for your attentions. Nigel saw an opportunity in what she was saying. Just as he had told Catherine they had to avoid one another for now, he saw the possibility of dividing them properly. It is for the best, is it not? Soon the season will be over, and Catherine will be returning to Dorset regardless. What would happen then? I'd be broken-hearted anyway when she left. Best to divide us both now before any chance of scandal can befall. My other patients have not suffered from neglect, but I do fear I shall have to attend to them more over the next couple of weeks. Rather than our regular appointments, perhaps we could shift to you sending word if you need me, my lady. Would that be acceptable? he asked. She nodded at once, without hesitation. Of course, Doctor. I thank you for the time you have given me. Always, my lady. He smiled and took her hand. Give my best to your cousin, too. I hope she feels better soon. Lady Georgiana didn't quite let go of his hand, but held on for a few seconds longer, urging him to look her in the eye once more. She will be sorry to lose the pleasure of your company, I'm sure. There have been moments in this house where I thought the two of you enjoyed one another's company very well indeed. 
The knowing smile on Lady Georgiana's face made his stomach quiver. Does she know? Does she suspect? He retrieved his hand from hers and forced an easy smile. Miss Fitzroy has that natural knack of putting many men at ease. I saw at the tea party the other day how men flocked to her. You have done wonders with her lessons, my lady, but if you will forgive me for speaking out of turn. He trailed off, wondering if it was a wise thing to say or not. Go on, doctor, she encouraged with a wave of her hand. Well, I believe Miss Fitzroy has many charms to her character. She draws attention not because of her ladylike manners, but because of her good heart and her humour, he explained, looking down between the two of them, not sure he could meet Lady Georgiana's eye now. I quite agree with you. I only hope that the man who eventually calls for her hand will see her in the same way. I wish you luck with finding such a suitor for her. Nigel offered a deep bow. Good day, my lady. Good day, Dr. Beale. As Nigel left the room, he felt the keenness of Lady Georgiana's stare on his back, but he didn't turn to meet it again. He feared if he did, she would see something in his expression he was trying to hide, that envy, the fear that Catherine would indeed find another man some day. It is right that she should. Catherine is not mine to claim. Catherine. Emily. He loves this Emily. Catherine thought the same words for what had to be the hundredth time over the past five days. Ever since Dr. Beale had confessed to her that he was in love, she had felt crushed. He loves her. That is why he wishes to part company with me. He'd clearly seen her affection for him growing, and fearing scandal or being forced into a marriage that he did not want, he'd urged their lessons to come to an end. This is unbearable, Catherine muttered, as she turned the books over in the library once more. In front of her were all of the notes she was making on the works that Dr. Beale had sent to her. Despite his assurance the other day that he would still send things to her to read, nothing new had arrived at the house. She was left with all that he had already sent. She sifted through the books, finding something strange in the stack before her. Oddly, she could not find Arabella's book. She could only presume she had accidentally placed it on one of the many shelves in this library. She stood from her seat to find it, yet dizziness washed over her, and she sat down again, tipping her head back so far that she rested it on the shelves behind her. Catherine? A familiar voice called from the doorway. Yes? Catherine opened her eyes, trying to persuade that dizziness away as she looked at her cousin. Georgiana walked through the doorway with a stack of the women's periodical hooked under her arm. Her head was cocked to the side, and she once more reminded Catherine of some sort of bird of prey, examining intently. You do look ill, child. These last few days you have grown even more listless than before. You were dizzy just now, were you not? I am fine. Catherine forced herself to smile. I am simply not sleeping well at the moment. That is all. A lack of sleep can be a sign of something worrying. Georgiana crossed the room and put the periodicals down on the table in front of Catherine, covering up all the medical books. It is not, I assure you. Catherine knew she couldn't tell her cousin that her sleeplessness was because of a broken heart. That would lead the trail straight back to Dr. Bale. He loves another. Meanwhile, all this time I was falling in love with him. Oh, what a cruel world. Is it time for another of our lessons? Catherine sat forward, trying to be attentive. Yes, Lady Georgiana sat down beside her. I wish to show you something in the magazine that arrived this morning, something that I think shall interest you greatly. She opened the pages of the magazine and thrust it toward Catherine, pointing down to a particular article. Mrs. Harriet Coutts. Catherine frowned as she read the name at the top of the article. Who is this? Have you never heard of her? Lady Georgiana smiled at the idea. She is a woman who has moved circles in life, Catherine. She started as an actress in Drury Lane, then married the famous banker, Thomas Coutts. Since his death, she has run Coutts Bank. She is a banker, Catherine. A woman? A banker? Catherine lifted the magazine closer to her face again, her eyes darting down over the page. 
She read the article as hurriedly as she could, taking in the life story of Mrs. Harriet Coutts. She is a remarkable woman. The more she read, the more fascinated Catherine became. Learning of this woman who was not only celebrated as a beauty and great socialite, but a sound businesswoman who had taken on her husband's business and brought it great success. Why show me this? Well, I have seen over the last few days that our usual lessons have not inspired much interest from you. Georgiana nodded toward her. You have been listless, overtired. When I endeavoured to show you some new dances yesterday, you yawned so many times I thought you might fall asleep when you were standing. I am sorry, Catherine said quietly, trying to stifle another yawn as it threatened to overtake her. A headache was growing across her temple, and she rubbed it with the palm of her hand, trying her best to soothe the ache. I'm trying to concentrate, I just feel so... She didn't have the words to describe it, so she shrugged instead. Who knew one's heart had such power over the body? She'd never felt this way before, never been reduced so much to melancholy. I will be well, Catherine assured her cousin. This I find very interesting. She gestured down to the article. She sounds an impressive woman. Oh, she is. I had the good fortune to meet her last season at a ball. Lady Georgiana smiled broadly. She had the command of the whole room in a way I have never seen another woman do. What struck me most was her canniness, how aware she was of the people around her. She knew well enough when people were attentive to her, just in the hope of ingratiating themselves. Follow in this woman's footsteps if you can, Catherine. Always be aware of what is around you and make the most of the hand you have been dealt in life. How funny. Catherine laughed softly as she looked at the portrait that had been printed on the pages of the magazine. Mrs. Harriet Coutts was indeed a great beauty, tall and impressive, with thick black hair curled around her statuesque face. She was dealt a fortunate hand indeed, I'd say. I was dealt a hand that made me clumsy and at times foolish. You, foolish. Georgiana took the magazine from her. I do not think you foolish, not at all. I think I am. Catherine sighed and looked at the other periodicals resting on the table. She picked up one of these magazines and flicked through the pages, doing her best to concentrate on the words. But her eyes fluttered closed with the strain of her headache. You are not well, child. Georgiana reached for her shoulder. It is merely a headache. Catherine yawned. If I could have a good night's sleep, I am sure all will be well again. Hmm. Georgiana stood and walked away, calling out for the butler at once. Catherine flinched at the sharp and loud voice, letting her eyes close once more. Lowering the periodical down to her lap, she breathed deeply, trying to will the pain in her head away. If I could just sleep peacefully, if I could just stop seeing him in my sleep, it was what happened every time she laid down at night. She replayed the moment in her mind that Dr. Beale had told her he was in love. He had looked her in the eye as he had said it, clearly wishing for there to be no misunderstanding between them. He loves Emily. Send for him at once. Go, deliver this note. Georgiana was calling to the butler. Where shall I find him? If is he not at his apartments, then ask around. He may be visiting other patients. If you truly struggle, go and see his brother Grace Church Street. He may be able to locate him for you. Who is she looking for? Catherine raised her head and opened her eyes again. Georgiana returned to her, striking the cane so firmly against the floorboards that Catherine flinched with every thud. Come, child. Georgiana took her arm. I think it best you go to bed. No. I will not sleep there, I am certain of it, Catherine insisted, laying the periodicals down on the table again. Very well, then come with me. Perhaps there is another way we can make you sleep. Georgiana led the way to the garden room. Amongst the wicker chairs and the potted palms, there was a longer wicker chaise long. Georgiana nodded toward it. Lay down. I shall sit here close by, Georgiana assured her with a smile. Thank you. 
You are very kind to me, cousin, Catherine whispered. It is what family does, dear. Georgiana patted her hand just before Catherine released her and sat down on the chaise longue. As you have looked after me, it is now my turn to care for you. Lay back. Catherine reclined on the chaise longue, curling her legs up underneath her. Georgiana sat down beside her. As Catherine closed her eyes, the silence felt deafening. In that quiet, all she saw was Dr. Bailey's face again as he told her he was in love. Then something changed. Georgiana began to hum. It was a soft tune, one that Catherine had often heard her mother play on the piano back home. Slowly, the image of Dr. Bale left her mind and she saw her mother instead, playing the piano with a smile on her face. At last, Catherine fell asleep. Chapter 25 Nigel Lady Georgiana Nigel opened the door of his apartment and nearly dropped the books in his grasp. Seeing Lady Georgiana in this part of London was not the only surprising thing, but she also seemed to be alone, dressed finely in her great gown with a cloak hanging loosely from her shoulder. What are you doing here, my lady? Is something wrong? He opened the door, pleading with her to come inside. Nothing is wrong with me. Though you have been neglecting your duty, Dr. Beale, I sent for you two days ago for my cousin, and yet you have not come. She strode into his rooms, her gaze dancing quickly across the space as she looked around at his books and the various things he had left across his table. You need to tidy up, Doctor. How do you find anything in this mess? My apologies. I get caught up in my work and sometimes I do not have the time to tidy. He tried to shift some of the stacks of books off a chair so Lady Georgiana could sit down. Instead, she chose one of the armchairs, her eyes looking around the chairs nearby, her brow ridged. Why have you not come? To see your cousin. Nigel knew what this was about. Two days ago, a letter had found him at his brother's house, requesting his assistance to check on Catherine. How could I possibly go? I know what this is about. Catherine had to be feigning the symptoms again. She had explained to him the ruse the week before. It made sense she was continuing it now in the hope of seeing him again, but he could not give in. He had to be strong. He couldn't see her, or he feared how weak his heart would be. Yes, Georgiana said sharply, moving her cane in front of her and leaning forward out of her chair, placing a lot of her weight on it. Why have you not come? My cousin is in need of help. I believed the affliction to be the same as last time. I had every intention of coming eventually, yet I have had other patients to see too. He shifted some more of his books from another chair, intending to sit down when he noticed Lady Georgiana's rather harsh stare. He looked down at what he was wearing. Since he had said goodbye to Catherine the week before, he'd not looked after himself as well as he usually did. His clothes were messy, his hair and moustache too. If you'd excuse me, I'll just tidy myself up a little. He left her in his sitting room and went to his chamber, attending to the messy state of his cravat and pulling on his tailcoat. He flattened his hair with his comb and then returned to the other room, seeing that Lady Georgiana was reaching down to the floor. He thought she could be picking something up, but as he stopped beside her she said nothing about it and he could see nothing in her hand. What is wrong with your cousin? he asked, trying to remain businesslike. She is not sleeping, well, very little indeed. Lady Georgiana shook her head. I have only managed to make her nap on occasion in the garden room singing to her. She suffers headaches and dizziness. It's probably all because she is not sleeping. Exhaustion can take heavy tolls on the body. Then come and see her and tell me so for yourself once you have examined her. Lady Georgiana moved sharply to her feet. Before him, Lady Georgiana had quite transformed. There was no trace of a smile, nothing, only a harsh look with her lips flattened together. Now, he said in a quiet voice, wishing to be clear. Now. She turned and walked toward the door, her walking cane leading the way. My carriage awaits us both in the road. 
I must insist you come now. She hesitated in the doorway, looking back at him, that same harsh look in her eyes. I will pay you for your time, of course. You need not worry about that. Nigel reached for his medicine bag and tucked it under his arm. I shall follow with my horse. No. What? Nigel flicked his head around in surprise. Lady Georgiana seemed haughtier than before, the muscles in her neck strained as she lifted her chin high. You shall come in my carriage. It can return you here later when needed. It will be faster, Doctor. Come, at once. You must see my cousin. She led the way out of the room. Nigel did not protest again. Fearing he had truly upset Lady Georgiana, a lady he not only respected but deeply cared for in his work as a doctor, he hurried to follow her out. He hastened to lock the door and scrambled down the stairs to catch up with her. As they stepped out of the building together, Lady Georgiana led the way down the narrow lane, heading to the main road. At this early hour there were only a few people wandering to and four. They all stepped out of the way when they saw Lady Georgiana, allowing her to pass easily, clearly judging by her clothes and the way she carried herself that she was a woman of some importance. When they reached the main road, Lady Georgiana stepped up into the carriage quickly. Nigel followed and sat on the bench opposite her. How have you been, my lady? He attempted to make conversation as the carriage took off. There wasn't a trace of a smile on Lady Georgiana's face as she stared back at him. Those pale blue eyes seemed icier than he had ever seen them before. I have been better. My health is well enough, but now, now I have many concerns. She made it clear she would say nothing more as she turned to the window and looked out beyond to the busy streets. Nigel was left alone with his thoughts, spiralling out of control. Oh God, Catherine, what happens now? Catherine. Georgiana, Catherine called to her cousin as she heard a door shut in the distant regions of the house. She had not long finished her breakfast and was sitting in the garden room, looking through one of the books Dr. Bale had given to her. She'd woken with yet another headache, something that was hardly surprising after her poor night's sleep. She had spent much of her breakfast wondering when she could go home to Dorset. She presumed part of the problem was being in London, knowing that Dr. Bale was so close, yet so distant from her in terms of his heart. That was a great torture. At least in Dorset, she could be with her family again. They might be able to offer some distraction. This way. Georgiana's voice sounded down the corridor, firm, almost angry, in a way that Catherine had not heard before. Georgiana, Catherine called again and sat forward on the chaise longue. She hadn't bothered to ask the maid to put her hair into an updo that morning, so it was loose around her shoulders, but as they were expecting no visitors that day, she had presumed it wouldn't matter. In here. Now Georgiana's commands to someone made Catherine realise this had been an error on her part. Someone else is here. The door opened and Georgiana led the way in. Behind her walked in a tall figure. Catherine glanced toward him, then jerked her head completely in his direction as she saw Dr. Beale enter. His eyes shot to meet hers, and he didn't walk far into the room. The distance he imposed between them across the space of the room made her feel quite nauseous. Dr. Bale. She slowly stood off the chaise longue and dropped a curtsy, as she knew she should do. She had to pray it showed him she was willing to be formal between them and would not be so intimate with him as she had been before. Miss Fitzroy. He bowed to her too. Your cousin tells me you are not well. I am just not sleeping, that is all. Catherine sat down again, avoiding looking at him. She fidgeted with the book in her lap instead. No? Are you certain there is nothing more wrong? Georgiana said with fierceness. She dropped her cane. It landed on the chair behind her. Then she tucked her hand into her reticule and pulled out something small and gold that glittered in the summer sunshine streaming in through the window. She held up one of the pearl earrings that Arabella had given Catherine. Oh, God. I lost them. Catherine stared slack-jawed at the earning. She had remembered taking them off, 
and since then she'd had no wish to put them back on, for she didn't feel as if she deserved to wear anything so fine. Now she abruptly remembered where she had taken them off and covered her mouth. Dr. Bale, care to explain why my cousin's earning was lodged in the side of your chair in your apartment? Georgiana turned sharply to face him, holding the earring higher in the air. Catherine could find no voice, just as the doctor couldn't either. He stood as still as a statue, as if he couldn't believe the proof before his eyes. Catherine. Georgiana changed tact and flicked her head around to face Catherine instead. Yes, yes, you may well look shocked indeed. I am shocked too. More so than I can possibly declare. Her voice was growing louder now. Catherine backed up across the chaise longue as Georgiana moved toward her. She dropped the earring into Catherine's lap and she fumbled to pick it up again. Catherine, you have been in his apartment, have you not? I... yes. It is not what you think, Catherine managed to utter, but Georgiana strode away. She hurried to pick up her cane off a nearby chair, clearly needing it again. She could have sat down, but she didn't. Instead, she used the cane to help her march around the room, clearly restless. No, because at present my mind is wild with ideas. I have discovered the truth. God, what a truth to uncover in this fashion. She halted at the far side of the room and turned to face the two of them. Not only have you two been meeting in secret in such a scandalous fashion. She paused long enough to cast a resoundingly belittling glare in the doctor's direction. Yet I fear I also know the secret behind your illness, Catherine. Oh God, how can she know? Does she know my heart is broken? Catherine hung her head and fidgeted with the earring, fearing what her aunt and mother would think of her now if they were in this room. Would they despair of her too? Would they rant and rage at her? Catherine let the earring sit in the palm of her hand, feeling strangely small compared to the beauty of the pearl and the small gold dangly chain. I can scarcely think of uttering these words. Georgiana raised her hand and covered her face. Yet, if my cousin is with child, Doctor, I need to know so at once so I can make necessary arrangements for her care. With child? Dr. Bale spluttered and stepped forward, kicking the door to the room shut behind him, clearly in fear of them being overhead. What? Catherine scrambled to get to her feet. Georgiana, I am not with child. Georgiana looked at her, a single eyebrow lifted, as if in disbelief. You deny it? Vehemently, Catherine insisted. Yes, I saw Dr. Bale in secret, but nothing so ungentlemanly or scandalous ever took place between us. I pray you do not believe that of me now, nor of him. If you wish me to believe that, Georgiana paused and sat in her usual seat, her weight forward with both hands on the end of her cane. Then I suggest you start talking now and explain exactly what has taken place between the two of you. Chapter 26 Catherine, Catherine, Georgiana nodded at her. Speak. Catherine looked at Dr. Beale first. He was red in the face, restless and clearly very afraid as he turned in a circle, his hands in his hair. Catherine gulped, knowing that she was the reason that his good reputation as a doctor was now at risk. I asked him for lessons. What? Georgiana asked sharply. Catherine reached for the chaise long behind her, where she had left one of the books Dr. Beale sent to her. She also snatched up the notebook where she was making her own notes. She crossed the room toward Georgiana and dropped to her knees in front of her cousin, handing her the books. I wish to be a healer, cousin. You are not making any sense, child. Georgiana's voice shook as she took the books, looking between them. I wish to be a healer, to help people as Dr. Beale does, as my aunt, the Duchess of Gordon, does back home. The words came fast now, escaping Catherine in a rush. Meeting your friends, the ladies of the periodical, I saw the possibility that I could pursue such an ambition. Maybe it is mad, foolish, yes, but it was worth a chance, surely. They had all achieved their aims in life. So I went to Dr. Beale. She glanced back at him, feeling her heart ache as she looked at him. 
He refused to look at her now, with his hands still in his hair as he looked out of the window and into the garden. She couldn't help wondering who this Emily was that he loved so much. Was she another patient? Perhaps an acquaintance from the ton? I asked him for lessons and he agreed. This is one of the books he sent to me to help me with my learning. Catherine pointed down Oat the book in her cousin's grasp. You can see the notes I have made myself. Georgiana flicked between the pages. She glanced up at the doctor, her face sterner than before. Dr. Bale, go to the library, if you please. I shall come to you there in a minute to talk in private. Yes, my lady. Dr. Bale bowed and left the room as hurriedly as he could, his face crimson red. Catherine hoped to catch his eye before he left, but it was not to be. He was gone all too fast. As the door closed behind him, she turned back to Georgiana. Please believe me, she begged. Having you down on your knees before me is testament to your strength of feeling, Georgiana muttered as she looked between the two books. Though it will take a little more yet to convince me. She looked sharply at Catherine. Do you swear it? Do you swear with everything you have that nothing more ever passed between you and the doctor? Catherine inhaled deeply, knowing how much she had longed for something more to happen between her and Dr. Bale, this was hard to say. Yet at least she could be completely honest with her cousin. I give you my solemn vow, she said with a deep voice. Nothing more has ever passed between us. Dr. Beale has been a perfect gentleman. Georgiana nodded wordlessly and sat straight. She laid the two books in her lap, her hands haphazardly fidgeting with them, before she abruptly shifted them to a table nearby, as if she wanted nothing to do with them. He has not been a perfect gentleman. Oh, Catherine, I know him to be a good man, but a gentleman would have known that giving you lessons is highly improper. He should not have said yes. He was trying to be kind. Is it kind to risk your name? Georgiana looked harshly at Catherine. No, far from it. Let us accept the facts, Catherine. I have always known that Dr. Bale puts patients and the sick above everything else. It is something I have admired about him for many years, but this shows me just how dangerous such an attitude is. His wish to help you and the sick people you could have attended has risked you both. How many times have you been to his apartment? Actually, do not tell me that. I fear the answer. She covered her face, her hand shaking. Once was enough to risk being seen. If you have been seen, then whispers could be spreading already. Oh God, do you not see the danger here, Catherine? She lowered her hand. Your reputation. It could be torn to shreds even as we speak. No one saw me there. You cannot guarantee that, can you? Georgiana leaned forward. Words failed Catherine as she sat back on her haunches, realising that Georgiana was right. As careful as she had been, there was no way to be certain. I am afraid we must take action. Georgiana sniffed as if she held back tears. Catherine strained to see her eyes, but she could see no trace of wetness in Georgiana's blue gaze. She was a lady who was always in full control, even now when faced with scandal. We must do what we can to avoid any possibility of rumours spreading. I'm sorry to say it, Catherine, but you know as well as I what must happen next. Catherine nodded, knowing what words were to come now, even without Georgiana having to utter them. You must return to Dorset. Catherine gulped around a sudden lump in her throat. Minutes ago she had been hoping for such an outcome, but after having a brief glimpse of Dr. Beale again, she realised how foolish her heart had been. Despite all her heartbreak over the last few days, a part of her had been holding on to the hope of seeing him again. From today, I will not see him any more. I shall make the arrangements, Georgiana said hurriedly. You shall leave for Dorset tomorrow. Nigel. Lady Georgiana. Nigel stood to his feet from the chair he'd chosen in the library. With his stomach knotted, his hands repeatedly fidgeted with the handle of his leather case. He couldn't settle, not for a single second, 
It had been hard enough to sit as he waited nervously, figuring out what to say. Now, Lady Georgiana was returning to the room. The thought of being still was impossible. Please, allow me to explain. Pray do not. Lady Georgiana waved a hand in dismissal at him as she closed the door behind her. The tightening in his stomach grew worse as she refused to look at him. Instead, she strode further into the room, her walking stick clattering against the floorboards, her chin turned away. For so long, he had considered her a friend as well as a patient. He knew now that it had all come to an end. She would never trust me as her doctor again. I cannot deny my disappointment in you, Dr. Bale. She halted a few steps away from him, her eyes on the window and the garden beyond. Her bony fingers rested on the walking stick in front of her, and she didn't move them, unlike Nigel, whose fingers constantly fidgeted. I know I have not covered myself in glory these last few weeks, but I beg you, allow me to explain. Catherine has done that already on your behalf. Strangely, I do believe her. Fortunately, Catherine has an innocent soul beneath all her mischief. I can tell when she is lying to me, and I know in this regard she is not. Lady Georgiana angled her head, just enough to look over her shoulder at him. Nigel flinched at the power of that icy blue stare connecting with him. Maybe you were only her tutor, Doctor, but you must realise I question your motives. She raised her eyebrows. I never... You had a young woman alone in your apartments, a woman who I have seen countless times you had a connection with. There was a spark between you, just as I have observed in many couples of the ton before. But you wish to claim you never acted on it? If I could speak, yes. Nigel instantly regretted his words as Lady Georgiana's eyes narrowed. Forgive me, he muttered hurriedly. Yes, I cannot deny I have a... Sincere admiration for your cousin. Even as he said the words, they felt meek in comparison to what he felt. What he did nurture for Catherine was certainly stronger than an admiration, but he was hardly going to declare that to Lady Georgiana now. Yet I have never acted inappropriately towards your cousin. I endeavoured to help her, to teach her. The friendship that formed between us was natural because of it. Then I speak to that part of your friendship now. Lady Georgiana turned to fully face him. Your upbringing, your father's lessons, your brother's too. You must know as well as any other man in the ton that the connection between the pair of you is now at risk of scandal. If Catherine was seen going to your apartments, she paused momentarily, shuddering. Then her reputation could be ruined by nightfall. I would not let that happen. Nigel stepped forward with sudden eagerness. And how do you intend to stop it? Lady Georgiana quizzed, knowingly. It cannot be stopped. Whispers of these kind can only be quelled, but they cannot be halted completely. Catherine is to return to Dorset tomorrow. She is to go home? So soon? Nigel's voice quietened. But it is for the best. If she is not here to whisper about then any such mischief-makers will feel less temptation. I suggest the same about you, Doctor, not just for my cousin's reputation, but your own. If you were to stay in London and this news was to break, whispers of your professional integrity would abound. You know that, do you not? She waited for an answer, her face angled to the side. I do. Nigel's voice was small as he looked down at the medical case in his hands. It wasn't something he wanted to consider. Perhaps the last few minutes in this room, he'd acknowledged it was possible he'd have to leave, but now it was presented before him. He didn't want to take it. Can I do it? Can I leave? He would be leaving all his patients behind, turning his back on them, some when they needed him most, including Lady Georgiana. Then he thought of the other he would be parted from. He thought of not seeing Catherine again, and his chest ached. He shifted his weight between his feet, struggling for words. For her sake, and your own, I think it best we separate you both from this city and those that will whisper. There must be some place you can go, Doctor. Something you can do for a while to avoid this place, Lady Georgiana went on. Yes, 
he spoke eventually, working hard to keep his voice level. I was offered a position as a military doctor some time ago by an old friend. It's an offer I could reconsider. Excellent, yes, that is quite perfect. Lady Georgiana nodded, more to herself than him, as she turned away. I hope you know that urging you away is not a decision I make lightly. I have come to rely on your sound advice these last few years. I will be sorry to leave your service under this cloud, Nigel accepted, hoping she believed the genuine words. I shall ensure I have left enough medicines for you when I leave. I can also brief another doctor on your condition, so they are brought up to speed as soon as possible. As always, Dr. Bale thinking of others. Lady Georgiana sat down in the seat he had not long vacated. She turned interested eyes on him, narrowed in their curiousness. Once more I find myself baffled as to what it is you are truly thinking right now, truly feeling what you are afraid to talk of. A strange silence descended between them as Nigel shifted once more. He could not talk about what he felt. To do so would be laying his heart open. He was too used to heartbreak now, too used to pain. He knew the best course of action at once. He could not speak of it. I must keep my cards close to my chest. I have already behaved inappropriately to your family. I will not sully that further by preying on your time any longer. Nigel bowed to Lady Georgiana. Please know that I wish the best for you and your cousin, Lady Georgiana. Indeed I do. Her lips flickered into the smallest of smiles as he straightened up. Then it was gone, and he wondered if he had imagined it. I shall miss your good company, Doctor. Yet it is for the best. Take care of yourself. And you, my lady. He bowed his head one more time and turned to leave the library. He walked hurriedly through the house, suddenly feeling a desperation to be out of this house. If he had to leave London, if he would never be permitted to see Catherine again, if he had to become an army doctor, then let it happen now. Let him be far away from here, so he wouldn't have to suffer the pain of actually removing himself. He hastened outside where Lady Georgiana's carriage waited to return him home. He stopped by the door, his sudden vigour failing him as he felt eyes in the back of his head. Turning on his heel, his gaze searched the windows. There you are. In one of the upstairs chamber windows stood Catherine. She leaned against the window sill, watching him with tears on her cheeks. She raised her hand and offered the smallest of waves. Nigel indulged in a sudden fantasy of breaking back into the house, of running up the stairs and embracing Catherine in his arms, whispering to her how he hated seeing her in pain. I cannot. I can offer her nothing, only scandal now. He bowed his head to her, in a way he hoped that showed to her the true depths of his respect. Then he turned to leave. When he closed the carriage door and blocked out the view of Catherine, he felt sick and leaned forward, burying his face in his hands. When he returned home, Nigel hastened to the task of packing at once, not wishing to drag it out. He wrote a letter to his friend in the army, who had once offered him the position and asked if the offer was still open. As he walked around his apartment, packing up various books, he heard something tinkle as he kicked it across the floor of his sitting room. Stopping, Nigel bent down and reached for the gold glittering thing that he had kicked. It was tiny with a small chain and a pearl droop. It was Catherine's other earring. He enclosed it in his palm holding tightly onto the jewel. Chapter 27 Catherine Oh God, I am not ready for this, Catherine whispered as the carriage came to a halt. She thought her heart would be lifted to see her home again. It was as beautiful as ever, with ivy around the door and the grand estate stretching beyond the walls. The formal gardens could be glimpsed from her position, the white roses shining in the afternoon sunlight. She could even see her father at a distance, Horatio, as he walked the grounds with his steward and his two dogs. When the carriage halted, Horatio stopped too and turned to look at the carriage, his happy smile slipping to a frown. They hadn't yet been told of her return. Instead, Catherine brought a letter in her grasp, one she was to give to her mother to read. 
Catherine hurried down out of the carriage, dropping her feet to the drive. When Horatio saw her, he smiled once again. He left the two dogs with his steward and ran across the open ground. Catherine, he called happily. When he reached her, Catherine dropped both her reticule and her cousin's letter, grasping for her father in a keen embrace. Ah, how I have missed you. He held her tightly and rested his cheek on her forehead. How are you, my child? Catherine couldn't find her voice. There was something so warm, so comforting about being in her father's arms after such heartache that she simply held on to him tighter. Horatio laughed and rocked her from side to side in their embrace, in a way he hadn't done for a few years now, since she was a child. Yes, I can see you miss me too. When her breath hitched, he pulled back from the embrace and took her shoulders. What is it, Catherine? What has happened? Catherine couldn't form words, her eyes filled with tears. When the vision of her father became blurred, Horatio gave her comfort in a way that only a parent could. He hugged her again and she clung on to him, burying herself and trying to hide in that embrace. Horatio? Who is it? Clara's voice came from the doorway. Catherine! With sudden excitement, Clara ran out of the house. Catherine lifted her head enough to peer at her mother, though she held her breath, fearing what would come next. Her mother would be so disappointed when she read Georgiana's letters. It was what Catherine had tried to do for so long please her mother, rather than be a disappointment to her. Yet she had failed in that task. My mother will despair of me for this. I am not the fine daughter I should be. Fearing the sadness that would come, Catherine turned and embraced her mother next, wanting that moment of love before it disappeared into disappointment. Clara held her back tightly, whispering how she had missed her. Still, Catherine said nothing, though she saw out of the corner of her eye that her father found the letter on the floor. He lifted it slowly and passed it to Clara when he saw it was addressed to his wife. Perhaps this will explain why our daughter is struggling for words. Clara took the letter and released Catherine. Fearing what would come next, Catherine allowed her father to take her hand and steer her into the house. She didn't dare look back at her mother as she read Georgiana's letter. Instead, she sat in the sitting room, where her father poured her tea and dropped freshly baked bread into her lap, slathered with butter. You must be tired after your journey. Eat, Catherine. Get your strength back. He urged, sitting down beside her. Catherine took the smallest of nibbles of the bread, struggling to control her breathing as another tear slipped down her cheek. You need to read this, Horatio. Clara entered the room. Her whole body was rigid and stiff as the letter hung from her forefinger and thumb, as if she was disgusted to be touching it. Catherine closed her eyes tight and hung her head, hating to see her mother's reaction. What is it? Horatio must have taken the letter, for all fell silent. Clara sat down beside Catherine. She waited for the admonishment, the reprimand that was to come, but nothing happened. Instead, Clara touched Catherine's hand on the plate and Catherine's eyes shot open. Tell me the truth now, my love, Clara whispered. Were you hurt in any way? Did this doctor act inappropriately toward you? If so, I can understand why you would not wish to tell our cousin. But you know you can always tell me anything. What? No. Catherine shook her head as Horatio lowered the letter. Looking dumbstruck at the revelations inside it, Catherine sought to explain herself as quickly as she could, her sentences running together until they sounded completely jumbled. Dr. Bealey and I saw one another so he could help me learn about healing. That was all. Yes, he is an interesting man, but nothing inappropriate ever happened. She shook her head fervently. He was teaching me, that is all. I have copious notes and books from him to prove it. You wish to learn, Catherine? Horatio asked, slowly sitting down again. Why? Because maybe I wanted something more to life than just marrying and serving tea for my friends. She waved down at the tea tray, watching as her mother flinched beside her. 
I mean, there's nothing wrong with that life. I just wish to do something more. To hear what Arabella did, oh, my heart beats with excitement to think of it. In London I met so many women who have had careers and passions, something more to their lives. Was it so wrong to want something like that too for myself? She looked between her mother and father. To her surprise, Horatio was smiling rather sadly. He shook his head. There is nothing wrong with the want, he whispered softly. Yet what your father is nervous to say is that the way you went about it is the worry. Clara reached forward with her body suddenly animated. What if this man wasn't trustworthy after all? Not all men are. Many men would have taken advantage of such a situation. Her hand shook in the air as she waved it madly. Goodness, Catherine, you put yourself in such danger. There was no danger, Catherine insisted, shaking her head. He is a good man. That is almost unimportant now, regardless, Clara continued on, clearly caught up in her own thoughts. The gossip is the problem now. I am grateful to Lady Georgiana for taking action. Dividing the two of you was best. Catherine slumped back in her chair. The prospect of never seeing Dr. Bale again stung hard. Tears pricked her eyes once more as she thought of the last moment that she had seen him, waving to him as he climbed into his carriage. The rather formal bow he had given on departure had hurt more than Lady Georgiana's words. It was as if nothing intimate had ever passed between them when he bowed. It is all gone now. Everything. Like sand through my fingers, I cannot get it back. Catherine felt another hand on hers. It was Horatio's. He held tight with a reassuring smile but said nothing. Sounds in the corridor followed. Oh no. Clara suddenly sat straight. What is it? Horatio asked, turning to look at Clara. I forgot. Arabella was coming for tea. Catherine slumped even further down in her chair. Nothing would be worse at this moment than to see the woman she looked up to so much, to have her learn of what she had done. Good day. Oh. Arabella broke off as she appeared in the doorway. Catherine, you are home. Oh, it's so lovely to see you again. She hurried into the room and moved toward the chair, kissing Catherine kindly on the cheek in greeting. Any wish Catherine might have had to shield her aunt from her disgrace was quickly muted. Clara proceeded to take the letter from Lady Georgiana and thrust it into her sister-in-law's grasp. Arabella's reaction hurt Catherine as much as Clara's did. She slowly sat down, her manner quite lost, her cheeks pale. The letter drifted down to her lap as she finished. Were there any rumours when you left? She addressed Catherine alone. None that I had. Catherine shook her head. Yet that doesn't mean there are none. Clara stood and walked away from the chair, her manner panicked. She paced up and down, her hands fidgeting. What is to be done? Nothing, Horatio insisted. He offered Catherine an encouraging smile and stood, following Clara where he halted her pacing with hands on her shoulders. Our daughter has learned some healing practices. There is nothing so wrong in that. Horatio! Clara was plainly outraged. But there will be no scandal, Horatio assured her. Lady Georgiana has taken steps to avoid that. To be honest, I'm more disappointed that this Dr. Beale has decided to leave as your cousin bid him, rather than making any serious offer to our daughter. I beg your pardon, Clara spluttered. Catherine's hands shook as she exchanged a look with her father across the room. Put aside your assistance on propriety for one minute, Clara, he whispered strongly. Our daughter is hurting for another reason, beyond just the fear of disappointing you. The words sat heavy in the air. Catherine didn't know what was worse now, the disappointment to her parents or the fact that her father could see at once that her heart was hurting, for she loved Dr. Bale. I do love him, do I not? And now I shall never see him again. Oh. Clara covered her mouth with her hands. Before any more could be said between them, the butler arrived to ask about Catherine's trunk that had been brought back and what to do about Lady Georgiana's carriage. 
Horatio whispered something to Clara that Catherine did not hear. Then he left the room to make the arrangements. In the silence that followed, Catherine tried to hold her breath, to stop more tears, but she failed. In the end, her vision blurred and only came into focus once more as Arabella sat beside her and proffered up a handkerchief. Catherine thanked her and mopped her tears, just as Clara sat down on her other side, her whole body shaky. Is it true? Arabella whispered, finding words apparently where Clara could not. Did you leave your heart in London with this man, Catherine? That hardly matters, Catherine shook her head. I went to him for I saw him as a good tutor. Besides, he is in love with another. Oh God, Clara flung herself back into her own chair. This is getting better and better, she muttered wryly. So helpful, Arabella whispered, matching her tone. I'm sorry. Clara sat up again and reached for Catherine's hand, taking it tightly in her own. I am sorry, Catherine, truly. Yet if this man is in love with another, then maybe it is wisest you are separated. I know. Catherine's rational mind knew it was for the best, even if her heart thought it the most foolish thing in the world for the two of them to be divided. Yet are you certain? Arabella asked, a softness in her voice as she looked at Catherine. I know courtships of this world are not always as smooth as we would wish them to be. She blushed a little, apparently thinking of her own early days of courtship. Yet just because these meetings are unorthodox does not mean that any chance of a returned love is impossible. This one is, Catherine insisted, drying the last of her tears. She sat taller, trying to get control of herself. She reached for her reticule on a nearby table, which she now realised her mother had brought in for her, and dropped onto the table nearby. I am quite certain he sees me more as an annoying and eager child, rather than a woman at all. That is not true, Clara said with sudden feeling. The words stunned Catherine so much she stilled. You are a woman, Catherine, with bold passions and yes, certainly mischief, she added with a certain look. But you are no annoying child. If that is what the doctor saw in you, then he is not worthy of you. Catherine didn't know what to say or feel. Her constant fear that her mother would be disappointed in her was not contradicted by this need to protect. She held on to her mother's hand tighter, loving her all the more in that moment. She pulled away, however, as she fiddled with the reticule, searching for something inside. Aunt Arabella, this is yours. Catherine returned the one earring she had to her aunt. I lent them to you. Arabella tried to push it back toward Catherine, but she shook her head. I am only sorry I cannot return both, Catherine mumbled in a rush. I misplaced the other at Dr. Bale's house. I now fear that I may have left your notebook there too, for I cannot find it anywhere. I am so sorry, Catherine whispered. I am not worthy to wear those earrings. They are just earrings, dear. Clara said, her voice soft. No, not to me. They are something more. She curled her aunt's fingers around the earring, hiding it away from view. I promise to behave from now on, she said with sudden insistence. I have disgraced this family enough with my mischief and my errant ways. You will not find me behaving in this way again. Catherine made a resolution with these words. From now on, she would be the perfect young lady. She would be quiet, proper, even dull, if it meant she avoided any whispers following her here from London. She would please her mother, her father and her aunt from now on. Maybe someday she would be worthy of wearing that earring again, but she certainly wasn't worthy now. As she tried to eat some more of the bread her father had given her, it tasted bland and uninteresting. Around her, Clara and Arabella talked, trying to stir Catherine's interest in local events and the promise of seeing Sebastian and Elizabeth again. But nothing could excite Catherine. Not any more. Nigel Nigel paused in the rain outside of the carriage at the end of his road. The droplets ran off his hat and landed on his shoulders, dampening his shirt through his frock coat that was doing very little to keep out the wetness. He looked up and down at the emptiness of the road, feeling strangely alone. 
That morning, he had called on his brother to tell him of his decision to become a military doctor. Robert was not pleased, but not for the reason that Nigel had expected. He had initially thought Robert would have said what a disappointment it would be for the son of a Viscount to join the army as a military doctor. Yet he was wrong. Robert was sorry to lose Nigel from London instead. Robert had pleaded repeatedly with Nigel, asking him to stay, but nothing could sway his decision. I have to leave. Nigel walked around the small carriage and looked at the back, checking all his trunks and bags had been latched in place. Everything was ready for his departure, yet still he wasn't hurrying to his place in the carriage, neither was he giving the instructions for the driver to leave. He leaned against the trunks at the back of the carriage and considered what was keeping his feet rooted to the cobbled ground. Had he not made arrangements for all of his patients? Yes, he had. He'd ensured two good and well-reputed doctors would check on them all, to offer their services. He'd sent extra medicine to Lady Georgiana, along with another apology note, one he rather feared she might not read. He had made all the arrangements necessary, so why did he still not depart? It is because I have no wish to go. He stepped away from the trunks and rounded the carriage, moving to the front where the poor driver was struggling with his own frock coat, turning up the collar in his effort to ward off the rain and stop it dripping down his neck. How long until we reach the base at Andover? he asked the driver. In this weather? The driver looked up at the grey clouds overheard. A few hours, sir. It will be no easy journey. We should get going then. Nigel dropped his hands into his pockets, where one clunked against the book he'd gathered, just before he left. Departing from the driver's side, he moved to the carriage door, opened it wide, and leaned in so he could pull the book out under the roof of the carriage, keeping it dry. In his grasp he found Catherine's notebook. It was her aunt's book first, and as Nigel turned the pages toward the back, he found copious notes that Catherine herself had made. As he read of all the teachings she had taken on, even the observations she had made, he found himself smiling. In the final page was her earring, wrapped up in one of his handkerchiefs. He fidgeted with it, making sure it was kept perfectly safe within those pages. The devotion to her craft brought him such happiness that Nigel froze. She is the only one who has made me smile fully for many years now. The words struck him like a bolt of lightning. He felt crippled and sat down on the carriage steps, more rain dripping down his back. Sir, are we leaving soon? The driver called from the front of the carriage. Yes, we are. Nigel was alert with sudden activity. He placed the book in the carriage and moved toward the driver. Yet there is a change of plan. We are no longer going to Andover. Head to Wareham instead. Wareham? That will take even longer. So be it, Nigel called running into the back of the carriage and smiling as he snatched up the book again. Chapter 28 Catherine Catherine stared into the vanity mirror in front of her, dissatisfied with the reflection that looked back at her. She tried to smile, in the vain hope it would improve that image, but it looked forced, her cheeks quivered, and it fell away again. Sigging deeply, she reached for her jewellery box. She had sent away the lady's maid some time ago, wishing to prepare for the evening's ball to be held at her uncle and aunt's house alone, without any chatter. She searched for a decent pair of earrings, finding all of her earrings paled in comparison now to the pair she had borrowed from Arabella. She lifted a cushion to look beneath when she found a letter hidden away in her box. Stunned, she stared at it for a second, before she recognised the handwriting that bore her name on the white paper. It was Arabella's handwriting. Catherine lifted out the letter, straining to read it in the dying light of the evening that shone through the window. Her eyes shot down to the bottom of the letter, where she saw Arabella had signed it not with her Christian name, but as her secret self, Bonadea. Dearest Catherine, I suppose by now you have heard many lectures both from your cousin in London and your mother here at home. I hope you know deep down that they only want the best for you. Clara has been clucking around you like a hen, unable to halt her wish to protect you from all of life's ills. 
The truth is that no one can protect us from everything. We must live our own lives, make our own mistakes, discover for ourselves what will make us happy. It is this reason why I write to you now. I have had the privilege of watching you grow from a baby to a child, to the young woman you are now. With such growth comes lessons that are sometimes hard to hear. Life is full of disappointment. There are bumps in the road, it may rain, and occasionally we are tipped out of our carriages. But this is not a reason to give up on life or to resign oneself to coping with misery forevermore. The sun comes up every morning and we begin again. There's a difference between giving up and seizing the opportunities of growing up, dear Catherine. This evening, you shall come to our ball and be the fine lady you are. It is a chance for a fresh start, a new beginning, but most of all, it's an opportunity for you to decide what is important to you in life. Only by judging what can make us happy and having the courage to go after it can we truly find that happiness. Hold on to this letter, Catherine. I hope in time you will find solace in these words. Your dearest friend and aunt, Bonadea. Catherine felt teary-eyed as she looked at her aunt's letter. It was beautifully written, and more than ever did Catherine feel as if she was being urged to be a new version of herself. Just as I said before. She folded up the letter and placed it down on her vanity table. I shall be the new me, someone that isn't so mischievous or cunning. She sighed deeply, thinking of some of Bonadea's words when it came to growing up. It is time to grow up. She stood from the table and turned her back on it, no longer looking at her reflection. Hurriedly she left the room and descended the stairs, joining her mother and father as they waited for her by the door. Catherine barely said a word and simply answered her parents when they spoke to her. On the carriage ride to her aunt and uncle's house, she felt them staring at her keenly. Are you sure all is well, Catherine? Clara asked as they descended the carriage on the Duke of Gordon's drive. Yes, of course, Catherine nodded. I am simply being the new me, mother. The new you doesn't have to be as quiet as a mouse, Clara urged. I think she does. Catherine spoke with sudden insistence. I cannot trust my tongue and conversation not to get me into scrapes after all. I have always liked your conversation. Catherine looked at her mother in surprise. As much as she felt she had disappointed Clara over the last couple of days, every now and then her mother would say things like this, and Catherine wouldn't feel like a complete disaster. Before they could say any more, Horatio urged them forward, taking both of their arms and escorting them into the house. Arabella and Daniel had decorated the house beautifully for the occasion. Great summer blooms of white and yellow roses trailed across the pillars of the ballroom. Tables full of crystal glasses were decked with daisy flowers on the stems, and the violinists that played from a platform in the corner were all dressed in white. As Catherine's eyes settled on the dancers, she smiled to see her cousin, Sebastian, dancing with his wife, Elizabeth. As always, the two were completely happy in one another's presence, laughing about something as they danced together. Catherine's smile faltered when she felt a twinge of jealousy in her stomach. It was not something she had expected to feel. Catherine tried her best to stay out of trouble. She held herself still, remembering all the lessons Lady Georgiana had taught her. She even avoided drinking any wine, fearing it would make her natural clumsiness worse than before. When she nearly dropped a glass of lemonade instead, she hurried to put down the glass, fearing her clumsiness was not something she could escape completely. Partway through the evening, Sebastian and Elizabeth hurried over, full of energy. They plagued Catherine with questions, determined to know about her travels to London, yet she replied to them woodenly, with little information. Was it exciting to attend all those London parties? Oh, I bet so, Elizabeth said with a sudden giggle. I bet they're rather different to our smaller and quainter affairs here. Do you doubt it? Sebastian asked, laughing too, as he poured out three glasses of wine. He passed one to Elizabeth and another to Catherine, though she hastily and discreetly put it down on the table behind her. I imagine Catherine has seen a side of the world you and I have not seen. What do you say, Catherine? Was it all so different? Not that different, 
Her short answer made them exchange sharp looks. Is something wrong, Catherine? Sebastian wrapped his arm around her shoulders in the way he had always done. You do not seem your usual self. Catherine sighed with relief when she realised Arabella had not told him about her return in disgrace. It was somehow a comfort to not have her closest friend in the world think ill of her. Would he think ill of me? Her hurried thoughts meant she didn't answer him. Catherine, what is it? He whispered again. Nothing. I am quite well, just a little tired. Well, maybe we could all go for a ride tomorrow, Elizabeth suggested. Let us go to Studland Beach. You love that place. You can tell us all about your travels then. The prospect of it made Catherine nervous. How many times when riding on that beach had she fallen off in her clumsiness? More than once she had been caught by the waves and fallen over laughing at her own ridiculousness as the water seeped up her skirts. That was hardly the behaviour of a proper lady who had to grow up. She thought of Bonadea's letter, of how she had to grow up. Maybe, she whispered, or perhaps you could come to mine for tea instead. Tea? Sebastian and Elizabeth spluttered together, exchanging more startled glances. Since when do you turn down a ride on Studland Beach in favour of tea? Sebastian asked, dumbstruck. Things change, Catherine said with ease. A gentleman across the room was looking at Catherine. She recognised him at once as Mr Richard O'Reilly. He was a local merchant, extremely successful, and she had once overheard him talking about her as if she was some errant entertainment on the stage. Far too noisy and loud for a young lady, one wants someone a little quieter in a courtship. After overhearing these words at a ball once, Catherine had been quite determined to avoid him, knowing they did not suit one another. It startled her all the more now that he stared at her across the room. Abruptly, he broke off from the group of gentlemen he was talking to and walked toward her. Do not look now, Sebastian whispered mischievously, but a gentleman we'd all like to avoid is coming this way. Who? Oh, Mr O'Reilly, Elizabeth laughed. He is rather stiff and stuffy, is he not? Perhaps he means to ask you to dance, Catherine. I doubt that. He has no liking for me. Knowing your luck, you'll trip on his feet in the dance, Sebastian laughed raucously. Catherine looked sharply at her cousin, knowing how right he was. I thought you would have laughed at that, Catherine. He looked sharply at her, a perplexed look marring his brow. You usually would. Good God, what is wrong? Nothing, Catherine lied. She was fortunately saved from having to say any more as Mr O'Reilly stopped in front of them and bowed. Good evening to you all, he said in his stiff manner, looking at them all in turn, though his eyes lingered on Catherine a little more than the others. Good evening, Sebastian said, bowing as the other two curtsied. He looked at Catherine once more, clearly expecting her to say something, but she stayed quiet. Are you dancing tonight, sir? I haven't often seen you dance at these events. I admit there's a temptation tonight. Mr O'Reilly smiled and looked at Catherine. If your cousin, Miss Fitzroy, would do me the honour of being my partner? Sebastian looked ready to laugh, as if he expected Catherine to turn him down. They had once talked for an hour straight about how Catherine would rather dance and make a fool of herself with every other man at a ball other than Mr O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr O'Reilly. I would be delighted. She forced a smile and gave the gentleman her hand, much to the surprise of Sebastian, whose chin dropped so far it might as well have struck the floor. Mr O'Reilly led her toward the dancers on the other side of the room. Forgive me for saying so, Miss Fitzroy, but there is something very different about you tonight. He continued to smile as they waited at the side of the dancers for the music to finish. Yes, that is sadness. Yet Catherine couldn't help feeling she must be doing something right. Perhaps this new and rather dull, quiet manner she was adopting was what she needed to do in order to be the fine and proper lady that would please her family. I have recently returned from London, she said quietly. I learned a lot whilst I was there. I would be glad to hear of your travels sometime. He continued to smile at her, but Catherine was no longer looking at him. 
Past his shoulder, someone had entered the ballroom, looking rather flustered with the shoulders of his frock coat, damp and a sodden top hat in his hand. He looked frantically around, his eyes darting about, as if the ball was the last thing that he expected to find at all. It's not possible. What is he doing here? Dr. Bale's eyes found hers across the room. Chapter 29 Catherine Miss Fitzroy? Mr. O'Reilly must have said something to her, but she didn't register it. Dr. Bale tried to walk across the room. He was halted by the butler who quickly took the wet frock coat and hat before allowing Dr. Bale to continue. Forgive me, I... Catherine tried to speak, but the words died on her tongue. She couldn't shift her gaze from Dr. Bale as he walked toward her. He flattened his hair that had curled rather madly in the dampness. When he halted beside them, he bowed at once. Excuse the interruption, he said hurriedly. Mr. O'Reilly looked sharply at him, as if he had no intention of excusing or forgiving it. My apologies, sir. I must speak with Miss Fitzroy at once. She has a debt that is owed. A debt? Catherine repeated. Oh, he wants paying for the lessons he gave me. I did offer him money, did I not? She chewed her lip, her heart thudding hard in her chest, so much so that she could feel it thundering against her ribcage. More than anything did she wish to fall into Dr. Bale's arms. How much she had missed him these last few days. How she had thought she would never see him again. And yet here he was before her now. A debt, Mr. O'Reilly also repeated the words, yet we are to dance now. A dance is part of the debt. Forgive me for stepping in. Dr. Bale somehow easily took Catherine's hand from Mr. O'Reilly's. My name has been down on her dance card for some time. It has? Catherine could still not form words. The music ended and the last lot of couples left the floor. Before Mr. O'Reilly could think of something to say, Dr. Beale led Catherine away onto the floor. In his haste, she tripped on her own feel and stumbled forward. He caught her waist easily as they stood opposite one another, the smallest of smiles on his lips. Catherine blushed the deepest shade of red she could possibly imagine. Never had she felt so heated in the cheeks. That is exactly the sort of clumsiness I've been trying to avoid. The music began and many couples around them bowed and curtsied. Neither of them could as they were stood so close together, but as the three-beat music became apparent, Dr. Bale led Catherine into a waltz. Dr. Bale, Catherine found her voice, though it came out strained and much quieter than she had intended. What are you doing here? You spoke of a debt. The word felt wrong in her ears. She couldn't tear her gaze away from him, not only admiring his handsome face, drinking in the sight as she feared she would not see it again, but also marking the signs of tiredness under his eyes and the wetness of his clothes. It suggested he'd had a mad and rather wild journey to Dorset. This is my debt. As they danced, he released the hand from her palm, keeping his other on her waist to direct her around the floor. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a single earring. Catherine blinked as she stared at Arabella's earring. You found it? I did. I had to return it to you. He returned it to his pocket, clearly intending to give it properly to her later when the dance was finished. He caught her hand again and directed her around the room. He moved with such swiftness that Catherine was startled, following him with surprising ease, though she panicked with every step that she would trip on his feet and fall, making a fool of herself once again. Thank you, Catherine murmured, concentrating on her footwork. But you came all the way to Dorset just to give me that? You could have sent it in the post, Doctor. I could have. He shook his head. Yet there was something more I had to say to you. I realised that I owed you an explanation about when I told you that I was in love. Catherine looked down between them sharply. She could now hear her heartbeat thudding in her ears. She couldn't bear to hear him say to her now that he loved another, this Emily. How could she bear to hear this at a ball in front of so many other people? It would cripple her. And her ensuing despair would be witnessed by all. Pray, 
do not say any more, she begged, staring somewhere in the middle of his chest. His hand tightened around her own, as if he was startled by her words. I know, Doctor. What is it you know? I know that you are in love, she whispered in a rush. The night you were suffering with nightmares, I heard you say her name. Emily. She looked up at last, to find him staring at her. He slowed their dance so they were in the middle of the floor, moving more side to side. The dance felt strangely intimate now, and Catherine had to remind herself that she didn't have his heart. She couldn't indulge in any fantasies now. I apologise. Sincerely from the bottom of my heart, she whispered in a rush. My wish to learn from you, and my wish to get to know you. If it has in any way caused a discord between you and your love, I am heartily sorry for it. That was never my intention. I can see I need to explain myself at once before any more confusion continues. Dr. Bale abruptly smiled. That change made Catherine stiffen, baffled by it. Emily was my first love, yes, but that was many years ago now. She died, Catherine. What? She died? Catherine shook, her steps suddenly falling still beneath her. Dr. Beale had to lead her strongly into the next figures, and she nearly tripped once again. His hand slid further across her back, keeping her safe in his arms. A heat rose through her body, and she could have sworn the hairs on the back of her neck rose. I do not understand, she whispered. That is because I have sought to keep what I feel locked up for so long, Dr. Bale said in a rush. Yes, I was in love before. She was a patient, and I lost her. I believed foolishly as it transpires that I could not love again. In fact, I blocked out the idea, considering it safer for my own heart to never give me a chance to love again. Little was I expecting you to come along. I beg your pardon? Her voice was barely audible now. You sort of pushed your way through my barriers. His smile grew so much it transformed his features. Thank God you did. Like a bull in a china shop? It would not be the first time I'd been compared to that. She grimaced. I have a habit of leaving disaster in my wake. No disaster here. Dr. Bale said with a laugh, and in case you had not noticed, Catherine, I am rather fond of your eager and passionate manner. Catherine. He called me Catherine. Her heart leapt in her chest. In fact, when I told you I was in love, I meant I was in love with you. His voice deepened. Me? Catherine spluttered. This is not possible. This is some dream I shall wake from at any moment. It has to be. Dr. Bale's hand slid further across her back, pulling her an inch nearer as they danced. Speechless, he whispered playfully. I... Words failing her seemed to answer his question. He laughed softly, as did she too. Say something. Tell him you love him too. Yet the music came to a stop. They were forced to release one another, stepping back to curtsy and bow to each other, though Dr. Bale snatched up her hand quickly again, escorting her off the floor. Doctor! Call me Nigel, he begged in a whisper. It is my name. But... She couldn't call him that. Not now. What would people around them say? People were suddenly moving toward them. Never had she seen her father's face so angry, so red, the eyes wide. He must have guessed exactly who Dr. Bale was, judging by how swiftly he moved toward them. Behind him moved Clara and Arabella, each one tottering in their slim skirts to keep up. At some distance, Catherine caught sight of Daniel, Sebastian and Elizabeth, who were all watching with fixed gazes, their wine glasses halted in mid-air on the way to their lips, as if time had frozen. Shall I hazard a guess as to your identity, sir? Horatio said rather stiffly, as he looked at Dr. Bale. Dr. Bale, sir. He bowed deeply, his hand still in Catherine's. This is my father, Catherine said hurriedly, Baron Fitzroy. Dr. Bale made his bow even deeper than before. 
Clara clearly panicked. She reached for Horatio's arm and pulled on it, as if imploring him in her silence to do something. Did they fear Dr. Bale was here to risk her reputation even more? Catherine could not panic now. She was tense, nervous, yes, but her heart was still beating madly as she thought of what the doctor had just told her. He loves me. How is this even possible? I had something to return to your daughter, Lord Fitzroy. Dr. Bale reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out the earring. He handed this first to Catherine, then reached into another pocket and pulled out her notebook. Catherine stared at it, wide-eyed, amazed to see it again after she feared she had lost it. Is this yours, my lady? He offered it to Clara, whose lips opened and closed in shock with no words escaping her. It was mine originally, Arabella said, stepping forward, though she did not take the book. Then you must be the Duchess of Gordon. Dr. Bale bowed his head to her in greeting. I am delighted to meet you. Your niece talks of you not only with great fondness but awe too. From your notes, I can see you are a skilled healer. Thank you! Arabella took the book at last, her brow furrowed. May I suggest you read the notes Catherine has made at the back of the book, Dr. Beale encouraged. She has learned much. I believe she could be a skilled healer herself some day. Catherine stood taller. These words mattered to her as much as his declaration of love. He believed she had potential. It was all she had ever wanted, to be of use to people, as he and Arabella were. Arabella smiled softly as she turned to the back of the book, hastily taking in the notes that Catherine had made. I can feel the glares I am receiving. Dr. Bale looked at Horatio. At her father's expression, Catherine stiffened. Father, she whispered, yet that expression did not alter, and neither did Clara's pulling on Horatio's arm halt. May I speak openly, my lord? I'd encourage you to do so at once, Horatio said firmly. Dr. Bale cleared his throat and stepped toward Horatio, dropping Catherine's hand, though she longed for it back at once. I have never behaved improperly toward your daughter. On the contrary, I have the highest respect and admiration for her. I would not dishonour her so. I'm glad to hear it. Horatio's face softened a little. Though I rather thought you were about to make a different declaration to my daughter, sir. Chapter 30 Nigel Perceptive Man Nigel stared back at Lord Fitzroy, tongue-tied and struggling for words. It seemed plain to him now that the Baron could see exactly what was on his mind and in his heart. Nigel looked back at Catherine, but she wasn't staring at him. She was looking at her father instead. I have made my declaration, and I do not believe it is enough. As they had danced together, Nigel had hoped that Catherine cared for him too. Yet it was not to be, was it? Perhaps she couldn't forgive him for his behaviour, of being so willing to draw them both into scandal. He could understand that. Or perhaps she feared disapproval now. He wasn't sure. Either way, she said nothing, and his declaration to her was left unanswered. I have said what I have come to say, my lord. Nigel looked back at Lord Fitzroy, seeing his wife no longer pulling on his arm but looking sharply at him. There was almost hatred in that gaze. It made Nigel wish to run, apologising as he went. I must apologise now for intruding on your evening. I will take my leave. So soon, the Duchess of Gordon said from the Baron's other side. But Nigel was no longer listening. I have to get out of here. He turned back to Catherine and bowed to her, snatching up her hand to clasp it briefly before he walked away through the crowd. As he walked, he felt rather sick, a sudden clamminess in the palms of his hands. He'd been so certain on his journey here that this was the right thing to do, so that Catherine knew the whole truth and had her earring and notes back. But now he wasn't so sure. He'd put his heart on the line, and now he would have to go to this military camp, knowing he had no chance of having her love. He stood in the doorway of the ballroom, catching the eye of the butler who appeared. May I have my coat and top hat, please? Nigel asked. 
the butler nodded and hurried off. Footsteps behind him urged Nigel to look around, to find that Catherine had followed him to the doorway. Beside her was her aunt, but her mother and father hung back in the room, still staring in their direction. Do you not remember what I said? The Duchess of Gordon was hissing the words to Catherine, but so loudly that Nigel could hear them. What? Catherine asked distractedly, moving to Nigel's side. He hoped she would ask him not to go, but she said nothing and simply stared at him. The butler returned with his top hat and coat, and he took them, hurrying to put them on. In my letter, the Duchess of Gordon continued. You told me to grow up, Catherine whispered, but still loud enough for Nigel to hear. I know I have brought disgrace to my family, aunt. I do not need the reminder now. What? No, no, Catherine, you misunderstand, Arabella said in a rush. I was urging you to realise what is important to you, to go after it. Oh dear, perhaps I should have said, realise who is important to you. There was sudden silence as Nigel buttoned up his frock coat. In the quiet, he couldn't help looking back at Catherine again, the hope he felt twinged in his gut. Catherine's gaze met his own, and they looked at one another without blinking. For a few seconds, he thought of the night she had stayed in his apartment, how they had fallen asleep, leaning on one another. Never had he woken so happy and settled as he had done in her company. To have that happiness again, I would give anything. Nigel bowed his head in parting to the two of them, finding he couldn't bear the infernal silence any more. He took a step through the doorway, moving into the entrance hall. A sudden scuttling followed him. Wait, Catherine called. Nigel halted. He slowly turned on his heel, his body flanked by the candles on either side of the hallway. He was isolated in the hallway, with Catherine a few strides in front of him. In the doorway far behind stood the Duchess, though she seemed to be making an effort to hang back, to give them privacy. Do not go, Catherine pleaded suddenly, walking across the room toward him. I think I must. Nigel looked down, unable to look at her. Was she going to let him down easily? Did she intend to keep him there to tell him as kindly as she could that she couldn't love him in return? Maybe she only ever wanted me for a tutor, and nothing more. It is for the best. I have said what I had come to say, and judging by your family's obvious and rather justified opinion of me, he grimaced. I must leave. He turned again, hearing her step forward once more. You lost one love. Do not make the choice now to lose another. Her sudden words had him freezing. He blinked, with his gaze unfocused as he stared down the hallway. He turned away, disbelieving the proof of his own ears. Catherine was staring at him, her chest rising and falling with quick breaths as she smiled at him. What did you say? he whispered in disbelief. I said, she murmured, stepping toward him once more, stay, please. She closed the distance between them, stopping in front of him. If you feared opening your heart again, because you were worried about losing love, then this moment is the worst possible one to walk away. Her smile continued to grow, and she breathed in deeply. My heart is yours, Doctor. Nigel snatched up her hand, dropping the top hat he had barely noticed was still in his grasp. It rolled away across the floor as he raised her hand to his lips and kissed the back with sudden passion. Ahem, the Duchess of Gordon cleared her throat loudly from the doorway. She purposefully looked away from the two of them and blocked the doorway with her hands on either side of the doorframe, clearly intent on stopping anyone else from reaching them just yet. I do, Nigel whispered to Catherine, needing to be sure. Your heart is mine. It has been for some time, Catherine said quickly, though I hardly know when it began. She looked at the grasp he had on her hand. All I know for certain is how heartbroken I have been since I watched you bow and climb into that carriage, riding away for good. Not for good, not now. He turned her hand over, indulging in a more private and intimate kiss, to the inside of her wrist. The way her lips parted and she inhaled sharply made a ripple of excitement pass through him. He hadn't known such happiness before. 
he felt as light as a feather, so full of life that he could have run with sudden energy, despite his exhaustion after the long and hard journey down to Dorset. We do not need to be parted again, he whispered to her, elated when he saw Catherine's smile matching his own. Think you can put up with my company, despite all my books and reading? I love all that about you. It is you who would have to put up with my over-eagerness in conversation and my clumsiness. I love all of that, he whispered. You are real, genuine and full of heart. Where many ladies I have met before can be cold like stone. You are warm, Catherine. You have always been since that first day. She laughed as if he had said something quite mad, and Nigel loved that sound. Their happy moment was disturbed by the Duchess of Gordon clearing her throat once more. She waved a hand madly in the air toward them. I think we are about to be disturbed. Nigel released Catherine's hand in sudden panic. She stepped back, increasing the distance between them, though her smile never faltered. The Duchess of Gordon stepped to the side just as Lord and Lady Fitzroy appeared in the doorway. I thought you were taking your leave, Dr. Bill, Lord Fitzroy said with a knowing smile. What is happening? Lady Fitzroy looked around, panicked. Horatio, perhaps you should escort him from the grounds. Another minute more, love, Lord Fitzroy said, that smile still in place. I have a feeling that there is something Dr. Beale wishes to ask me. I do have something more to say, yes. Nigel took Catherine's hand again and led her back through the hallway toward Lord and Lady Fitzroy. Where Lady Fitzroy looked ready to object to the grasp Nigel had on Catherine's palm, the Duchess of Gordon took her arm, holding her back. My lord, Nigel offered another bow to Lord Fitzroy. Do not keep bowing all the time, sir, Lord Fitzroy said with a sudden low laugh. You'll never stop bowing if you continue in this vein. Now, what is it you wish to ask of me? May I have your blessing to court your daughter? please? Nigel hurried to add the latter word, feeling strangely awkward in his nervousness. Caught, Lady Fitzroy said, her lips parting in shock. But I thought... This seemed to alter things entirely as she looked between the pair of them. As I said before, I have never dishonoured your daughter, and I would not offend your family, yet I cannot help the feelings I have for her. With your blessing... I would like permission for a courtship. Nigel waited with bated breath, feeling Catherine's hand tighten in his own. It was the reassurance he needed that she would say yes. What are your connections? Lady Fitzroy suddenly asked. Clara! The Duchess of Gordon spluttered in outrage. What? I have a responsibility toward my daughter, Lady Fitzroy said in a rush. Dear God! Lady Gordon laid a hand over her eyes, as if she could not believe what her sister-in-law had just asked. You didn't seem to mind connections so much when I married your brother. I... Lady Fitzroy's face contorted in guilt. I care more for his devotion to Catherine, which seems to be rather strong. Lord Fitzroy eyed Nigel. He felt rather watched, as if examined by some great eagle. If it helps. I am the second son of Viscount Purbeck, Nigel said in a rush. Though in truth, I do not trade on that position. I work as a doctor and have prided myself on that position more than any other. To his surprise, Lord Fitzroy smiled more at the latter statement than the former one. A man with a good career then? He nodded approvingly. Very well. You have my blessing, my lord. And I hope whilst you stay in Dorset, I shall have the opportunity to get to know you better. Judging from the way my daughter is jumping up and down at your side with excitement, this will not be just a courtship for very long. The Duchess of Gordon laughed aloud as Lady Fitzroy tapped her husband around the arm in reprimand. Nigel smiled too, overcome with happiness as he turned to Catherine. He lifted her hand and kissed the back, just as she tripped in her jumping up and down. He caught her fast, watching the panic in her eyes. As her family laughed, he whispered in her ear, I'll always be here to catch you. Epilogue 
Catherine, five months later. Oh God, there's so much to do. Catherine sighed dramatically as she looked around the room at her family. Clara and Arabella were currently tussling over the best flowers to add to her bouquet, as Elizabeth fussed around the wedding gown that was laid across the bottom of the bed. Sebastian was trying on his new suit jacket for the occasion, wrinkling his nose at the colour and rather elaborate boutonniere that had been put in the buttonhole. Trust you to have such a colourful wedding, Catherine, Sebastian said with a laugh as he looked away from the mirror. How many flowers are in that bouquet? So many that our mothers are disappearing behind it, Catherine said hurriedly with a laugh. In unison, Clara and Arabella poked their heads above the bouquet. Clara blew hard to knock a flower off her cheek, and Arabella waved away some of the pollen, sneezing hard. It's beautiful, Elizabeth said with happiness, running her hand over the silk of the skirt in the wedding gown. I cannot believe you are to be married tomorrow, Catherine. Oi, Catherine said with pretend offence, prompting Sebastian to burst out laughing. Not because you are not marriage material, just because I cannot believe how quickly it is happening, Elizabeth said in a rush and stood from her place, her hands on her hips. Yes, and yours wasn't quick at all, was it? Catherine reminded her, watching as Sebastian nodded across the room. I did get a ring on her finger rather quickly. Yes, I remember it well, Arabella said in mock disapproval. It seems both of our children have secured their marriages in rather unorthodox ways, Clara. I wish I could offer reproval, but we hardly set a good example, did we? Clara laughed warmly. Now, Catherine, worry not about the arrangements. She left the bouquet behind and walked toward Catherine across the room where she sat at the vanity table. On one side of the table was her jewellery for the wedding, set up on a cushion. In the golden set were the earrings that Arabella had lent to her. On the other side of the table were the latest periodicals that Lady Georgiana had sent her from London, full of articles from Lady Bingley, the Duchess of Lestonmere, and Lady Nightburn. Arabella and I have everything in hand. Clara sat down beside her and placed a hand on her shoulder. Everything in the church is set up. The guests will arrive first thing and you should see the preparations your father has made for the wedding breakfast. Trust me, no one will be going hungry. Thank you. Catherine laughed, remembering what Nigel had said at the weekend when they discussed the wedding. I always thought I'd have a quiet life. I was hardly expecting your family to turn our wedding into the event of the season. He had laughed, not seeming to mind in the slightest. Now, you need to finish your article. Get to it and we'll be downstairs waiting for you for dinner. Clara kissed her on the cheek. Come on, out everyone. Elizabeth looked very disappointed to be leaving the wedding gown behind, and Sebastian shrugged off his tailcoat. Coming, he called. Besides, we need to find poor Dr. Bale and what our fathers have done with him. He didn't look best pleased about the idea of being taken on a shoot this morning. He likes to help the wounded not be the cause of it, Catherine pointed out, to which Sebastian laughed as he took his mother away from the flowers and they all left the room. As the door closed behind them, Catherine sat back and listened to their voices happily talking together as they walked away down the corridor. The last few months had been a blur being back home in Dorset. Where scandal had once been suspected, now there was none. Nigel had surprised them all by moving to Dorset, something that was clearly approved of by his family, as they had a country estate in the area. By taking charge of the estate, Nigel continued his duties as a doctor, whilst being responsible for a few of the tenants too, whilst his brother was away in London. Nigel had grown close with her family, and to Catherine's relief he had become good friends with Sebastian. It seemed Sebastian's good humour had a knack for drawing out the laughter in Nigel, when he was least expecting it, a little like Catherine. The other surprise that had befallen Catherine in the last few months now sat in front of her. When news had reached Lady Georgiana of their courtship in London, she had appeared unannounced a few days later in Dorset, suddenly delighted, and assuring them that no rumours existed about the pair of them in London. Apparently the worries of the past were forgotten, 
and Lady Georgiana had presented Catherine with a letter from Lady Bingley. Having heard of Catherine's healing wishes, Lady Bingley presented Catherine with an idea. If Catherine continued her research, perhaps she could write a running article of her own in the women's periodical. At first the idea had seemed mad, but both Nigel and Arabella had encouraged her to do it. The more hands-on experience Catherine had, accompanying Nigel to some of his call-outs, the more confident she became, and the first article seemed to write itself. In front of her on the table now, beside the various copies of the women's periodical, was her latest article, drafted in a letter to Lady Bingley. This article was about the various challenges that can face one's body if the mind is troubled or disadvantaged. She spoke of nightmares and various hauntings, even bouts of melancholy and what one can do to combat these. It was an uplifting piece, an article about hope and looking to the future. Catherine made a small edit to the final line and finished it with a flourish. Ultimately, one's mind is not in a fixed state. Our unhappy moments, like our happy ones, are moving things. They can be changed, encouraged for the better, and as we improve the health of our minds, so do our bodies follow. She wrote a note to Lady Bingley, hoping she enjoyed the piece, then signed her name. As she sat back reading the article over, she was so distracted that she didn't notice the door creaked open behind her. She wasn't even aware of footsteps on the rug, not until she felt a breath in her ear. Oh my God! She dropped the letter and flung her hands over her chest. Ha! Needles loafed echoed across the room as he placed his hands on the back of her chair. You should see your face. You frightened me to death. God, I hope I did not do that. He laughed even more and reached past her, picking up the letter she had written and reading part of it. To her joy, Nigel had loved each of her previous articles. He'd even offered up suggestions for some future articles. It's another good one, he approved with a nod. I think most of all, I like the way you sign these articles. I have my aunt's blessing to do so, Catherine said with a happy sigh, looking at the letter and the words at the bottom, Bonadea. We thought it an important way to continue the legend, the idea that there will always be someone there for another to turn to when in need of advice. I like it, very much indeed. Nigel bent down and kissed her on the cheek. Catherine giggled, feeling blessed that he had somehow managed to sneak in and steal these few minutes alone with her beyond the control of a chaperone. Where are they? Clara called from down the corridor. They're not married yet, you know. Caught! Nigel's eyes widened in mock panic. Sometimes I think you truly are afraid of my mother, Catherine said as he caught her hand and pulled her to her feet. They hastened to the door together before they could be caught alone in her chamber. Sometimes, he said playfully, yet not truly. She hardly frightens me as much as Lady Georgiana. She will be here for the wedding tomorrow. They both stepped out into the corridor, just as Clara rounded the corner at the far end of the hallway. When she sat them together, she folded her arms. You're married tomorrow and not a second beforehand. She tutted and urged them to follow her with a crook of her finger. They shared a humorous smile as they followed behind her. From what I hear, Catherine whispered to Nigel, Lady Georgiana will be going around the ceremony tomorrow claiming full credit for our union. Credit? Nigel laughed at the idea. She's the one who sent us apart. She said in her last letter something about absence makes the heart grow fonder. I wonder if she really knew what would happen. Who knows? Nigel whispered in her ear. Whatever the reason, I am glad of her interference. It made me realise what I truly wanted to be happy in this world. He lifted her hand and kissed the back again. I couldn't agree more. Catherine! Clara's voice called from down the corridor sharply. No more mischief. Coming, mother, though that is hardly a promise I could ever make sincerely. Catherine found her own happy ending inspired not only by Bonadea, but by other significant women as well, such as the Duchess of Lestonmere. But what mysteries, what scandals and unspoken tales could the past of a Duchess hide? Find out in the Duke's writer, 
following Meve and Benjamin in a love story of deception, secrets and great expectations. Read The Duke's Writer now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.